let me share my screen and uh, here you go so day one of deep learning we are going to cover we are going to cover completely from basics and uh, it will definitely be helpful for your interviews and uh, the other things definitely whatever i'm teaching those kind of questions are usually asked in an interview and uh, everybody can follow this so hit like before we go ahead share this link with all of your friends whoever wants to join so uh, this is the day one of deep learning uh, the motive is to make people clear the basics here i will be covering maths and definitely interview preparation part right interview preparation part will be covered if you are looking for becoming a deep learning developer or you are planning to uh, move into the computer vision so everything will be actually be able to cover it over here so what are the things we are going to cover today so the agenda as usual we start with the agenda so the agenda of the session number one uh, we will be understanding about deep learning so entire deep learning things okay now we will start with something called as perceptron and before that we will also be understanding what is the difference between ai versus ml versus dl versus data science okay since this is the introduction session so uh, we'll also be understanding what is a brief idea about forward propagation and backward propagation so we will also be covering forward propagation and backward propagation the fourth point that we are probably going to cover is that uh you know not in today's class but a brief idea about loss function uh fifth one is something called as activation functions okay sixth one that we are going to basically see is something called as optimizers okay so uh, we are trying to cover all these things like if you are in the thousand feet height right uh what is exactly deep learning why are these terms coming up you know all those things we'll try to discuss tomorrow uh we are yeah projects will also be covered uh on the second or the third day we'll try to cover projects and uh, we will be learning in such a way that we understand the maths we understand it properly we um, we do the implementation and at the end of the day it will be helpful for the interview preparation so yes uh, i hope everybody's ready the energy is high so hit like we will be starting the session right prerequisite some idea about machine learning uh, so your prerequisite is that you need to know python programming language prerequisite you need to know number 1 python some idea about at least one algorithm in machine learning and third is that some idea about stats which i have already taken in the previous session okay so we will try to cover all of this yes if linear regression also you know that is more than sufficient to start with okay so let's go ahead and let's start the first thing uh, the first topic uh, of this session we are going to cover something called as ai versus ml versus dl versus data science right and what is the importance of dl we will be trying to know and uh, deep learning this will this will be our main focus of this session where we will be understanding about deep learning okay so this is what we are basically going to cover up okay so perfect uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's start okay let's consider this entire universe let's consider there is a universe which is called as ai okay so suppose if i say this is my this is the universe of ai this is a separate universe let's say consider it ai and i hope everybody knows the full form of ai that is artificial intelligence so here uh, we try to create an application so ai is a kind of application which can do its own task which can do its own task without any human intervention without any human intervention okay so this is what 
is exactly AI. Okay, without any human intervention. So human intervention basically means that uh, the human do not have to tell the application what to do. Just with the behavior of the user of the person that who is using this application, it can automatically take its own decision. Best example that I would like to consider, number one, I hope everybody has seen Netflix app. It provides you automatic recommendation. Uh, second is self-driving cars, autopilot cars, self-driving cars. I think you have a brief idea about it. Third, let's say Amazon application. So Amazon application, which wherever you do the shopping, right? Automatic recommendations are there. In see, if I talk about AI application, it is just like an AI module integrated with some kind of integrated with the software that is already existing like netflix app is obviously used for seeing movies okay but to make the experience better what we do is that we include an ai module which gives you recommendation based on your behavior right so all these things we actually cover uh, in this specific thing at the end of the day whether you are working as a computer vision developer, you are working as a data scientist, you are working as a deep learning developer, at the end of the day, you know, you are actually creating an AI application. That is the most important thing to understand. Okay. Uh, yes, a uh, very good example. Uh, probably you have seen Sophia, you have seen chatbots, right? Uh, chatbots is one of the tasks we, which we specifically do. Right. So chatbot is also one of the tasks, uh, one of the AI application in short, uh, you can basically consider. And I hope everybody knows recently, uh, Elon Musk, you know, he's bought Twitter, by, Twitter uh, for $44.2 billion. And three main reasons what he has actually given is that uh, one of the most important reason uh, that is definitely helpful for all the people who are learning AI, you know. So, uh, he wants to make the machine learning algorithm that is basically used to recommend the content as an open source. Okay. Now, if this is coming as an open source, trust me, it will be quite amazing because then you'll be able to get the idea. Yes. A kind of recommendation idea we already have, but if that entire machine learning algorithm is made as an open source, you will definitely be able to understand how does YouTube recommendation work or Instagram recommendation works and different kind of recommendation actually work. Okay. So, uh, this is what actually comes in the form of AI. So here AI is nothing but artificial intelligence. Now let's go to the next one, which is called as machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of AI. So suppose if I probably draw a kind of circle over here, and this circle is quite big. Suppose let's say I am drawing a circle. Again, it is a little bit big. It's okay. Let's say this is machine learning. Okay. Now in this machine learning, what happens is that suppose if I consider this is machine learning. Okay. So in machine learning, what exactly is machine learning and uh, what do we do in machine learning? Okay. So machine learning basically provides you stats tool. Stats tool to analyze the data to analyze the data visualize the data visualize the data and to do most of the machine learning tasks like predictions predictions forecasting and many more things right and similarly in unsupervised we do clustering forecasting and many more things right so this is what a machine learning uh, is all about you know, they provide you stats tool you know to analyze the data visualize the data predictions doing uh, forecasting and clustering you know yeah power bi is also kind of tool which will actually help you to analyze the data and all right so internally it also uses a machine learning application machine learning algorithms over there it uses visualization tools integrated into it but at the end of the day again it is a kind of an ai application itself right so here I hope everybody has got an idea about what exactly machine learning is all about, you know. So it provides you stats tool. If you really want to make any person understand, you have to basically say in this particular way that it provides stats tool to analyze the data, visualize the data, predictions, doing forecasting and clustering and all, right? So anyhow, we basically say machine learning ML is a subset of AI, okay? ML is a subset of AI, perfect. So I hope everybody has understood till here 
uh, I hope you're getting that better definition what you are basically learning in these things, right? Now, coming to this, now, now it's not like, you know, uh, machine learning, whenever we talk about, you know, there are different, different components also that comes like NLP, natural language processing. Uh, over there, it will be an integrated part of it. Suppose if you use tools like uh, programming language like Python, we use stats, you know, to understand different, different things. But here I'm trying to cover the major chunk, you know, which will basically help you to understand all these things. Now coming to the next one, which is called as deep learning. Now deep learning is super, super important. Okay. And this is what our entire five session is all about, you know. So uh, another subset of machine learning, we basically say it as deep learning. Okay. Deep learning is not becoming, is it's not like recently only did not come up, you know, deep learning, the researcher were, if I probably write it over here, the researchers were working from 1958. Researchers were basically working from 1958. But right now it became really, really, really amazing because of the amount of data that is getting created and because of amazing GPU hardwares that we have, thanks to NVIDIA because of that entire research that you are, they are actually doing. You know, right now I'm also having RTX 3090. And probably if you work with this GPU, trust me, how amazing models you will be able to train. Right. So researchers, you know, uh, they, they, they started working in 1958s. And first, probably if I talk about any kind of uh, um, neural network, right, they, they, they specifically was focusing on working on multi-layered neural network, right, multi-layered neural network. And first neural network, if I probably talk about is something called as perceptron. Right. And today we will be discussing about perceptron in depth. We'll try to understand what exactly is perceptron and all. Right. But the main aim of deep learning, main aim of deep learning, suppose if I consider this as deep learning, the main aim of deep learning is basically to mimic, mimic human brain. Okay. So this main aim is basically to basically to mimic mimic basically means like how we human being learn things right we also want to make sure that the machine also learns in that particular way so here you can basically say mimic the human brain right so mimicking the human brain is the most important thing in this specific thing right so here you are specifically mimicking the human brain and we are making sure that the machine learning algorithms also learn in that particular way or any machine also learns in that specific way right so this is an idea about deep learning and our entire focus will be on deep learning for this entire five days where we'll be learning multiple things and all right so what are things we will be specifically learning in deep learning i'll just tell you in another five minutes and uh, by that you'll be able to get an entire idea about it now one very important thing where does data science fall into this right where does ds that is data science fall suppose if i say data science can be the part of everything you know so it can be the part of everything over here right it, it can basically like if you are a data scientist you probably have to work on machine learning algorithms you have to work probably you may get a work to work as a data analyst right uh, you may also work as a deep learning developer but at the end of the day the goal is to create an ai application okay the goal the last goal the final goal is basically to create an ai application so this was the first section quickly i wanted to cover it so uh one very co common question that we usually get where does computer vision come into existence it can be a part of deep learning also we can also use computer vision in machine learning also and we can use all these things but at the end of the day, we are basically creating an AI application. But here I really wanted to talk about the major chunk that we are basically discussing that is popular throughout the entire world. Whenever we people talk about AI, ML, DL or data science, we basically focus on to this, right? Now, perfect. Everybody is able to understand. Now we will ask a very common question. Okay. The common question will be that why deep learning is becoming so popular. It is becoming so popular. It is even becoming popular more than machine learning. Why deep learning is becoming popular? Right? Why deep learning is becoming popular? Now, this is the question that we will try to answer. Why deep learning is becoming popular? And, uh, you know, I hope everybody has basically uh, already told some of the points and we had already discussed before. So the one major point why deep learning is basically becoming popular. So here I'm just saying why, right? The so first point, obviously, right? Let's, let's go back to 2005, right? 2005 
which was the amazing social media network that actually came up before 2005 only orkut was there in the market right then later on what happened facebook came right now facebook is entirely based on web 2.0 what is web 2.0 it is a kind of entire the web application is developed in such a way that you will be able to log in you will be able to store your data you will be able to interact with other people so this facebook was a social media networking website right you can put images and all later on instagram face uh, whatsapp linkedin twitter right instagram uh, whatsapp right uh, linkedin twitter right this all this all websites this all web application had actually come right now in this all web application what was the main thing like here you are interacting with people you are posting something now because of this the data started to get generated exponentially right exponentially huge amount of data was actually getting generated right exponentially it was increasing the size of the data was definitely increasing right so at that point of time when i talk about 2008 you know the concept of big data you know big data was was in very high in demand you know because they wanted to store that data efficiently they wanted to store this data efficiently so that is the reason why big data team basically uh, big data engineering skill became very famous at that point of time you know people were looking for like in, when i was doing my engineering you know somewhere in 2010 and 11 there was huge opening of big data and big data are the people which are, who are actually storing this information efficiently so that we can actually read that particular data and use it wherever we require right so uh, that is why big data became very really really popular now as we went with time you know in probably in 2013 let's say 2013 as we went in time now what things were happening company had huge amount of data right so company had company had huge huge amount of data right huge amount of data now if company has huge amount of data will they just store and keep it will they just store and keep it right the answer is no right the answer is no they really want to use this data and basically bring a seamless experience into their products right they want to bring a seamless experience they want to make their product better and how that is basically possible that is only possible when you utilize the data that is already available so because of that what happened since we had a huge data data science ai i'll just write ai ai started becoming very very popular ai became popular do you know when did i start learning ai it was in the year 2013 to 14 right so at this point of time i made a successful career transition and at that point of time only i started learning and i knew that in the future this really has a good uh you know scope in short because data is getting generated from everywhere companies have pent up at a bytes of data and every day it is going to increase and probably in the future it is going to increase again exponentially so definitely you know uh in order to for the company to make their products better they really want to utilize this specific data and make their products still much more better itself and best example you can basically talk about netflix right netflix is using uh, whatever data we have basically uh used in their app right while seeing movies our profile information and all and based on that they are recommending things right so that is why that is so important right with respect to the data right so data really has a amazing importance altogether let's talk about my one of my company experience that is panasonic so what is panasonic famous for panasonic has lot of lot of products right and what are this kind of products let's say acs right or uh, tvs refrigerators right and initially also this all products right they were definitely generating data they were definitely generating data and when i joined panasonic somewhere around 2 3 years back you know i got a chance to make this products quite smarter right suppose i was specifically working with acs what did i do i i i created a model you know i created a model which can reduce the electricity bill which can reduce the electricity bill 
right? Because people, you know, how they use the AC, they bump up some time in the higher temperature, they, they come down directly to some lower temperature and all based on the outside temperature. What if I, I showed them a model that, okay, use this kind of profile and based on the outside temperature, you will be able to efficiently handle the ACs and probably your electricity bill may get reduced, right? So this is one example. Now, because of this, what happens is that they actually provide some seamless experience to their client. And definitely when you come up with this kind of model, this can also be sold in subscription basis, right? Subscription basis. So through this, at the end of the day, since they are bringing seamless experience in the product, so what will happen is that the company will generate revenues. They will generate revenues. They will be able to make better decisions, right? They will be able to make better decisions. Perfect. So I hope you are able to understand uh, the importance of the data. And this is with respect to the first point, right? Uh, all these things that I explained, why deep learning is becoming popular, because now you have a huge amount of data. Now let's go to the second point, right? Second point, which is super, again, very important, right? And that is hardware advancement, right? hardware advancement. I hope everybody knows about NVIDIA, right? I hope everybody knows about NVIDIA. What is so special about NVIDIA? They come up with this amazing GPUs, right? What is GPUs? Graphic processing units, right? And you know that in deep learning, whenever you create a multi-layered neural network, many parameters are actually created, right? And when many parameters are actually created, you have to probably do the training in the pa in, in, in epochs, right? Multiple epochs. And probably for that, a lot of times will be basically taking place, right? So GPUs actually helps you to train your model very faster. And right now the GPUs are uh, training the models and specifically, right, training the models. It will be very, very handy, you know. Now, recently, like if I talk about GPUs, this GPUs cost is really reducing day by day. And that is all because of the technological advancement. You know, the before GPUs, like let's say, let's say, let's say uh, an example of RTX Titan. Okay, so this was one GPU which I had on the first instance when NVIDIA had actually gifted me this. But today I'm actually using RTX 3090, which is more efficient than Titan RTX, right? So all these GPUs people are actually using, uh, NVIDIA is doing more better jobs. They're coming up with their own libraries so that we can basically train our deep learning models in an efficient way, right? So I hope the another interview question everybody is clear about why deep learning is becoming very popular. Right. Okay. Now uh, let's talk about the next thing. Let's talk about the first thing, which is called as perceptron. Now, now let's go to the next point, which is called as perceptron. And this is where I will first of all discuss about uh, single layer multi-layered neural, single layer neural network, and then we will probably discuss about multi-layer neural network. Right. Now, single layer neural network. Now, what happens basically in the single layer neural network? Or uh, I'll just take an example of perceptron. Okay, very simple. Now, uh, if I consider, okay, what is the basic structure of this multi layer or single layer neural network or this perceptron? Let's say. Now, suppose I will be drawing some circles. The circles are not some uh, food item. Okay, so I'm just trying to draw the circles. Let's say. Uh, I'll draw one more circle over here and I'll draw one more circle over here. Okay. Now this, yeah, I'll also be covering NLP. So don't worry. So this are my input. Okay. So this, we basically say it as input layers. Okay. This, since I'm creating a single layer neural network, so this becomes my hidden layer one. So this becomes my hidden layer one. Okay. And finally, this becomes my output layer. Okay. This becomes my output layer. Now, always remember, and let's, let's do one thing. Let's connect this every dots. Okay. Let's connect this every dots. And I will try to show you with respect to a good example with respect to our brain. Okay. So finally, I get my output over here. Okay. Now, Let's, let's take one very good example. Okay. Let's say, uh, I have a data set which shows, 
whether the student has passed or not okay suppose the student studies for play and this will basically be my pass sleep and this will be my play oh, sorry pass or fail pass or fail okay let's say that i have this specific uh, data set okay let's say uh, in one of the student has a record which is called as he basically studies for uh, seven hours he plays for three hours he sleeps for seven hours so probably if he's studying for this many hours i can say that the person will pass and since this is a binary classification i am just going to make it as one okay then let's say second record is that if the stud student study for two hours he plays for five hours he sleep for eight hours most of the chance is that the student will fail okay the third record if i consider suppose let's say the student uh, studies for four hours he plays for three hours he sleeps for seven hours i'm going to make it as pass okay let's say like this i have so many records available with me okay now with respect to this neural network how will i basically use this data set to train this binary classification because this is a binary classification problem okay binary classification problem let's see this okay so i hope everybody is able to see this binary classification problem now always understand this is my input layer okay now in this input layer this inputs will get passed okay this inputs record by record it will get passed so the first input is nothing but study okay i can basically say it as x1 then the second input is basically play i can basically say x2 and this third input is nothing but sleep i can basically say x3 okay uh here you can basically see that okay fine x1 x2 x3 is my inputs okay inputs i will be passing this records okay i will be passing this records okay so here what i am doing every record will get passed at one time suppose in the first instance i pass 7 3 7 right because that is what is my first record basically saying okay now let's say i have my eyes right and my brain is there now what is this input now i am able to see this monitor i am able to see the camera right so this signal that is basically passing that is an input right now when i see this right when i when i am seeing this i am able to determine okay this is the camera and i am seeing to the camera right i'm seeing definitely to the camera i'm seeing you all right so just say hi to me right i'm seeing to you i'm seeing you all through this virtual world right and definitely many people are able also to see me if i close this camera then obviously i'll not you will not be able to see me or i'll not be able to see you but when i see this camera i'm able to determine okay this is the camera and for seeing to the camera i have to see over here how this is happening this input is passing through my eyes this neural network it, the signal goes to the neural network and this is my hidden layer this is my hidden layer neurons so here i specifically talk about neurons so this we basically say that okay this hidden layer has one neuron and what is this neuron neuron biological neuron everybody is familiar with that right neuron does some kind of signal processing right it does some kind of signal processing now since i'm seeing this camera obviously through the input layer so my eyes becomes my input layer when it goes through the next neurons those neurons pre-process that data and then finally it comes to my output layer output layer is nothing but it is my brain somewhere in the back end side which is responsible for seeing or visualizing the camera right so this let's consider this is my another neuron this is my output neuron which will basically be able to predict what this is whether it is a camera whether it is a uh, television whether it is a mobile phone or whatever it is right so this is what is the importance of this so this specifically is called as output neuron okay and this is responsible for planning your final output how it looks like but let's consider a baby when a baby is born right if he sees the camera for the first time will he be able to predict that this is a camera the answer is no right obviously he needs to train right we need to tell him that okay this is a camera this is food this is your bed this is this this is milk like that right we have to tell him we have to continuously train him then after a couple of months right after a couple of months he'll be able to understand as soon as he sees uh, a bottle of milk he will start crying right that usually happens with my son so i uh, my son is somewhere around seven months 
Now he understands what is a mobile phone. He understands well, how does his milk look like, you know, in a bottle. So all those things he's basically be able to understand because from the day one he's getting trained, right? He's getting trained on that specific thing. So whenever we create a neural network from scratch, right? Always we need to train them, right? We need to train them based on the outputs. This is the output, right? This is what is the output we have to train based on this input data. Suppose if I show the mobile phone, it should be able to predict, okay, this is a mobile phone, right? We have to train them, right? Suppose if, if there is a camera and if I see the camera, I have to train that, okay, this is the camera itself, right? So the training process is something different, right? But I hope everybody is able to understand what does the hidden layer one look like and what is output layer. And like this, we may have any number of hidden layers because the signal passes through various neurons, one neuron to the other neuron, and each and every neurons will be having a different, different hidden layer. In the hidden layer one, I may have five to 10 neurons. In the next layer, I may have 100 neurons, right? And each and every neuron will be processing those uh, signals that is given from the input layer. So is this clear till here, everybody? So recently my, my child also said Papa, right? So I had to train him for six months. I had to tell him daily Papa, 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 Papa. Then finally he was able to talk about it, right? So that is the most happiest part. I have trained a original human neural network. So that's, that's amazing, right? So that is the reason why I'm able to explain you with so much of uh, in-depth analysis, right? Now we'll understand what kind of processing will happen in the next section, okay? Okay, fine. I have understood this is my input layer, this is my hidden layer, this is my output layer. But what is the processing that actually happens, right? What is the processing? What is this line for? When the signal is getting passed from here to here, what is the thing that will happen inside this neuron that we can basically see, okay? So uh, I hope everybody's clear till here. Let's go to the next step. And uh, I'll, I'll still not again uh, create all these things. So I will just do a little bit of smart work and I'll copy the same thing, copy it and I will paste it over here. Amazing, right? So this, I love this editor, you know. Now uh, let's go, okay? I've already shown my data set. My data set looks like this, okay? Uh, seven, three, seven, one, like this. So input will definitely go. What happens when the input from the input layer, it goes to the hidden layer one. No, it is not necessary. You need to have hidden layer one only. Okay. You can have many hidden layers. I'm just talking about perceptron. This is one example. Okay. Now let's say what happens in this layer, what happens in between as soon as the input goes to the hidden layer one. So here we assign weights. Let's say these are my weights. Okay. Now, what is the importance of this particular weight? We will try to understand. But before that, what do we do with this weights? We'll try to understand. Okay. Let me create it uh, once again for you all. I can take this much pain. Come on. So this is my input layer, uh, input one, input two, input three. All right. And let's say in my hidden layer, this time I take two neurons. So one, two neurons. Let's say I can have any number of neurons. Okay. I'll talk about how the weights is decided and all. Don't worry. Okay. And finally, this is my output layer. Let's connect this uh, quickly. Uh, so this is my I1, input 1, input 2, input 3. And this is getting connected over here, here, here. Remember, every neurons will get connected, right? Every neuron has to get connected, you know? So then only it will be working because it is just like our brain cells, right? Every signal will get processed. Okay. Let's talk about it. So this is my X1. This is my X2. This is my X3. Now what happens? What happens inside this? Let's, let's talk about it. Like uh, what exactly happens in this? So here I will be assigning different, different weights. Okay. I will be assigning different, different weights. So let me just make this diagram a little bit more simpler so that again, you should not get confused because if we are able to understand one, right, then definitely you'll be able to understand all the other things. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take one neuron and I'll make this neuron size bigger so that two operations can fit in this. And finally, my output neuron. Okay. So this will get connected over here. This will get connected over here and this will get connected over here and this will get connected over here. And finally, this is my output. So this is my hidden layer one. This is my output layer. Okay, so I hope everybody now here I've already told you we will assign 
different weights. I'll talk about the importance of weights. Now inside this, there will be two operations that will be happening. The first operation will be that we just have to do the summation of x of i and w of i. Okay. So what we are doing summation of x of i w of i that this basically means what if I write the equation what is summation of x of i w of i it is nothing but x1 w1 plus x2 w2 plus x3 w3 plus okay so here what we are actually doing we are just multiplying x1 and w1 plus x2 and w2 and x3 and w3 right I can also write this as w transpose x okay and i hope everybody remembers this thing right it is similar to our equation of the linear regression like beta 0 plus beta 1 multiplied by x right we can also write this as beta transpose x right same linear regression if you remember in linear regression we also use y is equal to mx plus c different different equations right so same thing right so this is nothing but w transpose x Okay, so W transpose X is nothing but it is the summation of X1. Uh, it is a summation of inputs multiplied by the weights. Okay, input multiplied by the weights. So this is the first step. This is the first step in the signal. Okay, and this is basically the first step. Now, what about the second step? In the second step, we pass this equation to an activation function. We pass this to an activation function. Okay. So we pass this to an activation function. Okay. Now, let me first of all, okay, before going to the second step, let's understand what is the importance of this weights. Okay. Now tell me, guys, suppose if I put my hot, if I put a hot object in my right hand, then will I not move my right hand away? It's a very common question. See, very simple question. What I am doing is that. I will put a hot object into my right hand and then obviously it is sure that I will be removing my right hand. Okay. I'll be removing my right hand. Now when I remove the right hand, the reason why I'm removing the right hand because the neurons that are passing from here, those are getting activated, right? Those are getting activated, right? If I'm putting a hot object over here, the neurons will definitely pass that signal to the brain saying that something hot object is placed and I'm going to move it. So this weights will actually help your neurons to act, whether it should be activated or what level it should be activated. Let's say if I'm putting the hot object into my hand, I'm not moving my left hand. That basically means my neuron are signaling the weights over here and it is making sure that all these neurons get activated till it passes the signal. So this is the importance of weights during the training, during the training of the neural network also, we will be taking care that which weights should have what value so that the neuron should be activated till that level or not. Okay. Very, very simple. This is the, this is the most easiest way to understand about weights. Okay. So weights basically says that how much the neuron should get activated or deactivated. That's it. Very simple if you really want to understand as a person who really want to clear the job interview quick as possible. Okay. Now, I hope everybody has understood this. Okay. Now, what if, see, this weights also initially we initialize it as zero. Okay. We initialize it as zero, right? Let's, let's say that I have initialized it to zero. It is not necessary that we always initialize to zero, but let's say I have initialized to zero. Now, if I have initialized to zero, what will happen? x1 multiplied by 0 will be 0, x2 multiplied by 0 will be 0, x3 multiplied by w3 will also be 0. Okay. Now, when all this value are 0, we are just passing 0, right? So, for that, for that to overcome so that the weight should not be 0, we add another parameter, one more parameter, which is called as bias. Okay. So, I hope everybody has understood why do we add a bias and I hope you have seen this term, right? This is a constant term. We basically say it as a constant. We basically say that it is an intercept, right? Intercept, right? We say C as intercept, right? So that is the reason why in that equation also you'll find an intercept. In this also you have a bias such that by mistake, if you probably initialize all the weights as zero, bias will have some value so that some value it will not be equal to zero. 
so we can continue that particular training later on we can update the weights right now what happens in the second step let's understand okay what happens in the second step okay so in the second step let's say that this this entire equation this entire equation that i have written that is summation of x of i w of y is given by y okay then we pass an activation function an activation function on top of y okay an activation function on top of y okay now yeah bias will be required in every hidden layer okay every every hidden layer it will be required one bias will basically required now what is this activation function let's say let's say again i put a hot object in my hand i'm moving the hand right i'm moving the hand so this basically shows that whether the neuron should be activated or deactivated right so one of the activation function one example of the activation function which i am going to basically take is something called as sigmoid activation function now this sigmoid activation function what it does is that i will talk about the equation it is 1 e to the power of minus y let's say okay now we will discuss about relu and all uh, on the other uh, in the upcoming classes but let's say one example of this this is a sigmoid activation function we basically use it for binary classification let's say binary classification okay now if i replace y now y is what this one right 1 plus e to the power of minus this summation of x of y w of y right plus bias sorry i have to add bias also on top of it okay i have to add bias also on top of it because this bias is also getting added right over here now this entire thing will become summation of x of i uh, w of i plus bias okay b okay now the output of this equation is either 0 or 1 that is what sigmoid activation function does about sigmoid activation function always gives the output as 0 or 1 it is not like it always gives 0 or 1 it can give you values between 0 to 1 we write a condition if it is greater than 0.5 we basically take it as 1 greater than or equal to 0.5 we take it as 1 and if it is less than 0.5 we take it as 0 okay so this two condition usually applies in sigmoid activation function but the main reason of the sigmoid activation function is to basically say that whether this neuron is activated or not okay so i hope everybody is able to understand and this usually happens in every neuron okay first thing summation of the weights and the inputs along with the bias so here i'm going to write plus bias and then this will be an activation function of y okay on top of it we take this entire thing and we put up a activation function okay so this is what happens and then when we go to the next layer another weight will get initialized over here again two steps will basically happen that will be the summation of this output whatever output i am getting over here let's say o1 okay o1 and this will get multiplied to w4 again what will happen over here the next activation function will get applied and finally i will be able to get 0 or 1 now this is with respect to binary classification we use sigmoid activation function for linear regression what all things we use there is another activation function which is called as linear activation function this also thing we'll discuss today i just want to introduce you to some basic basic topics and that name should be always there so what all things we have learned till now we have learned topics like what is weights right we have learned topics like what is neurons right we have learned about neurons we have learned about hidden layers we have learned about active we have got an idea we have got an idea about this terminology what is activation functions right so all these things uh, slowly slowly now we are going to cover more and more topics okay but today i just want to show you what all topics are basically there what are topics are basically there okay everybody is able to understand right so uh, i hope everybody was able to understand till here uh, let's continue the next topic now i will give you an idea about forward propagation now whatever operation that we have done till here from here to here till the output right what what all functions we did we basically took the input multiplied by the weights added a bias and activate right we multiplied the inputs with the weights added an a bias and activate right so this you can basically remember we took a input we multiplied with the weights we added a bias and then we activated right so this entire process 
till the end is called as forward propagation so this is basically called as forward propagation okay so this is basically called as forward propagation now let's discuss one very important thing okay let's discuss one very important thing let's say let's say for this first input okay this first input 737 i passed i went inside this i initialized a weight and let's say i got an output of i got an output of let's say i got an output of 0 okay i got an output of 0 now when i got an output of 0 okay when i got an output of 0 but this 0 will be my predicted value y hat this will be my predicted value that is y hat okay for the forward propagation first forward propagation then what is my y y is my truth value so what is my truth value over here my truth value is 1 right my truth value is 1 i hope everybody is able to understand what is my truth value here obviously my truth value is 1 so if i take this 0 and 1 if i just subtract it y minus y hat Obviously, this is not the output that I want. I want 1 as my output, but I am getting 0 as in my output, right? So, if I subtract y minus y hat, I am actually going to get 1. Yes or no? Yes, everybody is clear? See, y is nothing but 1, y hat is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1, right? Y, 1 minus 0 is 1. Yes or no? Okay? Now, since my difference is 1 and I know my output is completely wrong that I am getting, right? So, what I have to make sure that this difference should be very near to 0, okay? This difference should be very near to 0. So, what can I do for that? And what is this y minus y hat? There is a very important term which is called as loss function. So, what is loss function? Loss function, they are different kind of loss function. Okay, they are different kind of loss function which I will be discussing. But here I am more focused to tell you about terminologies. So, loss function will basically find out the difference between your predicted value and your real value. And always the main aim should be that we should try to minimize the difference. Everybody clear? We should try to minimize the difference. The difference should be very much near to zero. Then only this y hat and y will be matching, right? So, this is basically called as loss function. Okay? This is basically called as loss function. Now, I know my difference is quite huge. Now, what is the next thing that I have to do if my difference is huge? We then do a very important thing which is called as back propagation. And what is the aim of the back propagation? The main aim of the back propagation is to update, is to, is to update weights. Because only when I update these weights, right? Only while, while we are updating these weights, right? Then only we will be able to get this predicted output match to our real output. What is my real output over here? I'm training a supervised machine learning or deep learning problem statement. My output should be 1, but I am actually getting 0. Right? So, to reduce this difference, what we have to do is that we have to update this weights. Right? We have to update this weights. And this updation process will basically happen because of back propagation. And how is this basically happening? How back propagation is happening? So, we have another concept which is called as optimizers. These optimizers will make sure that each and every weight will get updated while we are back propagating. So, guys, are you able to understand or not? Understand the process. Don't worry about what is happening inside. That I will definitely cover. The maths part. I will definitely cover. But understand how the training happens. This is the training process. Training process includes 
weights it includes forward propagation it includes bias it includes this operation that is happening inside the neurons and then when we get the output we find out the loss function right and what is the difference between the loss function if the difference is high then we back propagate it and we update the weights with the help of back propagation and over there we use something called as optimizers how many of you know simple linear regression how many of you know simple linear regression how many of you know simple linear regression tell me okay how many of you know simple linear regression just tell me in simple linear regression have you heard of gradient descent so one example of an optimizer is gradient descent what is gradient descent doing over there it is changing the coefficients it is a combination of both forward and backward propagation in the backward propagation weights will get updated in the forward propagation weights multiplied by the inputs bias will get added and an activation function will get added till the output is basically coming so in simple linear regression i hope everybody has heard about gradient descent right gradient descent what is this gradient descent what it does is that i hope everybody has seen this curve right seen this curve right gradient descent will make sure that the coefficient this is the coefficient right this will be the coefficient it will make sure that it will update this coefficient from here or here to basically come to the global minima and this global minima the difference of y and y hat will be minimal and the same thing is basically happening in this thing also so that is the reason when i explained about machine learning whether you have seen or not i have explained this specific thing and this gradient descent is a kind of optimizer this is a kind of optimizers so in short let's start the story whatever things we have learned from today so story conclusions i'll say so first step what is this first step we have learned about input layer now from the input where it goes to the second step the second step weights will get added right the third step after the weights the input and the weights will get added and then it will get added along with the bias and then what is the fourth step an activation function will get applied activation function will get applied till the last layer this entire process in the forward propagation forward propagation right and in the backward propagation what will happen fifth step in the backward propagation first we calculate the loss function loss function is nothing but the difference between y hat and y let's say let's take this one example the different types of loss function we have to minimize this value how do we minimize we use optimizers optimizes what it does it updates the weight updates the weight and this is the entire process of what backward propagation backward propagation and if this step is happening one like one forward propagation one backward if you are doing it thousand times our neural network will get trained just like a baby gets trained that's it that's it that's that's how important it is and how easy it is if you are able to basically uh, see it with examples right you are able to understand this right so it is just the combination of forward and backward propagation and here you will be able to get some amazing outputs like this let it be image classification object detection now what all things in deep learning will be there very much important one thing you learn about ann you learn about cnn you learn about rnn everything works on forward propagation and backward propagation you learn about object detection object detection everything works on forward and backward propagation with different optimizers right and we don't have to even do 1000 times within 10 times also if the neural network is able to train it is able to train right okay let's let's take one example i've shown you a new kind of species let's say i've shown you a new kind of flower suppose you don't know the flower name 
okay today i will train you okay this flower is black rose let's say okay so you will you will just remember okay he told black rose tomorrow i may show you again that particular flower that you may again not be able to remember if tomorrow as i say you that okay this is black rose then second day okay you'll get more confident on the third or the fourth day whenever i show you that particular flower you will be saying that it is a black rose and that is how we train a neural network like we train a human being now let's understand how does a multi layer neural network look that was a single layer neural network right a multi layer neural network will have lot of inputs let's say i have inputs over here in the hidden layer i will be having so many different different neurons right over here again i may have any number of neurons not limited to anything and here in the output layer also i may have multi class classification problem okay and this all will be combined together let's say i'm going to use green dots this all will be combined together right this all will be combined together and this is nothing but a multi layer neural network and it is going to basically just do the same process whatever i've taught you in the single layer nothing different in every layer bias will get added everything is almost same everything nothing i have not hidden anything any concept with you now everything will get connected <coughs> and everything will there just for case of multi classification a different types of art activation function may get used a different kind of loss function may get used that's it okay so this exactly is called as a multi layered neural network it need not be only two hidden layers any number of hidden layers so multi layered neural network and finally this is my okay so this is my output layer this is my hidden layer 2 this is my hidden layer 1 this is my input layer that's it and just imagine in one hour <laughs> we have covered so many things if you know this much for the interview also then also you'll be able to crack the job with some practical implementation because they will not go inside that how how uh, mathematical equation will be there in optimize the all that just for our learning interest we learn those things now what we will do is that tomorrow uh, we will understand about in depth activation functions what are the different types of activation function we'll also be understanding loss function so tomorrow i'll try to cover this too how to update the weight and optimizers will be covered in day 3 and in day 2 uh, we'll uh, in day 3 we'll also see practical examples okay and those practical examples will be super important because by that you will be able to learn ann anyhow that you want okay so why there is a need of neural network it is basically to mimic the human brain how a human brain basically gets trained we also want to train our neural network like that okay our machine learning applications or any applications like that okay okay perfect uh now uh okay there is also one concept in uh back propagation you know there is something called as uh derivative or uh, chain rule of differentiation so that thing also tomorrow i'll cover chain rule of differentiation so i hope you have understood this video see what all things we are going to learn first of all we are going to learn ann okay already we have started this perceptron is a concept of ann then we'll go with cnn then we'll go with rnn and then probably we will try to close some example of object detection but i need another 7 days to complete nlp okay nlp introduction will be done over here okay but nlp completely in depth i will take another 7 days to complete it okay so that we will plan it probably in this month or in next month okay see this is one of the session that i had taken uh, the uh, deep learning and this is how the material looks like so that's it from my side and yes keep on rocking keep on learning I will see you all in the next session. Have a great day. Thank you one doll. Bye-bye. Okay. And uh, yes, about the books, I do refer this book. Uh, let me show you the book that I refer. This is the book that I refer. Okay. Apart from this, I also have one more book. So, these two books I usually refer. Okay. So, I have already completed anyhow these two books. And probably will be covering many books as such okay uh, this is the plan and yeah please make sure that you share it everywhere okay
Thank you everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. So let's continue. Uh, so today is the day two. I've cleared the screen and let me write today is the day two of deep learning session so deep learning and what is the agenda that we are going to cover today number one the agenda uh, we'll go Again, we'll get an idea about forward propagation. Okay. Then uh, we will understand, uh, before understanding the loss functions, we will first of all understand chain rule of derivatives. Chain rule of derivatives. Okay. We'll understand this. And then we'll also be getting an idea about many things as such so about chain rule of uh, derivatives or differentiation, which is a very important topic. Then after completing chain rule of derivatives, we are going to understand a very important problem, which is called as vanishing gradient problem. Okay, so we are going to understand about vanishing gradient problem. The fourth thing that we are going to understand uh, is basically about loss functions what are the different types of loss functions so in this session we are going to cover all these things okay and uh, we are going to cover in an efficient manner wherein i will probably write each and everything in front of you and we'll try to complete this in two hours of time okay so let's go ahead and let's first of all again go back to the basics uh, whatever we think we learned yesterday so suppose this is my neural network with three inputs and I have one neuron in the hidden layer and finally one neuron in the uh, output layer, right? So this becomes my input x1, x2, x3. Let's say this is my x1, x2, x3 and this in further will get connected to our hidden neuron, okay? And finally this goes to my output layer. Okay, so this is my hidden layer one, hidden layer one, and this is my output layer. Just to add one more thing, uh, we have something called as bias. Bias also gets added and bias also gets added in each and every hidden layer. Okay, so uh, and then what we do, we get basically y hat and then we define our loss function my loss will nothing be it will be the difference between y and y hat and our main aim is to reduce this loss value so what we do first step is basically the forward propagation in the forward propagation we assign different weights these weights are assigned randomly and there are various ways to assign the weights which we will be having a look onto it okay and then finally i go to w4 which is another weight over here whatever output is basically coming from here it will go over here and finally it will go to the output layer this inputs are basically your data points which i have already discussed yesterday okay and over here two things basically happen in every neuron first i will say y is equal to it is nothing but summation of w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 and then a bias gets added over here and after that we have something called as an activation function will get applied on top of it which i will specifically write as z so let's consider this is the symbol that i'm using as an activation function one activation function that we have already seen is something called as sigmoid activation function we will also see different kinds of activation functions today okay sigmoid activation function main aim is that we try to convert this y value uh, as 0 or 1 okay so whenever it is greater than or 0 0.5 we get it as 1 if it is less than 0 0.5 we get it as 0 so till yesterday we had discussed all these things uh this y can also be given by another symbol which is nothing but w transpose x plus b 
okay and this is nothing but a linear regression in short but because of the activation function we basically get non-linear properties okay we are able to solve non-linear problems so till here we have basically discussed okay all the resource link will be given in the description perfect now uh, let's go ahead and let's try to understand i hope everybody has understood this specific thing usually happens in the forward propagation right so this is what happens in the forward propagation in every layer right in every layer the forward propagation basically happens right now once i get my output that is y hat and then we calculate our loss function now what will happen in order to reduce the loss function how will we be able to reduce the loss function okay that is what uh, we are going to understand now in in order to reduce the loss we really need to update this weights right we really need to update this weights and this updation of the weights usually happen in the back propagation okay and how the weights are getting updated that is what we are going to see so let's go to the back propagation second step which we are specifically going to discuss about back propagation here in this back propagation we will see two things one is weight updation formula weight updation formula the second thing that we are probably going to see uh in the weight updation formula is that uh how what is the chain rule of differentiation chain rule of differentiation so this is what we are going to cover this both the topics we will be covering now let's let me again define this entire things now over here let's say i have three inputs and one hidden neuron and one output neuron right this all are will be interconnected right now over here this is my input this is my weights w1 w2 w3 let's say this weight is w4 and finally i get my output this output is nothing but my y hat right then i calculate in my loss y minus y hat and my in order to reduce this loss what we do we have to update this weight so the weight updation formula and that is where optimizers will also come okay optimizers will be very much useful when we are actually doing chain rule of differentiation now suppose i want to update this weight w4 how this weights gets updated forward propagation i hope everybody is clear right now in the backward propagation the main aim is that we have to update this weight so here i'm just going to write backward propagation okay now in the backward propagation we need to update weights w4 w1 w2 w3 now how this weight updation will happen so here i'm going to write the weight updation formula weight updation formula the weight updation formula is very very simple i will write a generic formula i'll say w new w new basically means the weight that is getting updated is nothing but w old w old basically means the previous weight because in the forward propagation this weight will have a different value and when we do the back propagation we need to update this so previous weight whatever it was minus learning rate derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old so i will be discussing about each and every parameters over here this parameter that you see is nothing but it is a learning rate i'll talk about the importance of learning rate just in some time but the first important thing that we really need to understand is this value okay so what is this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old okay so this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old is nothing but it is basically calculating the slope okay we are basically trying to calculate the slope now when we are calculating this slope i hope everybody has learnt linear regression right in linear regression also what we do we update we update the weights or coefficient right so i hope everybody have learnt in the simple linear regression i have also made live sessions on machine learning also for the same now in this case what happens is that we basically get this kind of curve and this is basically called as gradient descent this gradient descent is nothing but it is the graph 
with respect to weights and the loss function okay weights and the loss function now in this graph this point that you probably see this point is basically called as global minima this point is basically called as global minima when we are training and updating the weights we definitely have to come to this particular point okay anyhow it may be at this point or it may be at this point but anyhow we have to come into this particular point now why this formula will definitely work that is what we are going to understand first of all okay suppose let's say that i have one point over here initially let's say with respect to w any weights the previous weights i got a loss function which is coming at this point okay here i have i have actually drawn a 2d diagram but this usually looks like a 3d curve okay 3d curve just imagine that uh, there is a mountain and we have inverted that mountain right so in that way this will be like a 3d curve okay and our main aim is basically to come to this specific point okay now during this 3d curve let's say that first point comes over here now when we apply this derivative of loss with respect to this weight at this specific point in short what we are actually doing is that we are basically creating a tangent line and based on this tangent line we basically find out the slope slope we actually find out like this now this is basically my loss function this is my weights okay now when we try to find out the slope now the first thing we need to understand whether this is a positive slope or negative slope and how do you determine this obviously through calculation we will definitely get it, uh, get it as a positive or negative slope but one very important thing that you should definitely be knowing is that whenever the right side of the line see whenever this right side of the line is pointing downwards okay whenever this right side of the line is pointing downwards then we should basically understand that this is a negative slope okay negative slope now when it is a negative slope suppose if i go and point this weights over here right this is my weights now my main target should be that i should be increasing this weight so that i move to this global minima okay i should be moving to this global minima now in order to do this i have to increase the weight and in this particular option weight updation formula either i can increase or decrease the weight okay i can either increase or decrease the weight so suppose in this particular case i get a negative slope negative slope basically means some negative value so my weight updation formula will now become see what it will become w new is equal to w old minus learning rate of some negative value in the case of negative slope and in case of negative slope you have already seen that i have to increase my weights i have to increase this weights to come over here right that is what i am actually looking at now what will happen w old negative into negative will be a positive value right this positive value will be multiplied by learning rate multiplied by some positive value so here you know that at the end of the day what will happen my w new let me write it down over here my w new so this will be a positive value right my w new will be always greater than w old because i am adding the previous weights in this particular case so whenever we have a negative slope by this specific equation it will definitely work because we are trying to increase the weights and that is the reason why w new when we are applying over here a negative slope then it will become minus into minus which will be nothing but positive and when i probably add up this value my w new will definitely be greater than w old okay so definitely with the help of a negative slope i am able to increase the weights which is basically what i want over here let's say in the case of this slope suppose in this point i go and draw a i draw i i go and draw up a slope like this now in this particular case what will be my slope this will basically be a positive slope how i am saying because just see the right side right hand side of the line it is pointing upwards here it was pointing downwards and if you do the calculation also of this particular slope it will be a positive slope now in this particular case if i go and probably plot this w over here i in order to come over i have to decrease this weight i have to decrease this weight okay now what will happen the again formula see in this particular case i am getting a positive slope okay if i 
put this positive slope in this equation, what will happen? Now, my W new will be W old minus learning rate of some positive value. Right? Of some positive value. And when I probably subtract this with some positive value, what will happen? W new will be less than W old, right? This is what we it is proved. So what was our main aim with respect to weights? I should be able to increase or decrease the weights. And that is what I'm able to do it over here. Right. So through this, through this, uh, this is basically a gradient descent. Uh, and this is basically happening from the loss function. I will discuss about all the loss functions just going forward. But just understand that in linear regression also, whenever I plotted by using this loss function, which I have actually used over here, that is y minus y hat whole square. At that point of time, you will be able to see if I plot with respect to weights and loss function, I'll be getting this gradient descent. And for back propagation, how I'm updating the formula, this is the updation formula, whereas W new is equal to W old minus learning rate of DL, uh, derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W old. But now, what is the importance of this learning rate we need to understand? Now, see guys, I need to come to this global minima. My main aim is basically to come to this global minima. And in order to come, I can take larger step also, I can take smaller step also, right? It is always a good practice that our learning rate should be a small number. If it is a small number, we will be slowly converging into the global minimum. Okay, we will be slowly converging into the global minima. If I probably take a larger number, what happens if my learning rate is a larger number? then it may be a problem sometime because my my this point weights points will be jumping here and there and it it may be a situation that it may never come to the global minima it will be jumping here and there so it is always a good practice that you take a learning rate as a smaller number the learning rate uh, that i usually take or any probably researchers usually take is somewhere around 0 0.001 or you can also take 0 0.01 right and this I will try to show you in the practical also. Okay. So our main aim should be that we should slowly converge. Otherwise, it may be a situation wherein I may never reach the global minima or not. So I hope you are able to understand till here. Uh, please do hit like if you are able to understand. And please do comment, comment down some good messages if I can see whether you are following or not. Okay. So till here, I hope everybody is able to understand with respect to the weight updation formula. Perfect. Now, after the weight updation, now you have understood this weight updation basically happens in this specific way. And uh, you are able to clearly see that how the weight updation usually happens and what all things we are able to do with this. And this is how in the back propagation, we basically do it. Now, let's take one very simple example. And let's see the entire chain rule of differentiation. Now, second point over here, I told you about first point in back propagation. First thing that happens is weight updation formula. The second thing that basically happens is something called as chain rule of differentiation. Okay. Now let's go to the second point. Now in the second point, I basically see something called as chain rule of differentiation. Okay. Now in the chain rule of differentiation, what happens? And what is this chain rule of differentiation? We'll try to understand. Okay. Everybody has understood this. So I'm just going to copy this entire thing and probably just paste it over there so that I don't have to rework it. Okay. Now let's take the same diagram. Okay. Now you have understood what happens in the forward propagation and you have also understood the weight updation formula. Let me write the weight updation formula. It is nothing but W old, sorry, W new is equal to W old minus learning rate multiplied by derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W old. Okay. So this is the formula. Perfect. Everybody has understood, I guess. Now, our main thing is that how this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W old happens. We need to understand. Okay. Let's say I want to find out the derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W4, W4 old. Okay, I want to find out this. So how W4 will get updated? Okay, how, how W4 will get updated? So what I can write is that I can basically say W4 new is equal to W4 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss 
with respect to derivative of W4 old. Okay, so this is the formula for W4 whenever we try to update W4, right? All the other values we can easily get it. Okay, we can basically easily get it all the values like W4 old will be able to get it learning rate is initialized in initially. But the question lies, how do I find this value that is derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W old. Now derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W4 old. Here I will specifically use something called as chain rule of derivative. Now what is this chain rule of derivative in order to find out? Let's let's understand. Okay. Now, chain rule of derivative is basically says, since this is my loss, right? Let me write it down over here. Let's say the output of this neuron is basically O1. The output of this neuron is basically O2. What is this output? This multiplied by the weights is basically my output after applying an activation function. This inputs multiplied, this x1, x2, x3, multiplied by this, added a bias, and then activation function, I'll be getting an uh, output as O1. I hope that everybody's clear about because I've already covered it. Now, how to basically update this W4 with the help of chain rule, okay? I'll write down the equation over here, okay? Now, in order to in order to find out this, what I will write, I will say that derivative of loss, now loss is dependent on what? It is dependent on the O2 value, first of all. Okay, it is dependent on O2 because I need to update W4. So first of all, this loss is dependent on O2. So I can basically write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O2. And then according to the chain rule, the next step that we will be going on, wherein O2 is now dependent on W4. So what I will write in further step is that derivative of O2 divided by derivative of W4. Now here, if I sub, if I just cross this two, okay, if I cross this two, then what will happen? I will be getting this only, right? This will be my W4 old. If I cross this two, because this also can be removed, right? And this is what chain rule of derivative basically means. There will be a chain that will be formed in order to calculate this derivative of loss, right? So this is one example of the chain rule to update W4. And what exactly is happening over here? We are basically trying to calculate the slope with respect to this particular derivative and we'll be able to get the answer, okay? Let me add one more step. What is O2? Let's say this is my Z input, okay? Z input is nothing but O1 multiplied by W4. And then we add a bias and then we add an activation function, right? We add a bias and then we add an activation function, right? So what is this Z? If I write, what is this Z? Z is nothing but it is an activation function applied to O1 W4 plus bias. I hope everybody is correct with this particular thing, right? I hope everybody is able to understand over here, right? O1 multiplied by W4 plus bias because here also bias will get added, right? Here also bias will get added. Here also bias will get added, right? Another bias. So this will be B1. This will be B2. And bias will also have the same updation formula like how weights are actually having, okay? So if I probably write the bias activation function, it will be nothing but B2 old is equal to, sorry, B2 new. It should be B2 new is equal to B2 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of b2 old right so this is the bias activation function sorry not bias activation this is the bias updation formula right bias uh updation formula and it, it is similar these two are almost similar for bias also it will happen for weights also it will happen okay so i hope everybody is able to understand till here right now what is our next step okay the next step is that let's say I want to update this particular value of this weights W1. So how I will go ahead? Let's see. Okay. So I will write derivative of derivative of let, let me write it down. So how it will be? I will basically write W1 new is equal to W1 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old, right? This is the formula for updating W1. Yes, for updating W1, this is the formula. Now just try it from your side. You know, just pause the video and try it from your side that how will my chain rule work in this particular case? 
how will my chain rule work in this particular case when I am basically trying to find out the derivative of loss with respect to W1. So here I'm just going to take this up. Okay. I'm basically going to take this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old. Now, how I'm going to basically write this chain rule because for this only, this is my main concern, right? This is how I, I have to apply the chain rule in this particular equation. Okay. So how will I go ahead? Now, let's go back. Okay. Now, first step, you know that loss is dependent on O2. O2 is dependent on O1 and O1 is dependent on W1. Okay. Now, see, see the chain rule. Loss is first of all dependent on O2. So what I will write? I will basically write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O2. Okay. First step, derivative of O2. Then I will multiply it over here. Okay. Derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O2. Now, O2 is dependent on O1. You can see over here, right? Because O1 output is this one, O2 output is this one. So in the next step, what I will write is that I will basically say derivative of O2 divided by derivative of O1. Right? So this step is also very much clear. Okay? And the next step, what we are basically doing, O1 is now dependent on W1. You can see over here, O1, this O1 is dependent on W1. Right. So now I will go ahead and write the next step that is derivative of O1 divided by derivative of derivative of W1 old. Right. So this becomes my new chain rule of differentiation to update W1. Right. To update W1, this becomes my different chain rule of differentiation. Right. So I hope everybody is able to understand. Now just try it out with respect to W2. With respect to W2, what will be my eight up updation formula? So again, I will go and write over here W2 new is equal to W2 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W2 old. Okay, so this is my another formula. Now, how do I write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W2 old? Okay, how do I write? Okay, see, don't worry about W4. You may be thinking, where is W4? W4 can still be divided. See, this same thing, this o, derivative of O2 to derivative of O21 can also be done with chain rule like this. Derivative of W4 multiplied by derivative of W4 by derivative of O1. Yes. So, I hope everybody is able to understand. This L is nothing but loss. Right? Loss is dependent on that. Right? So, like this, you can still more divide it. Since we are learning chain rule of differentiation, it can be expanded to any manner you want. But at the end of the day, you will be getting this specific thing only. Right? Now, let's see one more example. Let's say uh, I, I create a separate neural network. This neural network looks a little bit cubersome. Okay? Let's say in the first, in I just have one input layer, one input neuron. Okay? Then I have one hidden neuron. Okay, then in the next hidden layer, I have two hidden neuron and in the third, in the final output, I have one hidden, uh, one neuron in the output layer. So when I combine this, this becomes at this shape. Okay. This becomes at this shape. Okay. And finally, I get my output. Okay. Now, let's say this is my X1. This is my W1. This is my W2. This is my W3. This is my W4. This is my W5 and finally, this is my output of this. So let's say I'll also write the output. This output is nothing but O11. This output is nothing but O21. This output is nothing but O22. And this output is nothing but O31. And then what happens? I get Y hat and then finally I get my loss. Okay. So let me just show you. First of all, you try. I would suggest you try it by yourself and then come to a conclusion. Okay. So over here, I can basically write W1 old is equal to, sorry, it should be new again. I'm writing old. So W1 new is equal to W1 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old. This is the weight updation formula. This everybody knows it. Okay. But if we go to the next step, how do we calculate derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old? Now, just understand the chain rule. There are two roots that you can basically see over here. The first root goes in this way. 
loss is dependent on O31, O31 is dependent on O21, O21 is dependent on O11 and O11 is dependent on W1. This is one route. So this is basically my one route which I can actually go. And the other route is something this one. I have one more route that is basically dependent on this in order to update W1 because this all dependency is also there. So how do I go ahead? How do I combine these two things? Okay. How do I combine these two things? Okay. So let's go and update this. Now, how do I write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old? First, I will take this path and find out the chain rule of differentiation. And then I will be adding this path. So when I combine both of them, it is just like an OR operation. Okay. So let's go ahead. So first of all, let's go on the topmost path. So here derivative of loss is dependent on O31. O31 is dependent on O21. O21 is dependent on O11. O11 is dependent on W1. Okay. So here I can basically write derivative of loss, derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O31. Then multiplied by derivative of O31 divided by derivative of O21. Then multiplied by derivative of O21 divided by O21 is dependent on O11, right? O11. And then again multiplied by derivative of O11 divided by derivative of W1 hold. So this is one. This is the first path, right? Now in the second path, I will be adding one more. That is the lower path, right? The lower path will be what? Over here. Lower path is again derivative of loss dependent on O31. O31 is dependent on O22. O22 is dependent on O11. O11 is dependent on W1. Very simple, right? So here I will basically write derivative of loss. Derivative of loss is dependent on O31 plus, sorry, multiplied. Since we are doing chain rule, then O31 is dependent on O22. So now I will change this. Derivative of O31 is dependent on derivative of O22. Then again, we'll try to multiply this. Derivative of O22 is dependent on O11, right? So derivative of O22, derivative of O22 is dependent on derivative of O11. And finally, derivative of O11 is dependent on derivative of W1. Old, right? So we have to add this both up. And then we will be able to get the solution for the weight updation formula in the backward propagation. So this usually happens in the backward propagation. Who does this task? There is something called as optimizers. We'll discuss about this in depth, but I really wanted to make you understand about what exactly is chain rule of differentiation. And this is what exactly chain rule of differentiation is, right? So we basically call this as chain rule of derivatives right chain rule of derivatives now we'll go to the next topic okay so i hope everybody has understood about the chain rule of differentiation okay so uh, the next topic that we are probably going to discuss about is something called as vanishing gradient problem okay so vanishing gradient problem is a major major problem it's a major major problem which we will try to see to it okay so the next topic uh, that I'm going to cover is something called as vanishing gradient problem. Okay. So let me see which uh, this is basically third. Okay. Third coming to the vanishing gradient problem. Okay. So number three is basically called as vanishing gradient problem. Okay. Now what happens in the vanishing gradient problem? Okay. Now one very, very important thing that you really need to understand. Okay. What exactly is vanishing gradient? A super important interview question. Okay. Super, super important interview question. Now let's say I have a very deep neural network like this. Very deep neural network, which looks like this. Okay. So this is a very deep neural network. Okay. Suppose I say this is my x1, my this is my weights w1, this is my weights w2, w3, w4, and finally I get my output, which is my y hat. And the loss function. Now I'm first time writing a loss function formula. 
which is basically called as mean squared error. So mean squared error formula is 1 by 2 y minus y hat whole square. Okay, we'll discuss about this. What exactly is mean squared error and all. I hope everybody knows which activation function initially we are discussing about. We are discussing about sigmoid activation function. Sigmoid activation function. Now, there are some properties of sigmoid activation function. Sigmoid activation functions gives you value with respect to 0 or 1. Okay, it gives you value with 0 and 1. What is this loss function? This loss function is MSC, mean squared error. We'll discuss about this. Okay, just in some time, we'll discuss in completely depth, we'll understand every maths. I'll not leave out any, even a single maths in this, okay? Now, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's consider this neural network. So, I have this specific neural network. Now, in this neural network, we need to understand two important things, okay? Which, uh, which is super important for any interview, okay? So, over here, as you know, we will be basically adding bias 1 here bias 2, here bias 3, right, here bias 4, here bias 5. So, bias will be getting added in every hidden layer, which I have already discussed about, right. Let's say that uh, the output, the output for this layer is nothing but O21, for this it is O31, for O41, and this is basically my O51. Let's say I have this many outputs, right. Now, tell me in order to update W1, how will I write the formula or uh, my weight updation formula? That also we have discussed. Again, I'm revising it clearly to you. W1 new is equal to W1 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 new. Okay. This is the formula. I hope everybody knows this. I have written it 10 times now. Okay. Now, let's go to the next step. If I write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of derivative of W1 new then how will i write the chain rule the chain rule will be very simple so i will write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of o51 okay multiplied by o51 is now dependent on o41 so i will write derivative of loss derivative of loss with respect to derivative of o41 then i will go ahead sorry this will be derivative of o51 derivative of o51 divided by derivative of o41 okay so here will be o41 multiplied by derivative of o41 divided by derivative of o31 and then derivative of o31 divided by derivative of o21 okay multiplied by derivative of o21 divided by derivative of w1 so i hope everybody is getting clear with this so this will be my chain rule to in order to update w1 okay very much clear now what will be my next step in this what what i have to actually do now see one thing very important thing the kind of activation function we use in each and every layer we use an activation function which is called as sigmoid activation function and i hope everybody knows how what a sigmoid activation function formula is it is nothing but one plus e to the power of minus x okay so this is the sigmoid activation formula and we know our output is either zero or one okay 0 or 1, where I specifically say if it is greater than 0.5, then it is going to be 1. If it is less than 0.5, it is going to be 0. Now, let's, let's draw this, okay? Now, so my sigmoid activation function curve looks something like this, okay? It looks something like this, okay? My value will be between 0 to 1. Let's say this is my, uh, this is my, uh, if I probably say y is equal to w transpose x plus b, this is my y, okay? This is 0.5, okay? And with respect to this, this is my uh, z value, okay? Z I can consider as my, up after applying an activation function like this, okay? So, it will be z is equal to, okay? This is my z. Now, over here, you know that this will be all your negative values. This will be your positive values, right? This is fine, okay? I hope we know about this. One important property of this sigmoid activation function, whenever we try to find out, whenever we try to find out the derivative of sigmoid, it will be ranging between 0 to 0.25. So, my derivative curve will be looking like this. Okay. It will be looking like this. 
my derivative curve will be looking like this and it will always be ranging between 0 to 0.25 remember this yellow line is nothing but derivative whenever i find out the derivative of this equation it will always be ranging between 0 to 0.25 so if i write 0 is less than or equal to sigmoid of sigmoid of y okay is always being ranging between 0 to 0.25 this is basically my derivative condition okay so i am going to basically write it as derivative condition okay now because of this because of this okay because of this what will happen just understand over here if i talk about these derivatives since i'm taking o41 o31 o21 o51 can you tell me that in each and every value sigmoid is getting used because if i probably take let's say if i if i if i probably take uh, what is o51 o51 is nothing but we apply an activation function on top of o41 multiplied by w4 and add a bias so on top of it we apply an activation function right so everywhere we are using the sigmoid activation function right now since we are using the sigmoid activation function everywhere in the back propagation when i'm finding the derivative tell me the value will always be ranging between 0 to 0 0.25 right it will always be ranging between 0 to 0 0.25 yes so in the backward propagation when i'm finding the derivative with respect to o51 with respect to anything or o41 everywhere sigmoid activation function is getting used and because of the sigmoid activation function we have understood that the derivative of sigmoid activation function always ranges between 0 to 0 0.25 now what will happen now see in this particular case let's say for this my derivative i got it as 0 0.25 let's take as an example okay let's take as an example because anyhow my values will be ranging between 0 to 0 0.25 and it will be like that that i keep on updating this values and this value will keep on decreasing somewhere okay it will keep on decreasing like let's say point uh, point one zero then 0.05 then 0 0.02 then like this it will keep on decreasing because as we are going to this chain rule right as we are going to calculate the derivative always we are trying to get this particular value and it is always going to get reduced right until we go to the end of the chain now one very important thing what will happen because of this since we are multiplying with smaller values don't you think we will be getting a very small value okay we will be getting a very small value the answer is yes we will definitely be getting a very small value now what happens if we get a very small value over here what happens if we get a very small value i will go and update my weight formula no so now it will be w new is equal to w old minus learning rate which is again a small number which is again a small number multiplied by a small number now when i multiply this small number then what will happen what will happen with this small number this at one point of time let's say at one point of time suppose if i say this w new will be approximately equal to w old it will hardly change and if it is hardly changing then what is basically happening w weights are not getting updated and this situation where weights are not getting updated or it is just getting updated by a smaller value this problem is basically called as a vanishing gradient problem this is called as a vanishing gradient problem now how to solve this vanishing gradient problem it is approximately equal right my w new and w old are approximately equal and that is the reason over here no change in the weights are happening no change in weights and this specifically thing is called as vanishing gradient problem and how to basically solve this use another activation function use another activation function that is the reason why we came up with another activation function there are so many different kind of activation function now let me note down all the activation functions that we are going to learn after this the first activation function i hope everybody knows about it is nothing but sigmoid but the second activation function that we are going to know learn is tan h okay which we'll discuss about third activation function which we are going to discuss about is relu then fourth activation function we'll discuss about is pre relu like leaky relu sorry not pre relu it is leaky relu leaky relu and similarly we will be discussing about pre relu pre relu and different different activation functions okay 
So let's go ahead and let's try to see about the activation function and what is the best activation function we can actually use that we are going to see. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen with you again, a proper screen. Okay. So this is my sigmoid activation function. Okay. So let me open another pen for you so that I can write on top of it. Okay. But can I get a quick confirmation? You are able to understand everything. Yes, you are able to understand everything or not very much clearly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, if you are able to understand as usual, as I always say, please hit like and uh, that will actually boost my energy. Okay. And it will help me to teach you much more better. Okay. Okay. Now, let's go ahead for discussing the first activation function, which is called as sigmoid. I've told you in the left hand side that you basically see, this is the functionality. This is the functionality of the activation function on the left hand side. This is basically the derivative. Okay. This is basically the derivative whenever we are doing the back propagation. So in the activation function, sigmoid activation function, we have seen it will be ranging between zero to one. And this is the formula which we have already seen. If I want to find out the derivative of sigmoid activation function, it will be ranging between 0 to 0.25 because of which vanishing gradient problem exists. Vanishing gradient problem exists. This we have clearly understood. Okay. And this is a major issue over here. So there you can basically check out. Okay. Now let's understand some of the important properties of sigmoid activation function. Okay, what all things are there and based on that, what all disadvantage are there, we'll try to understand. Okay, so now first thing, advantages of sigmoid activation function. Smooth gradient prevents jump in output value. So you know that here in the sigmoid activation function, we have the smooth gradient, right? So because of this, the convergence will be quickly done and it will help us to work in a better way. Okay, but always remember this point. The input, the function output is not centered on zero, which will reduce the efficiency of the weight update. Now, what is this centered, not zero? Now, see guys, suppose if I have a curve, if I have a curve, let's say, uh, if I have a curve, which looks like this, when I say it is centered to zero, suppose if there is a curve that passes, which, which passes like this, which passes through the mean that is zero, which passes through the origin. Okay. And over here, you can see that there will be negative values. There will be positive values also, right? During this particular scenario, we say this curve as zero centered curve, zero centered curve. Okay. So whenever we have a zero centered curve, the weight updation becomes very much easy. Okay. It, it, it efficiently updates the weight. Okay. So, in this particular case, it is not passing through zero. So definitely this is not zero centered. Okay. That is the exact meaning of zero center. Perfect. So if you have understood till here, I hope uh, we'll go to the next step and we'll try to understand the disadvantage also into this. And I will be giving you this material so that you can read it through it. Okay. Now, when the input slightly is slightly away from the coordinate origin, the gradient of the uh, function becomes very small. That is almost zero. Okay, this is what I talked spoken about right in the back propagation, right? Back propagation. So here you can see in the process of neural network back propagation, we all use chain rule of differential to calculate the differential of each weight. When the back propagation passes through the sigmoid function, the dif differential on the chain is very small. And because of that vanishing gradient problem exists. Okay. Now, the function output is not zero centered on zero, which will reduce the efficiency of weight update. This also I have actually told you. The sigmoid function performs exponentially operation, which is slower for computers. Now, what is this exponential operation? This is the operation that is there. The formula for sigmoid is nothing but one plus one, uh, one divided by one plus e to the power of minus x. This is exactly an exponential function. And whenever we need to perform this operation, it takes time the time complexity increases since there is an exponential function. Okay. So this is a major issue. Some of the issues with uh, respect to sigmoid activation function. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. 
Sigmoid. What are the advantages of sigmoid? Smoother gradient prevents jumping. Output values between zero and one. So normalizing the output of each neuron. Clear prediction very close to one or zero. This all are things are there. But here you see major three uh, disadvantage. It is prone to gradient descent. Uh, sorry, gradient vanishing. Function output is not zero centered. Power operation are relatively time consuming. Now, in order to promo, uh, prevent this, the researchers will not keep quiet because obviously. Uh, if there is a vanishing gradient problem, we cannot create a deep neural network, right? We cannot do this. We cannot create a deep neural network. It is very, very difficult. So what do we do in this particular case? So here I will go down now. Now the second activation function that we usually use is something called as TANH. Okay, TANH, uh, it is also called as hyperbolic tangent function. Now, in hyperbolic tangent function, the formula looks something like this. e to the power of x minus e to the power of minus x divided by e to the power of x plus e to the power of minus x. Now, here you can see that my value, two main important, my value ranges between minus 1 to plus 1 in tanh function. Whenever I apply a tanh activation function, my value will be ranging between minus 1 to plus 1. And in the case of derivative, it will be ranging between 0 to 1. Right? In the derivative side, yes, any time we find out the derivative, it will be ranging between 0 to 1, right? In the previous case, when we were using sigmoid, there it was ranging between 0 to 0.25, right? Which is pretty much better now because my value is basically ranging between 0 to 1. But does this prevent vanishing gradient problem? Still, there will be an issue, right, guys? If we go on constructing a deep neural network, deep, deep neural network at one point of time, there may be chances that vanishing gradient problems still exist, right? So because of that, we should also not use tanh function. But this was the second activation function that researcher came up with because the first activation function still had that issue. And this had issues of vanishing gradient, but after uh, when we are actually constructing a very deep neural network, okay? So I hope everybody has understood this specific thing, okay? And please remember the formula, the derivative, whenever you try to find out the derivative of this curve, you'll always be getting the value between zero to one, okay? This is zero centric. See, that zero centric problem is also solved over here. This is also ha having zero centric, which is better than sigmoid. It is written over here, okay? So tanh is a hyperbolic tangent function. The curves of tanh function and sigmoid function are very relatively sm smaller. Let's compare them. First of all, when the input is large, the output is also smooth. The gradient is small, which is conducive to weight update. The difference is the output interval. Uh, the whole zero centric, which is better than sigmoid. Uh, in binary classification problem, we basically use tan tanh functions for the hidden layer and sigmoid for the output layer. Okay. So I hope everybody is able to understand. But still, I said that there will be chances of vanishing gradient problem. So now what to do? What do we do? We cannot keep quiet. There will be another researcher who will be doing his PhD. So he has to come up with new equations and he has to come up with new research. And probably the next activation function is an amazing activation function. And right now it is the most popular activation function which is being used by any, everyone without any knowledge. If that person does not have any knowledge also, then also he'll be using that activation function. And that activation function is nothing but ReLU. Okay. ReLU activation function or uh, ReLU activation function for uh, full form is rectified linear unit, which you can see over here. Rectified uni linear unit. Over here, the formula is nothing but max 0, comma x. Either it will be 0 or whatever value the x is. If the x value is negative, then it will be 0. Okay. Whenever the x value is negative, whenever we apply this ReLU activation function on top of it, it becomes 0. Whenever it is positive, it will come to that same positive value. Suppose if the x value is 1, then I'm going to get 1. If the x value is 2, I'm going to get 2. If the x value is 3, I'm going to get 3. Right? So this is pretty much amazing. And whenever I try to find out the derivative of ReLU, the value is either 0 or 1. Okay? 0 or 1. Now, this is again a major concern, guys. Because let's say if one of the weights during the derivative, right, when we are updating the weights, if it becomes zero, this neuron, the neurons that I have, right, suppose let's say this is my hidden layer one neuron, this will become dead, dead during the back propagation, right? In the forward propagation also, in the forward propagation, it's fine. It will not do anything. But in the back propagation also, when I'm trying to find out a derivative, the value is either zero or one. Right? The value is either 0 or 1. If it becomes 0 in the back propagation, that entire derivative chain rule, right? This will become 0. 
right? When this is becoming zero, W nu will be approximately equal to W old, right? This will be approximately equal to zero. That basically means that neuron will be completely dead. This is one disadvantage of ReLU activation function. Other than that, this is solving or this is doing an exceptional, exceptional performance because over here, just imagine over here, you don't have any exponential operation also. Here, you just have this simple operation, which is pretty much quicker than the previous one. Okay. So here you don't have any, it is obviously better than sigmoid. It is obviously solving the vanishing gradient problem. It is obviously solving the other problems that it had. Uh, it is also solving the tanh function problem. It is not zero centric. It is not zero centric over here. Just see, it is just passing through zero, but we are not getting any negative values. It is not zero centric. This is only the one disadvantage that it has. Other than that, everything that it has, it has better than sigmoid and uh, tanh activation function. Okay, so I hope you are able to understand this part also where we have specifically discussed about ReLU activation function. Now let's read about it. A ReLU function is actually a function that takes the maximum value. Note that this is not fully interval derivable. We have, we can take sub gradient. Uh, it is an activation function that is currently more popular. When the input is positive, there is no gradient saturation problem. The calculation speed is much more faster. The ReLU function has a linear relationship, whether it is forward or backward, it is much faster than sigma and tan h. Okay. There are some disadvantage when the input is negative, ReLU is completely inactive, which means once a negative number is entered, ReLU will die. Okay. ReLU will die. Okay. So, and it is also not zero centric. So you can, I will be giving you this entire materials in the description, uh, probably after the session, you can check it out. Okay. Now, in order to solve this dead ReLU or dead neuron, Okay, we have another activation function, which we call it as leaky ReLU function. And only one thing is basically getting changed where they are not saying that it will be zero, but it will be 0 0.01 multiplied by that X value. So now my value will be little bit coming like this in leaky ReLU. See, in leaky ReLU, it will be something coming like this and it will be going like this. Now in this particular case, I will be having some negative values. It will never be zero. In this particular case also, whenever I'm trying to find out a derivative, it will never be zero and it will be a small number over here. You can see over here and over here, right? So this is important, right? This is specifically important. So leaky ReLU function solves the dead neuron problem. Dead neuron problem that was basically happening in ReLU. Okay. I hope everybody is able to understand very much simply. Okay. So remember this formula and then we will be able to understand this. Perfect. So, and then I'll also tell you which, which activation function you should use blindly for what kind of scenario you have to use blindly. Everything I'll talk about it. Uh, once I complete all this activation function. So in order to solve the dead ReLU problem, people propose to set the first half of the ReLU as 0.01x instead of zero. Another intuitive idea is a parameter based method where we can also supply parameters, not only 0.01, but some other parameters also. Okay. So here it is. Um, in theory, leaky ReLU has the advantages of ReLU plus there will be no problem with dead ReLU, but actual operation, it is not fully proved. They are also saying that it is not fully proved, but yes, people use that specific option also. Okay. Now let's go to the next step, which is called as exponential linear units. Okay. Now in exponential linear units, we have a different formula. Whenever the X value is greater than zero, we have X. Otherwise we apply this particular operation over there. So we will be getting this kind of curve, but always remember in the derivative also, you can see we are also able to get this exponential curve. And again, the value will be ranging between zero to one. Again, no dead ReLU issue. This means uh, the output is close to zero, zero centered. One small problem that it is slightly more uh, computationally expensive because we are using exponential value. Okay. Only this many things are there. They are small, minute, minute changes, which people do use. Softmax will discuss this in activation function, but uh, let's see one more. There is also something called as pre-ReLU. Pre-ReLU, just by seeing the diagram, you'll be able to understand what we are, they are trying to do. Okay, so instead of directly having this, we will be having in this way. Okay, which solves the problem. Okay, so here W of I, W of I is greater than zero. If it is less than or is equal to zero, we are we multiply a constant. 
okay so if a of i is zero it becomes relu if a of i is greater than zero it becomes leaky relu if a of i is a learnable parameter it becomes pre relu so in learnable parameters this will keep on changing okay this will keep on changing that is the only difference and then there is also another activation function which is called as switch a self gated function i think uh, this is uh, brought by google itself uh, another activation function over here switch switch and relu uh, in this particular case we have this kind of curve one problem is that we cannot find out the derivative of zero okay but you can use any kind of activation function but in short if i go with respect to using any activation function let's see how do we go ahead with okay so what is the funda or what is the technique to understand which activation function we should use technique which activation function we should use which activation function we should use okay which activation function we should use now the technique should be very simple okay you know that you cannot use sigmoid activation function okay if you use sigmoid activation function what will happen vanishing gradient problem will happen right it is very much clear vanishing gradient problem will be there you cannot use tan h there also vanishing gradient problem so suppose you have binary classification suppose you have binary classification now in binary classification the funda will be that suppose this is your neural network okay let's say this is your neural network and this is your output let's say this is your entire neural network okay now in this particular case always remember in the hidden layer try to use relu activation function in the hidden layer always use relu activation function it is the most efficient activation function okay relu activation function in the output layer if this is a binary classification problem use sigmoid activation function sigmoid activation function okay this should be the funda let's say with the help of relu okay with the help of relu the convergence is not happening that activation function the convergence is not happening then what will happen you can change this relu to something called as pre relu or elu right you can change this but always remember whenever you are doing a binary classification problem your output should have the sigmoid activation function only okay sigmoid activation function now let's talk about multi class classification problem in multi class classification problem suppose this is my neurons and this is my hidden layer and this is my let's say two output are there now in the case of multi class classification problem okay in the case of multi class classification problem use another activation function which is called as softmax i'll discuss about softmax just in a while when we are discussing about loss function so softmax activation function can be used over here in the output layer over here again you can use the combination of relu or pre relu or other kind of relu if the convergence is not happening but by default always make sure that go with relu okay relu solves most of the problem right so that is the reason in each and every hidden layer in each and every neuron use relu activation function in hidden layers in output layer for multi class use softmax activation function or sigmoid activation function now in the case of regression problem statement in the case of regression problem statement what can you use in the case of regression problem statement in regression problem statement again the funda will be same okay suppose this is the hidden layer and this is the output layer regression basically means you will be having a continuous value i hope everybody knows machine learning right a basic of machine learning now in regression case always remember here in the hidden layer use relu or any variation of relu but in the output layer use an activation function which is called as linear activation function okay linear activation function so there is another kind of activation function which is called as linear activation function and over here there will be also a separate loss function which i will be discussing about in just after we complete this activation function 
okay now the next topic that i am actually going to discuss about is something called as activation function so not sorry not activation function it is basically loss function now we are going to deep dive into loss functions okay so everybody is able to understand uh, see i am not seeing anywhere everything is in my mind i am able to teach you directly by writing things till now we have seen neural networks right where did loss actually come in this stage right i told you that we should always try to reduce this loss right loss came over here everything after the forward propagation loss will be coming and we need to reduce the loss but there are different types of loss function also that we really need to discuss okay let's say i have a data set or let let's let's talk about this deep learning and deep learning specifically with respect to artificial neural network if i probably say a and n right we solve two different kind of problems the first problem is something called as regression and the second problem that we basically solve is something called as classification okay now whenever we are trying to solve this two basically regression or classification we basically learn uh, this all things over here okay now in regression always understand the data set how it look like let's say uh, i have a data set over here the data set has values like uh, years of experience okay degree okay and the output feature is salary now here if i say the person is 10 years experience and he is having phd the salary will be quite high right so here you will be having a continuous value right so this continuous value is basically my output feature and this is basically a kind of regression problem this is basically a kind of regression problem okay very very simple very very clear okay in the case of bio classification how my data set will look like if i probably see an example with respect to data set let's say uh, it will be like uh, playing hours study hours and whether the person is able to pass or fail okay now this becomes a classification problem it can be a binary classification okay let's say if it is a multi classification suppose the person plays for 10 hours he studies for 2 hours then obviously the chance is that the person may fail right if the person studies for plays for 4 hours and he studies for 3 hour then also i think the person may fail right let's say the person is studying playing for 5 hours and he's studying for 5 hours then maybe maybe he may pass and i may have another data set like if the person is playing for 2 hours and if he's studying for 7 hours he may pass so here what is happening here you have a multi class classification problem now with respect to this kind of problems you will have different different loss function okay loss function so the first loss function that i am going to discuss about is with respect to regression and the second i will go ahead with discussing classification now in regression we discuss basically three different types one is mean squared error i'm going to write it down mean squared error and this all will work for a continuous output feature okay second is mean absolute error mean absolute error okay mean absolute error the third one that we are basically going to discuss about is something called as huber loss okay huber loss so we are going to basically discuss this three main first for regression and then we will continue for classification so let's go ahead and let's try to understand what exactly is mean squared error and before that i want to discuss about two different thing one is loss function and cost function now i'm introducing a new term which is called as cost function okay let's say guys this is my input right this is my hidden layer and this is my output now usually in forward propagation let's say in my data set i have 100 records let's say in my data set i have 100 records okay in my data set i have 100 records 100 records right 
Now, in the, during the forward propagation, what happens? During the forward propagation, what happens? I pass one record. I calculate the y hat and then I calculate the loss. And the formula is very simple. Y minus y hat whole square. Okay. And then I basically do the backward propagation. This happens usually for every record. We are calculating the loss. But this is not an efficient scenario. Suppose if I have 100 records, I can set up a pass size. I can basically say at every forward propagation, pass 10 records. And when you are passing the 10 records, then you calculate the loss for the 10 records. Okay. Whenever I pass catch at once, then the formula will be changing. Instead of loss, I will try to write this as cost function. And this cost function will be i is equal to 1 to n, which is my bash size. And this formula will be y minus y hat whole square. And here I will be having 1 by 2. Okay. So I hope everybody is able to understand what is the difference between loss and cost function. In loss function, I specifically provide one data point. In cost function, I specifically provide batch of data points. Okay. So this is the basic difference. Okay. In the forward and the backward propagation. In every propagation, in every epoch, we also say it as epochs. We pass a batch of records, not just a single record. Okay. So till here, I hope everybody is clear. But now let's go ahead and let's, let's try to understand what is this mean squared error. So first one that we are going to understand is something called as mean squared error loss function. And this is for regression. Okay. We basically also write it as MSC. Now mean squared error, already I have written the formula. If you go ahead with loss function, the formula is nothing but 1 by 2 y minus y hat whole square. If I probably go with respect to cost function, the formula is summation of i is equal to 1 to n, 1 by 2 y minus or let me write it like this, little bit like this. So it will be easy. It will be 1 by 2 summation of i is equal to 1 to n y minus y hat whole square. Okay. So this, this I hope everybody is able to uh, understand over here. Okay. Very easily you are able to understand. The loss function will be written like this. The cost function will be written like this. Okay. But we need to understand what exactly is this mean squared error. This formula that you are able to see. Okay, this formula is basically called as quadratic equation. Quadratic equation. Now, what is so special about this quadratic equation? Okay. So, I hope everybody knows this formula A minus B whole square. So, you say A square minus 2AB plus B square. This is also quadratic equation. If you probably want to see a generic definition of quadratic equation, it is nothing but AX square plus BX plus C. Okay. And whenever you construct this quadratic equation, whenever you construct this quadratic equation, you will be able to see that we get a kind of curve, this kind of curve. Okay. Because this is the loss function. And if you remember, this quadratic equation gives us something like this kind of gradient descent. Okay. If you probably go and write plotting a quadratic equation. Okay quadratic equation at that point of time you will be getting this kind of curve okay now what is this curve here you will be able to see this is my one single point okay this curve this quadratic equation has lot of disadvantages lot of advantages okay so let me note down some of the advantages so first i will go ahead and note down the advantages of this quadratic equation or this uh, curve okay so i will just go and note down all the advantages the first advantage, let's discuss about it. The first advantage, okay? The first advantage over here, whenever we have this kind of curve, that basically means it can be differentiable. So it is definitely differentiable. That we have already seen, right? That is how weight updation formula basically happens. This curve is basically getting created by this quadratic equation only, right? So it is obviously differentiable. The second thing that you can basically write, it has only one global or local minima. It has only one local or global minima. It has only one, not more than one. Okay. It has obviously just one local or global minima. The third point you can basically write it converges faster. 
it converges faster. So these are some of the amazing advantages of using this. But as we say, everything that comes up, it has pros, it has cons. So let's talk about the disadvantages. Disadvantages, the first disadvantage that is there and only disadvantage, it is not robust to outliers. Big issue. Big, big, big issue. And just by seeing the formula, you can actually understand. Let's say I'm solving a linear regression problem. Let's say I have a data points which looks like this. Okay. Let's say I have an outliers. Let's say I have this outliers. If I remove this outliers, obviously, you know that my linear regression line that will be getting created, it will get created like this. Okay. It will definitely get created like this. Right. It will definitely get created like this over here. But now, if I have some outliers, what will happen? Just see this. I'll remove this line. I'll remove this line. Let's say I'm having some outliers over here. Then my line, that new line that will get created will look like this. Now, why this line changing is happening so much? Why this line changes so much? The reason it changes so much, it is because I am penalizing the error. This is my error, right? And that error, I'm squaring it. The reason it shifts so much because we are penalizing the error. Okay. We are penalizing the error. If there are no outliers, that is fine. But if our errors are too much, then we are penalizing them since we are squaring the error over here. And because of that, the best fit line, which you basically have, will have a major, major shift. Okay. We'll have a major shift in short, right? So this is the only disadvantage with respect to the mean squared error that it is not robust to outliers. Okay. Now coming to the second one, obviously, if it is not robust to outliers, again, researchers will not keep quiet. They'll come up with something. So coming to the second one, which is called as mean absolute error. Mean absolute error. Now, what exactly is mean absolute error? I'll just write it down as formula. Okay. So over here, my loss function formula will be 1 by 2 absolute of y minus y hat. Our cost function will basically be 1 by 2 summation of i is equal to 1 to n y minus y hat. Right. This is how it will be. Now, we are not squaring it. So definitely the major advantage will be that it is, it is, what is the major advantage? It is robust to outliers because now we are not penalizing, we are squaring it. Sorry, we are not squaring it. So we are not penalizing for that specific error. We are taking the absolute value, right? So this is the major advantage with respect to the mean uh, absolute error. So that basically means even though I have a kind of outlier, let's say like this, Suppose these are my points and suppose if I have some outliers, there will be a shift, but not a major shift. The shift may be this much. Initially, the line may be simple. Then what you'll be, there'll be a, there'll be a minor shift. Okay. And how does this mean absolute error curve look like? This curve will be looking something like this. Like how we had for quadratic equation, the curve for mean absolute error will be like this. And for this, the derivative will not be simple. We have to basically take subgradient. Subgradient basically means we need to divide this line, separate part by part and basically calculate the slope. That is what it is, you know, because here we don't have any kind of curve. We have to take part by part because this keeps on changing. It, it can change from one part to the other part, right? So here we have to basically take the subgradient to basically calculate or update the weights. Not a major task, but it does take a little bit time. It is time consuming. Time constraint is there. So timing, timing wise, obviously it is more than the previous one. That is mean squared error. Okay. Now coming to the third one, the third one for the linear regression is something called as Huber loss. Huber loss in short is the combination of mean squared error. And it is the combination of mean absolute error. Okay. 
mean squared error and mean absolute error. Now here, the loss will look something like this. The loss or the cost function will look something like this. So here you can write 1 by 2 y minus y hat whole square. And this is specifically, this will be specifically when it will be used, when the outliers are not there. Right? So if I write a condition, if y minus, if y minus y hat is less than or equal to some hyperparameter, which is basically given by this delta sign. So this will be some hyperparameter. Okay, so I will basically write this as an hyperparameter. If the difference is less than this value, if the error difference is less than this value, then probably I will go with this because this will denote whether there is an outlier or not present in this. And if in the second case, it will be something like we will be taking care of y minus y hat minus half by delta square otherwise. So if there are outliers, we will specifically use this same hyperparameter and we'll use this equation to solve that. So two condition, one is basically when the, when the outliers are not present, when the outliers are not present, are not present. And if the outliers are present, we can definitely use this one. And this is specifically a hyperparameter, which can be found out when we are doing the coding. Okay. So this is specifically to Huber loss. So till here, everybody is clear because we have discussed mean squared error, mean absolute error and Huber loss for the regression. Now we will go ahead and discuss about the classification one. So the next topic is with respect to classification loss function. What are the different different classification loss function? We will try to discuss. Now in classification, we specifically use something called as cross entropy. Cross entropy. This cross entropy usually loss function is for two types. One is for binary classification. And the second one is for, I'll write like this. There are two types of this. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. For cost function, you can basically write summation of i is equal to 1 to n. Okay. I think that you can basically do. Okay. It's, it's very simple. Okay. Now in classification, uh, I basically have a binary cross entropy and I have categorical cross entropy. Okay. Now in binary cross entropy, we basically do it for binary classification. For the multi-class classification problem, we use categorical cross entropy. Okay. So this is what we basically use for all these things. And, uh, uh, you know, we will go ahead with the formula and uh, we'll try to see. Binary cross entropy, I hope everybody has learned about logistic regression. Just comment down whether you have learned logistic regression or not. The logistic regression, whatever loss function is used, right? That log loss. Similarly, that is used for the binary cross entropy. So let me just write it down. So for first, binary cross entropy. Okay. We, we actually use a loss function, which will be, which will be a log loss function, which is given by minus y log of y hat minus one minus y multiplied by log of 1 minus y hat. Okay. This is the loss that is used in logistic regression also. Because logistic regression is a binary classification problem. Okay. If I, and this is basically called as log loss. Okay. Log loss. I can also write this in a different format. So my loss function will look something like this now. Minus log 1 minus y hat. If y is equal to 0 minus log y hat if y is equal to 1. Okay. That basically means whenever this y is 0, whenever this y is 0, right? Whenever this y is 0, then what will happen? We just, uh, you can see 0 multiplied by this will be 0. 1 minus 0 is nothing but so we have this minus log 1 minus y hat. Okay. And then I have log 
of y hat if y is equal to 1. y is equal to 1 basically means this entire thing will become 0. So I'll be having minus log of y hat. But the question rises. This is basically for the loss. How do we calculate y hat? The y hat calculation is very simple, right? We basically use the sigmoid activation function, right? Sigmoid activation function in the last layer. This is how we basically come up with y hat. For y, we definitely, then we apply this log loss on top of it and then we do the back propagation. Everybody is clear with that, okay? And this is specifically for binary classification. Binary classification. And that is the power of binary cross entropy, okay? Now, the next thing that we are going to discuss about is coming to the next one. Uh, let's discuss about this categorical cross entropy. Okay, so the second one is categorical cross entropy. A categorical cross entropy is nothing but it is a multi class classification problem. Okay, multi class classification problem. Now, in the case of categorical cross entropy, what will happen? Let's say I have some features. Let's say I have a data set like F1, F2, F3, and I have output something. Okay. Let's say some values are there 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Some value in the data set. And my output is good, bad, non, neutral. Let's say. Okay. I have this specific output. Now, the first thing in categorical cross entropy, what we do, whatever output, since this is a multi class classification problem, right? Multi class classification problem. First of all, what we do is that we convert this into a one hot encoded format. One hot encoded format basically means what happens for this output. Now I will be having columns like good, bad, neutral. This is the first step that we do. Wherever the good value is, that becomes one and remaining all becomes zero. Wherever bad is there, that will become one and remaining all will be zero. Wherever neutral is there, that will become one and remaining all will be zero. Okay. So this is the first step. Okay. And for this, what is the loss function for categorical cross entropy? Okay, for multi-class classification. We can write loss is equal to x of i comma y of i. Okay. And here, I'll, I'll make you understand the formula. Let me write down the formula. Summation of j is equal to 1 to j is equal to 1 to c. c basically means number of categories. Okay. y of ij multiplied by log to the base e y of ij hat okay and this is just the formula okay for the loss function now let me make you understand what this exactly loss function is basically saying okay and what all things are uh, basically coming out of this information from this everything right we'll, we'll try to understand so let's consider let's consider whenever i write in this way see whenever i write y of i let's say i'm writing y of i y of i for the first row, for the first row, first row, this row, let's say this is my first row, right? How do I denote it? How do I denote it? I may write, okay, y of i1, y of i1 is nothing but this first one. For the first row, this is y of i1, y of i2, y of i3. i is nothing but row, i is equal to row. j is nothing but column, okay? I will just talk about it okay i is equal to row and j is equal to top so if i write y of i1 comma y of i2 comma y of i3 last will be going to y of ic okay ic basically means number of categories okay now if i write with respect to y of ij then two things will be coming see one if the element if the element is in class what does this basically mean over here, if good is present, then this will become 1. Remaining all will become 0. Okay. If, if bad is present over here, this will only become 1. Remaining all will be 0. So here we are basically writing 1 if the element is in class, 0 otherwise. This is how we calculate this y hat, y of ij. This y of ij, we basically find out in this way. So here is what I am getting my y of ij. But how do I get my y of i ha, ij hat? Now we have calculated this, right? We got this y of i j. We are able to find it out. But what about y of i j? Now y of i j is basically got through another activation function, which is called as softmax activation function. 
This softmax activation function, I told you, it is applied in the output layer for multiple classification problem. Right? Everybody remembers that. And what is the formula of this? What is the formula of this? The formula is very simple. It is nothing but, we basically say, softmax of any z value is nothing but e of z of i, summation of j is equal to 1 to k, e of zj. I will, I will explain this thing also. I will explain this thing also. Let's say I have a neural network. I have a neural network which has two hidden layers. Sorry, two output layer. This is my output one. This is my output two. Let's say before I have three hidden neuron. Okay. In this layer, I had three hidden neuron. So this will all get connected. Right. This will all get connected. Yes. Now, over here, you know, weights will get assigned, right? Here, weights will get assigned. Let's say the values that I'm actually getting after multiplying through the weights are something like this. Let's say I'm getting over here 10, 20, 30, something like this, or 40, right? Let's say I'm getting like this, and this is 50. Now, in order to find out the output over here, what I will do is that I will apply this softmax activation function. Now, this will be what? Suppose I want to calculate for this, for this particular thing. So e of j of i, let's say e of j of i, if I want to calculate for this, let's say it will be uh, e of j of i, let's say for this first thing. For this, how much, what will be my probability? So I'll write e of e to the power of 10 divided by e to the power of 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus 40 plus 50, right? And whenever I try to find out this, this I will be getting in the form of probability like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. But always remember, both this probability summation will be equal to 1. Whichever will be the higher probability, that class output will be coming up. Right? And this activation function is called as softmax activation function. This is basically applied in every output layer. Every, every output layer. Okay? For a multi-class classification problem. Right? So, I hope everybody is able to understand. Okay? Now, I want... You all to understand this for multi-classification problem, how we are basically under applying softmax activation in the output layer. For binary classification problem, we are applying sigmoid activation function. This is the thinking you should basically be knowing because tomorrow if I am coding and showing you how things are basically there, okay, how things are basically working, you can basically understand, okay. If it is a binary classification problem, I'll basically be using a ReLU activation function. And then in the output layer, I'll be using a sigmoid activation function. Suppose it is a multi-class classification problem. In the middle layers, I'll be using ReLU. In the outside, in the output layer, I'll basically be using a softmax activation function. So again, let me repeat the conclusions out of all these sessions, of all this today's session, what all things we learned. Let's say, what, what all things we learned, okay? Just tell me the answer, okay? Suppose... I use ReLU in middle layer and a softmax in the output layer. This becomes a multi-class classification problem, right? Multi-class classification problem. I can also use pre-ReLU. I can also use this. If I use ReLU and sigmoid, then this becomes a binary classification problem, right? And loss function, what it will be used over here? Obviously, you know that sigmoid activation function will be used over there, right? ReLU in the hidden layer, right? In the hidden layer. Similarly, this is for binary classification. For, li for linear regression, what do we do? We apply a little bit change, right? In linear regression, we will definitely use ReLU. But in the output layer, we have now linear activation function. And what is the loss that I apply over here? It will be MSC or MAE, right? Or it may be Huber loss, right? Over here, what I apply? For multi-class, it will be categorical cross entropy, loss function. Right? And for this, it will be binary cross entropy, loss function. Today, we are ending this session now. What all things we learned? So many things we learned, right? We completed activation function. We completed everything, right? So what all things we learned? We finished forward propagation, chain rule of derivative, vanishing gradient form, loss function. And then we also understood activation functions, right? So all these things is basically completed, right? Uh, and these all are interview questions, guys. They will definitely ask you all this kind of interview question. So how would you like to rate out of 10? Uh, you can definitely rate me. And uh, if you like my session, definitely like it. 
So tomorrow we are going to discuss about optimizers and once we complete optimizers, we can see some examples of how to implement an ANN and probably we'll come try to complete it tomorrow itself. Okay. So thank you guys. Uh, have a great day. Keep on rocking. Keep on learning. So day three, deep learning session, we are going to discuss about this today. Okay, day three, deep learning, what all topics, agenda, what all things we are going to cover. Okay, the first thing is very much important, which is called as optimizers, right? Optimizers are very much important in the back propagation to understand how the weights are getting updated and the different different types of optimization. Uh, what all different types we will be learning today? So obviously we have covered gradient descent. Okay, we'll understand gradient descent. Then we have something called as SGD, which is called as stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent. Third thing that we are going to cover is something called as mini batch SGD stochastic gradient descent. Fourth topic that we are basically going to cover <coughs> SGD with momentum. Okay, so that part we are going to covering uh, in the third. Uh, after this, in this uh, we will basically be covering SGD with momentum. Then we have something called as Adagrad. So Adagrad, Adaptive Gradient. We're going to cover this. Okay. And the sixth one uh, that we are going to basically cover is something called as RMS Prop. And finally, we will try to see Adam Optimizer, which is currently the best optimizer, which is going on in the market. Many people use this, right? Along with this, uh, we are also going to cover what is what is batch, what is epochs, what is iterations. We are definitely going to cover all these things. Okay. So this is the agenda of this session. Let's see whether we'll be able to cover this. And then after this, we if we get time, we'll also be solving an ANN practical problem. And uh, if you don't get time, don't worry. Tomorrow we are going to cover the ANN and probably the CNN part. Okay. Till then, I will start this one. Uh, so first optimizer, obviously we have seen about something called as gradient descent. Okay. Now in gradient descent, we know what is the main weight updation formula in the back propagation weight updation formula and the back propagation that is nothing but weight old sorry weight new is equal to weight old minus learning rate of derivative for loss with respect to derivative of w old okay so this is the first uh, equation i hope everybody knows about this because since we are discussing it from yesterday so everybody should be well known with this specific thing and whenever we talk about gradient descent we know that what we specifically have we have in our x and y axis with respect to w we will basically try to see the loss or cost function and we know that what happens we get this kind of gradient descent right and this point that is basically this this is my global minima right and uh, we have also understood what is the importance of this specific learning rate this specific learning rate that also we have understood okay and uh, whenever we have any kind of points over here what happens is that either we can increase the weight or decrease the weight but our main aim is basically to come to the global minima now Let's go ahead and take one step ahead and try to understand different things. Okay. Now let's, let's say I have already told you the difference between loss and cost function, right? Now what part we are specifically discussing? Let's say I have my input feature. This is my hidden layer and this is my output layer. So if I'm connecting this all dots, 
okay if i'm connecting this all dots this becomes my hidden layer this becomes my input layer so this is my input layer this is my hidden layer one and this is my output layer you can have any number of layers that is not a problem so in forward propagation what we do we multiply it by the input weights and then we apply an activation function and finally over here i get y hat and then we go ahead and define our loss function one of the loss function is nothing but mean squared error so i can basically write one by 2n okay yesterday when i was discussing about the uh, in the previous session when i was discussing about the loss function at that point of time you know i used to write one by two okay but i missed that n part okay so please do make sure that you write n then i is equal to one to n y minus y hat whole square so if you talk about this this is basically called as mean squared error okay so this is nothing but it is a mean squared error okay this is the loss function that is basically getting applied okay then uh, in the backward propagation our main aim is that we should basically update all this weight so what one w1 whatever weights you are basically having over here w2 w3 w4 we need to update this weights and um, for updating this weights to minimize this loss function we use optimizers now one example of the optimizers that we specifically use uh, this is called as uh, this gradient descent optimizer now in gradient descent optimizers you know what we do is that we pass and first of all before that let's understand what is epoch okay so you need to get an idea about epoch now what exactly is epoch epoch okay I'll, i can call this as cost function okay this as cost function because since i'm passing n data points now what does this epoch mean epoch basically means whenever i do one forward propagation and one backward propagation this combines and says that okay we have basically passed one epoch okay one epoch so if i have let's say if i have million records million records in my data set okay if i specifically have million records in my data set now if in the forward propagation at a time i'm actually getting i'm giving million records at a time i'm giving million records after giving i'm getting y hat and i'm finding out the loss okay loss i'll not say loss but at least i'll say cost function let me remove this okay suppose if i'm trying to find out cost function now when i'm finding out cost function the formula some becomes something like this right now that basically means i to the one that is summation of i is equal to one to million okay so million this n will basically be million okay so in basically what we are doing in the forward propagation we are doing million different calculation of different inputs and weights because there are million data points and at a at a batch we are taking million data points and we are doing the forward propagation right and we are finding out the y hat and then we are trying to calculate the cost function okay so in the backward propagation then what will happen all the weights will get updated and this all weights will be getting updated based on this loss now understand what is the disadvantage with respect to gradient descent if when we are passing million records just imagine million records so the first disadvantage that i would like to talk about is basically is basically that if you are passing million records definitely you require a huge ram to load that records right so resource extensive task it is so the task is very resource extensive you require huge ram to accommodate million records in every epoch right so huge it is like huge ram size at least you will require again for parallel processing you also may be requiring gpus because million records processing is basically happening right it is obviously fast we will be able to reach to global minimum but just to run this we really need to have a big system right so this is the major major disadvantage try to understand why i'm saying major disadvantage right over here you can clearly understand that i cannot like if i am using million records at every epoch right how much resources i will be requiring right so this is the major disadvantage with respect to gradient descent okay so what do we do can we tweak this 
optimizer this is an optimizer this gradient descent is basically my optimizer can i use some other optimizer which can make sure that with little bit number of resources also i will be able to work nicely okay so for that the second part that we specifically discuss about is something called as stochastic gradient descent stochastic stochastic gradient descent now in stochastic gradient descent what we do let's say that okay fine we have million records we have million records in every epoch which is a combination of forward and backward propagation let's say in the epoch one i just pass one record that's it i pass one record i calculate the y hat and then, then i calculate the loss and then i update the weights right this step is basically updating the weights now if i have 1 million records and in every epoch in every epoch like let's say inside this epoch i'm passing only one record still there are so many there still there are millions of records that is left so when i pass one record in the forward propagation in the backward propagation i update the weight this will basically called as iteration 1 now we are dividing this inside the epoch based on the data points we are dividing it so this will now become iteration 1 now in the iteration 2 we will pass the second data point for doing the forward and the backward propagation so now here i will pass the second record and this will be my iteration 2 right so like this how many number of iteration i will have how many number of iteration just just a normal guess since there are million records okay since there are million records it will be going till I million iteration, right? Million iteration. Million iteration. If we just pass one one record. So, in every epoch, we have to pass through million iteration. If you are just providing one record at a time. And like this, we usually run for many number of epochs when we are training this deep learning model. Right? When we are training, at least we run with 100 epochs. I will be talking about this early stopping and all. But just let's say we are running it for 100, mil 100 epochs. So in every epoch, million iteration. Just imagine for 100 epochs, how many millions iteration will become. Simple, it is 100 million iterations. Right? In this, in this step, in stochastic gradient addition, you are making sure that, fine, I will not require that much RAM. No, I don't require that much RAM because I'm just passing one record at a time. But what is the major disadvantage? Major disadvantage is that the convergence that is basically happening will be very slow. The convergence will be very slow. Will be very, very slow. I hope everybody agrees with this. The convergence will be very, very slow. Because at every time I'm passing one record, then again back propagation, then again weights are have updating, you know. So the convergence will be very, very slow. This is the major disadvantage with stochastic gradient descent. Okay. So, now researcher will not keep quiet, okay, someone has come up with this, he has written PhD, he has given, he has got a PhD, now he has written a research paper, there is some problems in this, now how do we fix this? Then we go with the next optimizer, the third optimizer that we specifically have, that optimizer is basically called as batch size, let me take the full name over here, mini batch SGD mini batch stochastic gradient descent now what is this mini batch stochastic gradient descent let's let's understand it in a better way okay let's let's try to understand okay here one more problem the time complexity will also be very high the time complexity will also be also be high obviously it is solving the resource constraint but time complexity will still be high. okay now, what happens in mini batch SGD? Let's understand. Okay. Now, in mini batch SGD, in mini batch SGD, instead, now see, suppose if I have 1 million records, now instead of just giving one record at a time, what I will do, I will set up a batch size. Let's say my batch size is now 1000. Now, if my batch size is 1000, that basically means in every epoch that I do, forward and backward propagation, Let's say this is epoch one. I give thousand records. Obviously, because in every batch size, I give means in every epoch, I give 
or inside a epoch i give 1000 records let's say i'm giving 1000 records over here in the forward propagation and backward propagation okay then total number of this will be my iteration one right this will be my iteration one okay so how many number of iteration will i have to do just divide million by 1000 then this will get cut, this will get cut, this will get cut. So that basically means now in the second iteration, I'll give another thousand. So in iteration two, I'll give another thousand data points. So like this, now I will be able to reduce this number of iteration to just thousand. I will be able to basically just do till the number of iteration that is 1000 and with respect to all these things, my data points will get covered. Now this looks a better approach because why? Because here now it is not that much resource intensive. We have removed this resource intensive. The second point is that convergence will be better when compared to the will be better. And time complexity will also improve. time complexity will improve. I hope everybody agrees with this three point. And this is what we are able to do with the help of mini batches GD. Hmm. Okay. Now let me just show you through diagrammatically. Okay. How will my gradient descent look like? So suppose this is my gradient descent. Let's say this one. Okay. My aim is to basically come to this global minima. global minima okay my main aim is basically to come to this global minima with the with the help of let's say my first data point is over here okay with the help of gradient descent first we'll understand gradient descent with the help of gradient descent since we are passing millions record at one time the convergence will happen like this okay the convergence will happen this like this with gradient descent but there are problems what are the problems with gradient descent we have written over here right we have written over here the problem is that it will be resource extensive. We don't have a high RAM to upload all the millions of record at one time. If you have a huge machine, this will work. You know, the convergence will go down like this. That is fine. If we use stochastic gradient descent, if we use stochastic gradient descent, now here we are giving record by record, right? Just one data point. So how my record will go with respect to one data point? Let's say it will go like this. It will jump like this. It will jump like this. This is with respect to stochastic gradient descent. The green one is basically with respect to stochastic gradient descent. The yellow one is basically my gradient descent. The stochastic gradient descent, why it will have so much zigzag? Because it is only taking a single data point and it is updating the weights. So because of this, so because of this, what will happen? So many different, different, uh, iterations or so many different different ways the movement will happen and this will basically happen because of sgd now with mini batch sgd what will happen this this zigzag movement will be less it will move like this this zigzag movement will be less it will move like this and we will be able to reach the global minima but still this zigzag movement is there and this zigzag movement is basically called as noise this is called as noise which is having the highest noise obviously sgd is having the highest noise gradient descent is having the least noise and if i talk about mini batch sgd which is this white line mini batch sgd mini batch sgd this has very minimal noise but it has noise right the highest noise is basically with sgd if we have noise then it will definitely take time to basically come to the global minimum Let's, let's consider I want to climb a mountain. Suppose this is my mountain. Okay. I want to reach this peak. Okay. I want to reach this peak. Right. If a person is starting from here. Right. What will happen if a person goes in this straight direction? He will be able to reach fast. What if the person moves something like this? From here to here to here to here to here. It will take time to reach to the peak. And what if the person just iterates or moves in this direction in this way, like this zigzag movement, then he will be able to reach better than this particular green person, right? It is that we have to reach this point. This point over here is global minima. 
okay so i hope everybody is able to understand okay and you have understood that over here mini batch sgd gives us less noise but there is definitely noise now one very important thing still there is noise how do we remove the noise how do we remove the noise this is the next question how how do we go ahead and remove the noise now in order to remove the noise we use a concept which is called as momentum we'll discuss about this momentum in completely depth so because of this we have our next optimizer which is called as which is called as sgd with momentum obviously this sgd we are talking about mini batch sgd okay mini batch sgd with momentum now what this momentum will do is that it will smoothen this journey it will smoothen this journey it will make it smoother it will make it smoother and reduce the noise and try to come to the global minima okay it will just smoother how it will smoother i'll just talk about it there is a separate maths for that which is called as moving average and with the help of this exponential moving average we will be able to smoothen this journey and it will be able to reach the global minima efficiently so quickly let's understand i hope everybody is able to understand if you are able to understand please give a like say some symbols say thumbs up so that i'll be able to get an energy that you are able to understand with respect to whatever i'm teaching and i hope my handwriting is perfectly fine and i hope i write a book one day because i love writing these things you know and i'm i'm having fun writing this so i don't create any ppts so just let me know whether you are able to enjoy the video you are able to understand things or not right just let me know okay perfect now with respect to sgd with momentum how do we make sure that we are able to smoothen the entire process of reaching the global minima how we are able to do this okay in sgd in momentum we bring a very important concept which is called as exponential weighted average or i can also say moving average but here we'll just focus on weighted average let's say we are focusing on this exponential weighted average so what is this concept and this concept is also used in time series some of the models like arima model arma model we specifically use these things i hope everybody have heard about this uh, arima model arma model and all okay so let's understand what exactly is this exponential moving average i hope everybody knows the weight addition formula so weight addition i'll again write over here w new is equal to w old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old and similarly bias bias old is equal to sorry bias new is equal to bias old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of bias old right this two formula everybody knows it since i have written many number of times okay and uh, it should be very much clear to you now let me do one thing let me change this equation little bit okay and let it me let me write it in a new format okay and probably this format will make sense since we are doing exponential weighted average so over here i'm basically going to write wt plus 1 or let me write wt is equal to instead of writing new i'll write wt and here i'll write wt minus 1 minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt minus 1 so this is also the same thing because t basically means current time t minus 1 basically means new uh, previous time right similarly over here w new basically means the current weight updated weights and w old is the older weight okay so i will just try to change this in this particular way the reason why i am doing this i'll just let you know because we really need to understand what is this exponential weighted average okay now let's go ahead and understand about the exponential weighted average now in order to understand about exponential weighted average i'll take a very simple example i will take a very simple example okay 
So what does this exponential weighted average say that? Let's say I have data set for time t1, t2. I have some values. Let's say I have some values, okay? For time t1, t2, t, t4, like this till tn, okay? For time t1, the value is a1. For time t2, the value is a2. The time t3, the value is a3. This is a4 and like this, it is an, okay? So let's say I have this all time over here, okay? And uh, uh, I've just written the values over here and uh, you'll be able to see it. Uh, now, the next step, what does this exponential weighted average say? Okay, let's say, okay, and we'll try to understand. Everything will make sense, okay? Now here, I will basically write, let's say I'm saying that the value of T1 at time T1 is basically A1, okay? And suppose if I go ahead and try to say the value of time T2, and I have to make sure that I perform an exponential weighted average on T1 and T2. I want to, I want to create a weighted average between this two time series data. Let's see, because why, why this is very important? Because with this uh, help, I can also do forecasting. Okay, forecasting. Now, in order to do the forecasting, I should also be dependent on the previous timestamp values like A1. Okay, now if I really want to apply the exponential weighted average, I will be considering this too and I will assign a weight. Now, how I can assign a weight? Here, I will be saying beta, will, which will be my weight, weight values, I will say multiplied by Vt1 plus 1 minus beta multiplied by what is the value in a2 it is basic sorry what is the value in t2 it will basically be a2 now here what we are doing i'll just make you understand let's say my beta beta value is a basically a hyperparameter this is a hyperparameter which will actually help us to perform um this weighted moving average or mated exponential uh, moving average this beta tells us on which value we should focus more Okay, on which value we should focus more, whether we should give importance to the current timestamp value or whether we should give the importance to the previous timestamp value. Suppose if I say my beta value is ranging between 0 to 1, it usually ranges between 0 to 1. Let's say for the current instance, my beta value is 0 0.95. If my beta value is 0 0.95, then what I will do? I will basically write 0 0.95 multiplied by Vt1 plus 0 0.05 multiplied by a2. Now, in this particular case, since I have assigned 0 0.95 as my beta value, I am giving more importance to my vt1 value. That is my previous timestamp value. Because if I replace vt1, I am going to get a1. And to the current timestamp value, I am giving less importance. So, let's say if I plot this, if I plot this, right? a1 and a2. Okay, a1 is here, a2 is here. Let's say. Now, if I smoothen this, if I smoothen this, right, my smoothening will happen. My, my, my smoothening will basically happen and more control will be given to the previous point instead of the current point. Okay. And that is how this smoothening process will go ahead, right? Because we want to smoothen it. We want to smoothen it. So here, if I draw a new diagram for you, what we are trying to do? Suppose this is my gradient descent. Okay. So initially, let's say my point was here. Okay, my point was here. The A1, the T1 point was here. The T2 point, let's say it is here. T2 point is over here. Now, if I assign beta onto this, instead of going in this direction, it will now go in something in this direction. Okay, like this. And then the T3 will get controlled, then T4 will get controlled like this, and then finally it will reach the global minima. So here we are removing the noise removing the noise and is smoothening the curve we are smoothening the curve right we are smoothing curve. so i said beta is basically a hyperparameter okay now similarly if i say what is vt3 then if i write vt3 then this will basically become beta multiplied by vt2 plus 1 minus beta multiplied by a3 because vt3 the value at time 3 is a3 and this VT2 will get replaced by this entire value, right? So like this, for every timestamp, we can assign a hyperparameter with beta so that this smoothening process will actually happen, okay? 
So where do I apply this? Where do I apply this? Now the question rises, where do I apply this weighted uh, exponential weighted average, right? And it's very simple. Where do we apply it? Just a random guess. We basically apply this in the derivative of loss with respect to derivative of weights. Now, what I will do is that I will just go ahead and write exponential weighted average is nothing but here I'm just going to take this and now I'll write an equation, new equation, WT minus 1 minus learning rate. Instead of writing derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus 1, I will just write VDW. Now, what is this VDW? Let me write it down. VDW basically means it will be the weighted average with respect to VDW is nothing but value of the derivative. Okay. Beta multiplied by VDWT minus 1 plus 1 minus beta multiplied by derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt minus 1. That's it. And here we are bringing this exponential curve initially. Now, since we bring this, we definitely know that what is going to happen over here? The smoothening of the curve will basically happen. Okay. With the help of this. VDW basically means, uh, and this will be T, right? We did the, the value of the derivative at time T is nothing but beta multiplied by value derivative of, of the previous uh, value of derivative by time T minus 1 plus 1 minus beta multiplied by derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus 1. Okay. So I hope you are getting an idea how we are able to smoothen the curve in an efficient way. Okay. And this is basically my exponential moving average. Okay. And now if I probably draw my curve, what are problems we are solving? Suppose if this is my gradient descent, I will basically start from here and I will be getting a smoothened version to reach the global minima. And here, what are problems we are fixing? We are reducing the noise. We are reducing the noise. Uh, this will also be working for mini batch and it will also be having a quicker convergence. So nice stories, right guys? This all, see the best way to learn something is just like, remember the story, how things goes. There are some problem because of that problem, something else will come. And this will keep on coming. Today, if you really want to do, uh, do a PhD, find the loopholes in the previous things that are there, create a new one in front of you and that is done. Okay. So just a quick recap. Just a quick recap, everyone. Okay. What all things we have learned. So first thing we learned about something called as gradient descent. What did we do in gradient descent? You understood the problem. We cannot send millions of record. So I have to definitely go with gradient. I cannot go with gradient descent itself, right? Uh, so there is some problems, uh, obviously millions of record, resource intensive, everything you know. In interview also, they may ask you this, okay? They may see you that, okay? If there is so much of noise in probably my gradient descent, what do you think I should do? You say, I'll just say that, trying to bring that smoothening factor in your optimizer, that's it right? So easily. They'll not ask you the equations. But the reason I'm telling you the equations because you should be able to understand because at the end of the day, if I'm teaching, everybody should be able to understand. That is my main aim. Okay. Then after gradient descent, what did we learn? We learned about stochastic gradient descent. Then the third one is something called as mini batch SGD, right? The fourth one that we actually focused on, okay? Uh, this is basically uh, SGD with momentum. Okay. Now the fourth one that we are basically going to discuss is something called as Adagrad. Okay. So here I'm specifically going to write Adagrad. Now in Adagrad, uh, this is basically adaptive gradient descent. Okay, now what is this adaptive gradient descent? Let's discuss about this. Okay. And to discuss about this, let me again draw the gradient descent curve. Okay. So till now, 
whatever weight updation formula we have seen, right? What is the thing over there in the weight updation? There is one important parameter which is called as learning rate. Now this learning rate, you know, helps us to converge or it helps us to maintain the speed of the convergence, right? But understand one thing, okay? When we move towards the global minima, don't you think, and this is right now fixed, right? Fixed in every algorithm, in every optimizers. This is right now fixed. Can we change the learning rate in such a way that, let's say my data point is somewhere here. Initially, my learning rate should be high. And as we go towards the global minima, the learning rate should decrease. So can we do this? Because researchers will not keep quiet. They have to do the PhD, right? So they will come up with something else, right? And we have to learn those things. And again, I salute all the researchers. It's not a joke. Uh, they have created all these amazing things. You just go and see the research paper that they have written. You know, sometimes you'll not even understand the equations. That smart they are, okay? So over here, I have to make sure this, this adaptive, adaptive is the word, right? My learning rate is fixed, but I want to make sure that I also change my learning rate value. Now, how can I do that? That is what we are going to discuss. Now, right now, you everybody knows about this weight updation formula. So again, I will write it down, the weight updation formula, which is your favorite equation, I guess. So WT with WT minus one, minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt minus one okay so i'm just going to write like this now in adaptive gradient descent okay in adaptive gradient descent we replace this learning rate with something else okay if i really want to make right now the previous state is that this learning rate is fixed i want to make this Instead of fixed, I want to make this adaptive. Adaptive, I have to make these changes as we approach the global minima. So what I will do is that I will replace this entire value with something else. Now, what will I replace it with? I will replace it with completely like this. See, W of t, W of t minus 1. Instead of writing running rate, I will write eta. This is a kind of symbol which is called as eta. Instead of this, I'm going to write this. And remaining all will be same. Remaining all will be same. Derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus 1. Okay. Now, let me just encircle this quickly. Okay. Now, what is this? What is this value? This value. This value is basically, I'll write it as N of eta is equal to learning rate divided by, and here I'm going to write a formula which is called as alpha t plus epsilon, okay? Now, I'll explain each and every uh, parameter that is basically getting used, okay? Each and every parameter that is basically getting used, we'll try to understand, okay? Now, the first thing, why this epsilon is there? Epsilon is actually there and this will basically be a small number because to avoid divide by zero condition. If alpha of t is zero, then this divided by this zero is basically an infinity. So in order to avoid this, we are actually adding this small number, which is called as epsilon, so that this numerator, sorry, denominator never becomes zero. Okay. This is the first step. So I hope everybody understood about epsilon. Okay. So this is a small number. Now, the next thing is that what is this alpha of t? Now here, what I will be doing is that alpha of t, I will write a new equation. I'll say summation of i is equal to 1 to t. t basically means current timestamp. Okay. Current timestamp of that specific weight. And this will be defined as derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w t whole square. Okay. With respect to this timestamp, I'm doing the summation of all the previous weights also. And I'm also doing squaring. Okay. Now, when we bring this equation, what will happen? Okay. My main aim is that my learning rate, after it has started to train, you know, we should keep on decreasing it as we reach the global minima, right? We need to decrease it, right? We need to decrease it. Now, focus on the numerator that is alpha of t. 
don't you think this alpha of t whatever formula i've used you know as we go with respect to different different e value right with different different timestamp value don't you feel let's say in t is equal to 1 if my learning rate is 0 0.01 at t is equal to 2 this may also get reduced why it will get reduced i'll talk about it let's 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 write it down okay i'm writing it down over here and similarly at t is equal to 3 this will get reduced to 0 0.002 let's say okay let's 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 say I'll, I'll prove it why this value will go down over here you will be able to see that this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt as the timestamp goes on this value will keep on increasing because we are doing the summation right we are doing the summation and this value is getting divided over here right since the value is increasing at every timestamp this value we are going to insert over here and obviously because of this this entire equation don't you think it will decrease because we are dividing this with this i hope everybody is agreeing with this right so whenever we divide this value continuously because with respect to every timestamp this value is going to increase because alpha of t is nothing but the summation of i is equal to 1 to t derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt okay yeah it should be 0 0.05 okay so because of that you will be seeing that as we reach near the global minima as we reach near the global minima this value will keep on decreasing right and through that specific way we are bringing adaptiveness in the learning rate and this time the learning rate will never be fixed since it will be decreasing as we move towards the global minima okay so this is the only change that is basically coming on the learning rate okay this is very super important to understand timestamp basically means the weights at that particular timestamp like w new w old right so w new basically means w t w old basically means w t minus 1 now we will go to the next step still over here you see that we forgot to add this smoothening thing the exponential weighted average right exponential weighted average is also not there for learning rate also you see the value you know if this is increasing by a very huge number because this will increase in a deep neural network term will be increasing by a huge number okay so because of this the learning rate change that may happen will also become negligible at some times so how do we prevent that this should not be a huge change see understand over here something right when we are dividing by this right there may be situation that alpha t can become a huge number huge number also right in a deep neural network we keep on adding things we keep on adding derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt right with respect to timestamp now because of this what happens this n theta right it will there will be a negligible change right so in order to prevent this we are going to go and understand the next uh, optimizer which is called as adder delta so here we are going to discuss about adder delta and rms prop almost both both these optimizers has similar functionality i hope you understood that what is the problem over here the problem is that if we keep on updating this this value will keep on getting higher as iteration will happen as more and more weights will get updated and when i am trying to place it over here and when i am dividing with this learning rate which is already a small number if the learning rate is 0 0.01 this will already be a small number small number right and this n of n uh, theta of i this when i'm replacing over here suppose if this is a very small number hardly the previous weights and the current weights will change this will approximately be equal to the same wt will approximately be equal to wt minus 1 because of that so we also have to make sure that this alpha of t does not reaches a very huge value so how do we do this how do we make sure that this alpha of t is never so big now in this particular case I will again take this eta value and instead of writing alpha of t, I will divide by another number which is called as SDW plus epsilon. I hope everybody understood what is the importance of epsilon. But let's understand what SDW becomes. Now, SDW is nothing but here we are going to apply exponential weighted average again so that we control this value okay so here we are going to basically apply exponential 
weighted average. How do I apply exponential weighted average? Initially, let's say that we will initialize HDW as zero. Okay. Then with respect to T, let's say this is T minus one. Now with respect to T, I will say that beta multiplied by HDW T minus one plus one minus beta multiplied by derivative of loss, derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W whole square. We understood, right? See, what is the thing over here? We know that alpha t formula is derivative of loss with respect to derivative of wt whole square, right? And we are also making sure that we keep it over here. And this will also be t minus 1, right? We are, we are making sure that we keep it over here. But now it is controlled because of this exponential weighted average. Now, suppose if my beta value, let's say my beta value is 0.95. Then what SDWT will happen? This will be 0.95 multiplied by SDWT minus 1 plus 0 0.05 with derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus 1 whole square. Now we are controlling this with this parameter. Now this will never increase or bump up by a very large value. It is, it'll, it is going to definitely increase by a smaller value. I hope everybody is able to understand, right? So I hope everybody is getting this idea what I'm trying to say. Here the problem was that we were not able to control this increase. But here we are definitely being able to control because of this beta value, right? 1 minus beta value. And this will be the current value with respect to the previous value, whatever 0 will assign. But we are making sure that this will always be in the control state. Now, when this will be in the control state, obviously, there will be a slow decreasing of this learning rate value also, and we will be able to reach the global minima, right? Are you understanding these things or not, guys? Just tell me, okay? It's just like a story. Now, we have brought exponential weighted average into picture, right? Why? Because we really want to control this, okay? So HDW is a new term that I'm actually using. This HDW is nothing but initially at time t minus 1 or time t, it will be 0. When we go to the next time step, it will, we'll take the 0, we'll apply over here. But we really need to control this value. Control. You have to control this value, how it increases. Okay. And that is what we are doing with the help of exponential weighted average. Okay. So I hope everybody is able to understand. Now, finally, see, everything is added, but still we again give, because here also my equation will look like this. See, my, my weight updation formula still has this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus one, right? And whenever I have this smoothening will not happen. See smoothening, what is the equation? If I talk about smoothening here, I'm just saying that if I want to bring SGD with momentum, over here, you can see that my smoothening equation will have VDW. But here, what I'm using, I'm using derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus 1. Still, I have removed, basically, the researchers in adaptive gradient descent and in Adelta and RMS prop, they are not doing the smoothening still. The smoothening is missing, right? Because see, in SGD momentum, what was the equation that we saw? VDW. Now, this VDW and this SDW should be combined together. If we combine together, then it solves both the problem. Okay, I'm going to again write this out quickly for you all. Let me rub it. Okay. Let me rub it quickly. Okay. So what will happen if I apply a beta value of 0.95? So my SDWT for the current timestamp will be 0.95 multiplied by SDWT minus 1 plus 0 0.05 multiplied by derivative of loss with respect to derivative of t minus 1 whole square. We, now we are controlling this increase with this, right? Now we bought this HDW concept over here, but we left the momentum. The researcher left the smoothening momentum, right? Over here. See, know where the smoothening momentum is present, right? So where that is, that is basically present over here. In the SGD in momentum, we discussed, right? In SGD with momentum, we brought this factor, that is exponential weighted average. 
Now the next one that we are going to discuss, we are going to combine this exponential weighted average and then we are also making sure that we have this adaptive learning rate and when we combine both of them, we are going to get something called as Adam Optimizer. So in Adam Optimizer, what we do? We combine momentum along with the RMS prop intuition that we have understood. What is the intuition that we understood over here? We made sure that here we have adaptive learning rate. Adaptive learning rate. When we combine both of this, it becomes Adam Optimizer. Right now, this is the best optimizer. Yes, there are different, different variants of this optimi optimizer like Adam Max. There is different, different one, right? But right now, everybody is using the Adam Optimizer. Okay, every everybody, most of the people are basically using Adam optimizers. And this is right now currently the best optimizer, which also researchers basically say. So here we are going to combine both this concept. Now, what will happen is that I will be having VDW and I will be having HDW. And along with this, whatever I explained, right, it also gets applied to bias because bias will also get updated, right? It's the same formula will get applied. So for bias also, instead of writing VDW, I will write now VDB. Then here I will say HDB. Initially, this all values will be zero. Now, how my, how my equation will look like? My weight updation equation will look like WT, WT minus one min, uh, minus eta. And then here I will be having VDW. Okay, this is for the weight updation formula. For bias updation formula, what will happen? Bt, Bt minus 1, minus eta, and here I will be having Bdb. Eta, everybody knows. What is eta? Learning rate divided by root of SdW plus epsilon. Right? Everybody knows this. What is Vdw? Vdw also everybody knows. VDW is nothing but beta multiplied by, see the formula up, what I have actually written over here, beta multiplied by WT, VDW T minus 1. So, multiplied by VDW T minus 1 multiplied by 1 minus beta multiplied by derivative of loss with respect to derivative of WT minus 1. That's it. I am just combining this both equation. And whatever things we have learnt it, we are just combining it over here in front of you itself. And this will also become, what will be VD, uh, BT? This is nothing, beta multiplied by VDBT minus 1 multiplied by, sorry, this will be addition. Just a second. This will be 1 minus beta plus, and this will also be plus. 1 minus beta derivative of loss with respect to derivative of bt minus 1. That's it. Now I have made you too much super smart. You know learning eta what it becomes. You know this, you know this, you combine this and this is your new weight updation formula for Adam Optimizer. This will make sure that what all factors will get covered. What all factors? It is solving the problem of smoothening it is forming following the problem of smoothening it is making sure that the learning rate becomes adaptive learning rate becomes adaptive and this is the story that we wanted to achieve if you find some flaws also you start writing a research paper right and there are different variants adam max and adam and all right so we'll keep the session today to this much. Uh, tomorrow we'll start the ANN practical. So thank you, one doll. This was it from my side. Have a great day ahead. Keep on rocking. Keep on learning. Never give up. Always try to help others. That is it from my side. I will see you all in the next session where we'll discuss about ANN and CNN. Have a great day. In, in the previous session, we have actually discussed about uh, optimizers. Uh, we have actually completed uh, 
gradient descent stochastic gradient descent mini batch sgd sgd with momentum add a grad rms prop and adam optimizes right we understood the entire maths for this you know whatever maths was actually required what is the difference how the weight updation will basically happen you know and uh, sgd with momentum everything we actually uh, covered uh, we also understood about exponential weighted average then uh, we understood about what is adaptive gradient descent that basically means how we are actually being able to change the learning rate and uh, then we had this added delta and rms prop then we had adam optimizer and finally we saw how smoothening uh, how we were using adaptive learning rate along with exponential uh, weighted average to basically go ahead with right so let's talk about the agenda uh, I'm just going to clear this quickly. Okay. So this is the day four. So day four or deep learning. Okay. Now in the day four or deep learning, what all things we are basically going to cover? Number one, we will be starting with ANN practical implementation. ANN practical implementation. The data set is basically given in the pinned comment. Okay. Pinned comment, please check it out. Uh, you'll be able to see the data set, download it, and just let me know whether you have downloaded or not. Okay. Pinned comment, you can see, right? The Google Drive link is given. Okay. Check out the pinned comment, guys. Okay. For the data set. Okay. So we have completed ANN practical implementation and the second one that we are basically going to understand is what is early stopping? What is early stopping? What is early stopping? The third thing we are going to understand about black box models versus white box model. Okay. And then after we complete this, we are now going to understand about, you know, uh, after black box model and uh, the white box model, we are also going to understand about one important topic of CNN. So CNN introduction, we will try to cover it, you know. So let's see uh, all these things we will try to cover it in today's session. Okay, practical session will usually take a little bit more time because I really want to cover in depth practical ANN practical implementation and early stopping, which is a very important concept because many people say that how many epochs we should basically run, you know, while training the deep learning model. So it will be very much important itself. Okay, quickly, uh, let's start without wasting any time now. So a notebook file I will be opening over here. Okay, so here is the notebook file uh, that we will basically be working on with. Okay, and this is from uh, Google, Google Collab. You can basically use Google Collab itself and you do one thing before we start. We will change the runtime to GPU. I hope everybody knows what Google Collab is and then we'll try to connect it. Okay, we'll try to connect it. Okay, too many Google collapse. Let's see. Manage session. Terminate. And we will start this. So I'm just going to connect it over here quickly. And uh, the data set uh, that I'm actually going to use is basically. And guys, if anybody asks the data set, please make sure that someone in the pin uh, in the message, you can actually ping over there and tell people to download the link. Okay. Fine. So perfect. Uh, after downloading the data set, if you probably open the data set, uh, the Google Drive link, you will be able to see the CSV file. Okay. So churn.modeling.csv, we are going to see and we are going to cover this. Okay. So here I'm just going to open the folder. How do you download this? You just drag and drop it over here. That's it. And automatically this churnmodeling.csv will get uploaded over here. Okay. So once you have this churn modeling.csv, now we can basically start what all things we are actually going to do with respect to ANN. Okay, very simple. With the help of Google Collab, you can do it. Now, now the next thing that we are actually going to do is that start writing the code. Okay. And here we are specifically going to implement 
ANN, that is Artificial Neural Network. Now let's go ahead and let's start writing the code. Okay, so as usual uh, in the initial stage, what all things we have to do and how we have to do. So first of all, uh, I will start with pip install, pip install, TensorFlow, because I'm going to use TensorFlow GPU. So I'm just going to do this installation and it will probably take some time to do the installation. It depends on your internet speed. And then we will start seeing which version of TensorFlow we are going to work, or work with, right? Which is the recent version. With the help of that, we are going to basically work with, okay? So we'll wait uh, till the, uh, the entire TensorFlow GPU gets downloaded. And right now, we'll be working with the version that is greater than 2.0 because the version with 2.0 has, uh, you know, uh, the Keras also integrated within them, okay? So let the installation happen and you'll be seeing that after some time, the installation will be done, okay? Then uh, after this installation takes place, I can also go ahead and see which version of the TensorFlow we are going to use, okay? So again, some time more and probably everybody is going in that specific speed, okay? So it is 497.5 MB. So the fine, the code has got executed. Now what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to import TensorFlow, TensorFlow as TF, and then I'm also going to print the TF version, okay? So TF dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore, okay? When I execute this here, you'll be able to see what version is there. It is nothing but 2.8.0, okay? Now, uh, in this version, we are basically going to work uh, because this version is greater than 2.0. And uh, this version uh, has Keras integrated into it. So we'll continue with this specific version. Perfect. Now in the next step, what we are going to do is that we are going to import some basic libraries. Import some basic libraries. Okay. Make sure that you always write the comments so that you'll be able to understand what all things we are actually going to do. So here I'm going to import NumPy as NP. I'm going to import matplotlib for the plotting purpose. I plot as plt. Then I'm going to import pandas as pd. Okay. Now, uh, these three libraries I'll specifically be importing because I really need to read the data sets and all. So that is the reason why I'm going with this. Then uh, let's go ahead and read my data set. So it will be pd.read underscore csv. And I have this churn modeling data set churn underscore modeling dot csv remember i have actually put this data set over here so in this folder you can actually see it okay and once i will execute this and probably and i'll write data set dot head so the problem statement is quite simple and here what we are actually trying to do is that there is specific data set over here from row number to this all things and we need to predict right now this is a binary classification problem we need to predict basically whether the customer is going to exit that particular bank or any company whether all these products that they are being used in the specific bank whether they are going to just um you know uh, exit it in the future case or not so if we want to really prevent it to uh, prevent the execution like they don't want to quit the bank so we should definitely provide some more services so that is the reason we are trying to create a model uh, by seeing all these details uh, uh, we will try to see like whether the customer is going to exit the bank or not so here exited is basically my dependent feature remaining all are my uh, independent features okay so now the main thing that what we do over here is that first of all whenever we are doing this we really need to convert this entire data set into independent and dependent features so here what i am specifically going to do i'm going to basically uh, divide the data set data set into independent and dependent features right dependent features so once you do this uh then what I'm actually going to do, independent features, I'll denote it by a capital X and I'll write data set dot I lock. I lock basically means index location. Okay. Now index location here, you can basically see from row number, 
रो नंबर टू स्पेसिफिक इफ आई प्रॉब्ली टॉक अबाउट एस्टिमेटेड सैलरी दिस शुड ऑल बी माई इंडिपेंडेंट फीचर्स राइट एंड अगेन रो नंबर इज ऑल्सो कंटिन्यूस नंबर राइट सो आई वुड डेफिनेटली नॉट लाइक टू हैव रो नंबर ओवर हियर आई कैन रिमूव द रो नंबर बिकॉज इट इज जस्ट अ यूनिक वैल्यू आई वुड ऑल्सो लाइक टू रिमूव द कस्टमर आई डी बिकॉज कस्टमर आई डी विल ऑल्सो नॉट मेक एनी सेंस so what i will do is that from this surname okay name can also not play a very important role because i definitely don't like to have name and all also but i will focus more on this features that is credit score geography gender tenure balance number of products has credit is active card and estimated salary and exited okay so this till here will all be my independent features and exited will be my dependent feature so in order to do this i need to find out from in which index location i want so if i count like 0 1 Two, right all these features i don't want right so i can basically start for the third index so i definitely want all the row comma i basically want from 3 to 13th column 13th column is nothing but if i start counting 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 okay 9 10 11 12 right so 11 12 13 till the 12th index i require all these values in my independent feature so i will basically be writing 11 12 13 so till the 12th index i require all these values in my independent feature so i will basically be writing 3 colon 13 similarly when i go to the next line y is equal to data set data set dot i lock okay here i definitely want all the rows and my output feature is basically my 13th column so if i execute this here you will be able to see that i have actually divided the entire data set into independent and uh, dependent features okay and uh, what i will do i will just go and basically check out x dot head and here you will be able to see the independent features which is very much easily available okay so here you can basically see this okay and similarly if i probably see y and here you will be able to see my output feature which is my dependent feature okay <clears throat> so i hope everybody is clear with this much and let's go to the next step uh, we uh, see over here also this data set is not that clean there are independent features they are uh, in this independent features they are categorical columns right categorical columns like gender uh, age tenure uh, sorry uh, gender geography is definitely a category features so we really need to fix this category features the number of categories in this category features are very less so we can basically use one hot encoding or we can use uh, get dummies in pandas right it is up to your choice okay now what i am actually going to do and probably this will basically be my feature engineering part because in the feature engineering i really need to fix all these problems of um, you know handling the category features or not so here i have geography here i have geography and here i'll basically write pd dot get underscore dummies okay pd dot get underscore dummies and here i'm specifically going to basically say that which column i really want to convert that as and my category feature so here is my ge geography column right so i'll pick up this value and i'll put it over here and i'll say x of geography right when i say pd dot get dummies uh with respect to geography let me just let me just execute this now geography let's say it has three Uh, three unique features like three unique values right different different countries and if i try to just execute this i will be able to see that it will get converted into one hot encoded like wherever the france value will be there that will become one wherever germany will be there that will become zero because in this row france was there wherever that specific value is there it will become one remaining all will become zero now suppose in the second record we had one in spain right the spain record was there so it became one so that is the purpose of the get underscore dummies over here what we are specifically trying to do okay and uh, the next step what we are also looking at is that uh, we will try to uh, focus on we will try to focus on one more important parameter which is called a drop underscore first is equal to true right when i use drop underscore first is equal to true instead of showing all the three columns it will just show the two columns like germany and spain because if france is present this both will become zero okay so we can actually uh, use this two columns to represent all the three columns itself okay so this is where we specifically use get underscore dummies now what i am actually going to do is that i am going to create a column for this okay so i will say that okay fine this will be my geography 
variable and i'm going to basically create this similarly if i use gender for gender also we will specifically write like this pd dot get underscore dummies and here i'm just going to say that x of okay gender and here also i'm going to basically apply drop underscore first is equal to true okay so if i execute these two things uh it'll get executed perfectly and now i will also have a gender which will be a one hot encoded and i'll also have geography which will be one hot encoded now what i'm actually going to do is that i'm going to concatenate concatenate this variables with the data frame right with data frame now in order to do this the first thing is that i will drop geography and gender column because now i don't want this geography and gender column so i'm just going to drop it now in order to drop it it is very much simple all you have to basically say that let's take the independent feature and apply a drop operation and inside this uh what i'm actually going to give i'm just going to give my so it will be a function i'm just going to give my features right what all features i have i have specifically geography geography and my another feature that is my uh gender right so i'm just going to say gender okay so these two features i'm going to have and i'm going to make sure that i have to write axis equal to one because i need to drop the columns i do not need to drop the rows so that is specifically very much important okay and uh you you i hope everybody is able to understand till here right so once i execute this you will be able to see what will happen so this is my value that i'm getting and now you can see that these two features are not present okay but what i have to do after this is that i have to basically update my x right right now x is not updated okay so i'm just going to replace this entirely in my x now if i probably go and see x dot head you'll be able to see that geography and gender is not present okay geography and gender is not present so we are able to see that okay fine uh the category features we have one hot encoded now what we will do is that we'll do the concatenation of these two variables in this now concatenation process is also very much simple all we have to do is that right just pd dot concat which is a, a function in pandas and here i'm specifically basically saying that x comma geography so geography comma gender right so we are going to just concatenate this all things and uh, this concatenation should again happen in the column wise right not in row wise so for that i will basically write axis is equal to one okay now once i execute this here you will be able to see don't directly replace it for see whether everything is working properly or not so if you go and see in the right hand side here you will be able to see germany spain and mail has got added okay so one of the column has got deleted from here and one of the column has also deleted got got deleted so in short why we are doing all these things because we really need to handle the categorical wage features okay uh categorical features we should definitely handle this so now i'm just going to write x is equal to and probably update this in my x variable perfect so we have got this and we are able to uh do till here which is pretty much amazing and now uh the thing that we really need to do because we have handled the category features we have handled the other things now it's time we do a train test split because train test split is required because we will be training this with the help of ann right artificial neural network so now what i will do is that i'll say splitting the data set into training set and test set okay and then i will basically write from sklearn dot model selection and then i'm going to import train test split i hope everybody is very much familiar with this so train test split okay now with the help of train test split what all things we can get we can get basically x train x test y train y test so we will just go ahead and write this i'll say x train comma x test comma y train comma y test and here i'm specifically going to use this train test split okay and then i will be using my x and y variable i lets me say that my test size is just 20 percent so i'm just going to write 0.2 and then finally i'm going to basically say random underscore state is equal to zero okay so till here uh if you probably execute it 
now here you will be able to get your train test split which is perfectly fine now one very important thing okay one very very important thing which probably we have not discussed till now okay whenever we we talk about artificial neural network right when when whenever we talk about ann one very important thing is that feature scaling feature scaling and the main interview question that you may get right let's talk about an interview question they will ask whether features for which all machine which all algorithm let's say for which all algorithms which all algorithms feature scaling is required feature scaling is required this is a super important interview question like uh, many people ask this uh, i have also seen from the people who have attended interviews right so uh, here you can basically say that uh, for which algorithm feature scaling is required so the next question that probably someone may drop right whether for ann is it required for linear regression is it required for logistic regression is it required for decision tree is it required for random forest is it required so this all kind of questions may come in your mind right for feature scaling is whether it is required or not in short if i really want to talk about ann okay definitely for ann it will get required for linear regression for logistic regression for decision tree decision tree not necessary rf random forest not necessary xg boost not necessary if i talk about knn yes it can require for k means it will be definitely important where two things are there for which all algorithm first of all anything that is related to distance based we really need to do feature scaling right because whenever there is some distance based problem you will definitely know that if the values is bigger so the calculation will definitely take time right then the second thing is that wherever gradient descent or wherever optimizers is involved like gradient descent is involved in linear regression logistic regression in this particular case also scaling will be requiring right so that our convergence that usually happens will be quicker when compared to the other things okay and definitely decision trees does not does not require xg boost does not require you know ada boost uh, uh, does not require and all okay so this specific question you can actually get it and you will be later thanking me that krish yes i may probably have got this question uh, i hope everybody will be able to answer okay so this is super important now let's go to the next thing uh, let's let's continue the coding part right so what i am actually going to do now let's go to the coding part now we have done the train test split now we really need to do something called as feature scaling okay now feature scaling i will just say from sk learn dot reprocessing and i'm going to import standard scalar now there may be uh, scenarios when you may be asking krish why standard scalar only why not min max scalar see min max scalar also you can definitely apply but that will get applied to cnn tomorrow we'll be discussing about that today i'll just give you a brief introduction uh, but mostly min max scalar anything that you want to restrict between 0 to 1 or minus 1 to plus 1 and all right you should definitely try it with respect to uh, cnn standard scalar basically means uh, based on that z score that you have probably seen those formulas where i have specifically spoken about in my statistics lessons or machine learning lessons right so there we should definitely go ahead and use uh, standard scalar and this way you know uh, suppose if your data uh, is normalized you know it it basically rotates around your mean value with some standard deviation to the right and the left okay so that is the reason why we specifically use standard scalar and here i'm going to initialize sc is equal to standard scalar okay i'm just going to initialize it and finally you'll be able to see i'm using x twain where i'll specifically say sc dot fit underscore transform okay fit underscore transform and here i'm going to give my x twain value okay and always understand what is the difference between fit underscore transform and transform i've also made a detailed video about it but uh, if any would anybody would like to comment down in the comment section you can let me know okay uh, so sc dot transform so this can also be an interview question like why do we apply fit underscore transform only to the 
training data set not to the test data set you know so this kind of questions may also definitely come to you so be prepared i've always given you all the hints that you want okay so here it is uh, we will try to execute it um okay transform okay fine there is there is an error we'll try to execute it so now if you probably um x has feature names but standard server fitted without feature name okay let's see what uh, things uh, x train for I think it is fine. This is a warning, I guess. So if I go and probably see my X underscore train, and if I execute it, you will be able to see that my data has got transformed. Okay. And similarly, if I go and probably see X underscore test uh, here also, you'll be able to see my data has got transformed. Perfect. So train and test has got transformed completely, which is quite amazing. And now if you probably also check out the shape of the train, right? X underscore train dot shape. So right now you're still in feature engineering. It is not like in ANN, you don't require feature engineering because ANN problem can also be solved with the help of machine learning, right? So that is the reason, okay? Uh, ANN problem can also be solved by uh, machine learning part also, okay? Yes, one amazing answer the, that I can tell you that why fit underscore transform and transform is used only for test data because of data leakage okay avoid data leakage a data leakage video i've created in a detailed way okay you can definitely check it out okay perfect now the part two part two here we are going to create now let's let's create the ann the artificial neural network now before this uh, you need to understand what is tensorflow what is keras okay here whenever we talk about this the library that we are going to use is basically tensorflow right tensorflow a popular library this was open sourced by google okay google deep minds is a team uh, who have actually created this okay and again you know about pytorch also pytorch is from facebook overall same things you can do with both of them okay now initially when before tensorflow 2.0 okay tensorflow was separate keras is a wrapper okay so if you talk about tensorflow keras is basically a wrapper wrapper basically means it uses this tensorflow apis only but over here, you will find a simple function. You can just call the function and you can basically use the TensorFlow in depth inside this. Okay. So after 2.0, greater than 2.0, what happened? Keras and TensorFlow got integrated. So that basically means now Keras is inside this TensorFlow version itself. Okay. You can basically use, again, it is a wrapper. Obviously, this Keras is a wrapper over here. Okay. And you can actually use tensorflow in a much more better way before the installation used to be working like this first of all we need to install tensorflow and separately we need to install keras and then probably we'll be able to work right and there was also a definition uh there was also a dependency on the version that we are trying to use okay so right now uh it has been made simple uh when probably uh, tensorflow greater than 2.0 had actually come okay so let's go ahead and let's try to now start uh, coding in TensorFlow and Keras. So here it is. Uh, here, what I'm actually going to do is that uh, we are going to create the ANN. Now, to create the ANN, all we have to do is that import some very important things. So right now, first thing that I'm going to import, I'm going to say from TensorFlow.Keras. I'm going to dot models. I'm going to import sequential. Okay then from tensorflow dot keras dot layers i'm going to import dense okay i'll talk about each and everything what is sequential what is dense and all you know from tensorflow dot keras you can also import different different layers now what kind of layers this is these are specifically related to activation function like this i can basically say leaky relu okay i can basically say pre relu okay so suppose prelu right this is also there i can also say elu 
okay if you see elu is also there right if i probably say relu i can also add up relu okay so all these things right the activation function that we have basically discussed right uh, all these things we can basically import okay and then up on top of it uh i will also be importing one very important thing which is called as dropout okay so i'll say from tensorflow.keras.layers i'm going to import import dropout okay so what is dropout dropout layer i'll just discuss about this theoretical okay to make everybody understand okay so from tensorflow.keras.layers i'm just going to import dropout now oh uh, okay tensorflow okay fine now let's discuss about all these things what is sequential why dense libraries specifically used you know uh, why all these things are there why we have to use so many things and all everything we'll try to see so quickly let's go ahead and let's try to understand so first thing first as usual we'll go from basics first thing uh, we imported something called as sequential okay second thing we basically discussed about dense third thing uh, that relu and all that is basically the activation function right now understand uh if i probably draw quickly a neural network right let's say this is my basic neural network right now the number of inputs that i have 11 let's say this is my 11 inputs 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 one more we can insert over here okay 11 inputs will be there okay and then uh let's say in my hidden layer there are some neurons i am not just going to count how many hidden layers are there okay and then I, I may have another hidden layer okay i may have another hidden layer and remember this all will get interconnected and since this is a binary classification problem i can have one single output which will basically be able to tell you whether the output is one or zero okay and remember this all will be interconnected right this will be interconnected 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 like this all will be interconnected right and similarly finally we get the output layer this is all my input right input now let's understand why we have imported sequential and all everything okay when i take this entire neural network at once if i probably take this entire neural network together right as a block okay i will basically say that as sequential sequential okay this sequential basically indicates that we will definitely be able to do forward propagation and backward propagation okay so i just think as a huge block that has a neural network inside this and that can be basically done with the sequential okay and this sequential whenever we write we'll definitely be able to do the forward and the backward propagation now whenever we use dense okay whenever we use dense that basically means we'll be able to create the circles in the hidden layer we'll be able to create neurons in in the hidden layer we'll be able to create all the different neurons whenever we need to create neurons or input layer or this the circles then at that point of time we'll be using the dense layer okay so this is specifically dense layer with the help of dense layer we'll be able to create the hidden layers we'll be able to create the input layers we'll be able to create the output layer okay input layer output layer okay so that is the reason we use dense now when we come to the activation function i hope everybody knows that what all activation function we have we have learned it in depth pre relu elu relu sigmoid right tan h and all where we'll be using we'll be using in the hidden layer itself inside this whatever activation function we want we will be able to use it right we'll be able to use it over here 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 right we'll be able to use it in a better way okay now uh mostly we have covered this there is also one more layer which is called as dropout layer now let me talk about this dropout okay now what does dropout basically say let's say i have a simple neural network like this let's say i have a three input layer and i may have many hidden neurons let's say and i may have another set of hidden neurons and finally i may have output layer okay now when i have this interconnected multi-layered neural network and you know that because of this neurons neurons right it 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 actually helps us to solve complex problems also because uh, we will be doing forward and backward propagation we will always be continuously monitoring the loss function and with the help of optimizers we will always try to uh, come to uh, you know uh, the global minima in some time right sometime this this entire lead this entire neural network leads to overfitting now what is overfitting overfitting basically says for training my accuracy is good my accuracy is very good very high but for test right for test my accuracy goes down okay my accuracy goes down now 
this kind of to reduce the overfitting what we do specifically is that we basically in introduce something called as dropout layer now this dropout layer what it does it is just like a regularization parameter which we learnt in machine learning regularization parameter i hope everybody knows about l1 norm right we have discussed this l2 norm and all we have discussed in depth right all these things we have uh, discussed in completely depth right in my machine learning uh, sessions right now in this dropout layer what it does is that every layer suppose if i say my dropout over here ratio is 0.3 this basically indicates that 30 percentage of the entire neurons that are present in this layer will get deactivated while training okay will get deactivated like while training let's say the 30 percent is one neuron out of all this right this will get deactivated during the training purpose so when it is when the training is basically happening when the forward propagation and backward propagation is actually happening you will basically be seeing that this will get deactivated right similarly over here i can basically say 0.5 50 percentage of the neurons will get deactivated so suppose this and this will get randomly selected and this will get deactivated remaining all the connections will be there whenever the neurons are deactivated we will basically cut off the layer okay because it will be of no use right it will just be like a dead neuron right and this will get this this will get connected to this 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 like this and through this way what happens is that my entire training process will actually go ahead you know and uh, the, this is in short whenever we use dropout layer we are basically trying to uh, reduce the overfitting and work in an efficient way so this is an idea about dropout layer and the same thing we'll also try to do in today's thing right so let's go ahead and let's go back to the code now now over here we have imported everything that is required so let's uh, continue and let's try to do the things okay now first thing first uh, we will initialize the ann okay we have just imported the library so i'm just going to let's initialize the ann okay ann and then i'm going to basically write classifier is equal to sequential sequential uh, so this is the classifier that i'm specifically going to use uh, let's initialize the ann itself and then i'm going to basically add add the input layer adding the input layer okay now when we decide uh, that okay we initialize this ann this entire ann by the sequential part now i need to add the input layer because see from this what we are doing first of all we need to add this input layer right and we know how many inputs are there see if we probably go and see my x train shape there are 11 inputs so definitely in the input layer i need to have 11 nodes so what i will do is that i will say classifier dot add now what i need to add as i said you that i have to use dense layer to add the input hidden layer and everything so here i'm specifically going to use dense and uh, this dense See over here internally, I'm going to basically use dense. Now inside this dense, I will be seeing parameters like units. Okay. So how many units I need to add over here? 11. Okay. So 11 units uh, we specifically need to add. And then I will also be trying to add the activation function. Activation function, which is called as ReLU. Okay. This will get applied to the next layer. ReLU will get applied to the next upcoming layer. Okay, so here only we need to specify with respect to that. So here uh, is my classifier. I have actually created the input layer. The number of input nodes I have actually told until the next layer, what activation function will get applied, I have actually told. Okay, now coming to the second one, adding the second input layer, or first hidden layer, sorry, first hidden layer. Now to add it again, what I will say, I will say classifier.add and here i'm basically going to again take dense and let's say that in my first hidden layer i'm just going to consider six units okay six six neurons or seven neurons whatever you want okay seven neurons so seven neurons i'm going to basically use and then i'm going to basically say that activation function to the next layer will also again be relu so here also i'm going to specify the relu activation function so this will be my first hidden layer let's say that i'm going to add one more hidden layer so i'm adding the uh, second hidden layer and let's say I'm going to just add seven neurons or six neurons, whatever uh, you want. Okay. Uh, there are techniques uh, uh, how to find out that how many number of uh, hidden neurons needs to be added. But here uh, we'll not focus on much on that because later on we'll try to see that. So here I'm again going to use dense and dense will basically have different different parameters like units activation function uh, bias and all we can basically add it up. Okay. So here I'm basically going to say units is equal to six. And let's say my activation function is relu. 
okay and value okay so i'll be basically giving in the quotes if you don't want to give in the quotes you can directly name this value itself wherever you want okay so that is also available so here uh, i've added my second hidden layer again okay and uh, we are basically going to do this uh, okay and uh, i think we are going in the right stage okay and finally we will add our output layer so adding the output layer okay now adding the output layer again i'll say classifier dot add and then i'll be using a dense a dense and i'll be saying that okay fine uh, uh i what i will do is that i'll just say one neuron because i, I actually need to focus on that also because now this is a binary classification i just require one neuron and here tell me any guesses just pause the video and let me know what is the activation function uh the activation function over here since this is a binary classification problem which we have learned it it is basically sigmoid okay so sigmoid we are basically going to add over here perfect so let's execute this let's execute this now perfect uh, this is got executed my classifier neuron the entire neural network is ready now all i have to do is that quickly 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 train uh train my entire uh you know the neural network and let's see how do we uh train our entire neural network okay so here what i'm actually going to do i'm going to say classifier dot compile okay we have to first of all compile the entire neural network and here the first thing that we are going to give is optimizer what optimizer do we give we give adam optimizer because it is the best optimizer and apart from that i also have to provide my loss function since this is a binary problem statement so i will i have already said that we are going to use binary cross entropy and this also part we discussed in the loss function and finally the type of metrics that i'm actually going to focus on is my accuracy okay so accuracy i'm actually going to focus on which will be my metric okay so this is it uh, i think we have done successfully till here it's amazing it's uh, beautiful till here we are able to do it but still you may be thinking krish where is the learning rate right by default adam uses a learning rate of 0.01 if you really want to provide your own learning rate just say that import uh, tensorflow let's say i'm going to import tensorflow and here i'm just going to say tensorflow dot keras dot optimizers right optimizes dot adam okay we initialize adam like this adam and here i can specify my learning rate learning rate i'll make this as capital adam and this will basically be my tensorflow okay and here i can initialize my learning rate with respect to whatever value i want so if i execute this okay so here you can see that it is a adam object i will probably say this as my optimizer and execute this and this same opt can basically be put up over here okay instead of using adam you can also use anything that you want so over here inside the optimizers you have all the options with respect to all the optimizers that we have discussed like gradient descent and all and all and all okay whatever you want you can basically use it uh, it is up to you but i have already told you that adam optimizers are very good when compared to the other optimizers right so here uh, it is done everything is done now is the main thing is that we have to really train our neural network right now in order to train our neural network all i will basically be doing is that i will say okay fine my model history okay model history okay will basically be nothing but classifier dot fit and here i'm going to give my x train comma y train okay and then i'm going to give something called as validation split and apart from that i'll say 0.33 and there i can also specify my bus size right so bus size we have to give it because we know that in this also ram size will be less so bus size is equal to 10 let's me give bus size i'm going to give it as 10 and epochs let's say that i'm going to give it 1000 okay let's 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 consider i'm giving 1000 epochs you may be saying krish are you mad 1000 epochs what will happen this will keep on running and that is where i'll be talking about early stopping okay so right now let's give epochs as 1000 and just execute it and how smoothly it will start executing and here you will be able to see that 560 536 iterations are there now you calculate based on the data set size why 536 is there and here we have also applied validation split 
right cross validation we basically say why 536 iteration is there just do the calculation you know based on the number of epochs and batch size right now here you'll be able to see that my accuracy is increasing my validation loss is going down validation accuracy is also increasing my uh, main loss the training loss is also in, uh, decreasing right so this is a very good thing here validation loss is also decreasing you can see increasing to decreasing but it will decrease as we go ahead so we will wait 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 and we'll see that after some point of time you know my accuracy will be almost stagnant so at that point of time what should i do we'll discuss about it okay okay so here it is so here you can see the accuracy is going going up now it is in 86 percent validation accuracy is in 85 percent which is going amazing right but we have we are running this for thousand epochs just imagine thousand epochs okay so we are definitely going to put early stopping because the thing the idea that you will be thinking is that what should be my number of epochs right many people have basically asked this question so for that we are going to use early stopping so let's let the training happen for some time at least for 100 epochs and then you will probably see a kind of uh, observation that the accuracy will not be increasing at all so the main question is that how do we decide that when the accuracy should how many number of epochs we should basically stop right so here you can see that it is going on quickly in an efficient way uh 86 percent now here you can see right 86.42 86.49 86.32 86.42 86 86.14 it is rotating there right it is rotating there itself right it is not increasing or it is not reducing okay so that is the thing over here that is happening okay validation split basically says that it's just like how many data you're going to basically validate you know based on some batch size if you say validation split is 0.33 just imagine right the entire training data set is there you're just taking somewhere around 66 percentage of the data and you are basically using it and you're dividing the data set with respect to every epoch so that it takes up for the training purpose okay uh okay now here you can see 86 86 86 so what i'm actually going to do over here it is going to you know iterate in that same accuracy so what i am going to do i'm just going to do the stop part let's see whether i can do the stop part so oh okay uh i'm just going to stop it let's see whether it will stop so yes i've stopped it over here okay key and in, keyboard interrupt because i don't want to go with 3500 uh, thousand epochs because i know that at one point of time this is really uh you know uh, uh what 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 is happening over here the accuracy is becoming almost same right so what do i do where do i stop exactly okay or let me just say that let's let's consider over here i'm just going to copy and paste some code okay and probably we'll try to plot it okay let's say whatever it has been trained till how many epochs like till 44 epochs right i'll just say that model dot history because this entire information will get captured over here so i'm going to say history dot history dot keys so there are some something called as keys right and when i execute this sorry model underscore history this right model underscore history right so here you can see model underscore history is not defined why no uh, model underscore history the spelling is wrong or what dot history dot keys okay i think we have not trained it uh, entirely so i think that value is there or not or let me just print model underscore history okay model in this case is not there because we have interrupted it right so we cannot definitely plot so what i will do is that i will add something very important and here is the concept of early stopping early stopping now early stopping what it does is that early stopping what it does is that it makes sure that when when the accuracy is not at all increasing automatically the training of the model will stop okay and that is what we are actually going to do with the help of early stopping now early stopping is uh I'll just go to my Keras documentation, okay, and I'll write early stopping Keras, okay. Now here you can basically see early stopping Keras, and just copy this entire thing. See, copy this entire thing with respect to minimum delta, patience, verbose, mode, uh, restore best weights, and all are there. So what I am actually going to do, I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to paste it over here, and I'm going to play with some values. So before that, I'm just going to say import tensorflow or uh, tensorflow as tf 
okay and basically this will basically be my early stopping early stopping variable okay and let me play with some of the values what does this early stopping say stop training when the monitored method metric has stopped improving okay when it stops getting improved it is automatically going to stop and it will be able to understand that at what epoch it basically stopped okay and we are going to play with this specific values like what should be my delta value what should be my other value that we can definitely play okay so let's say uh, i'm just going to put some values over here minimum delta let's see i'm, I'm just saying that okay this much should be my minimum delta the patients uh, you can check out each and every variable okay verbos i require one because i need to see all the details and probably i'm just going to execute in this way all i do execute this okay the early stopping has got executed the variable will get created this variable i want and i will just paste this variable over here where i can use one more parameter where i can say early stopping early underscore stopping okay sorry here what i'll say i'll say callback okay so callback is a function uh callback okay callbacks is a function okay where i can assign this early stopping okay when i assign this that basically means we are basically assigning or we are telling that you have to stop and you have to monitor this validation loss and you have to make sure that if it does not improve i'm just going to stop it over there so once i just update this callbacks and stopping and once i execute it now here you'll be able to see mm, classifier is not defined okay uh, let me do one thing quickly okay it, this is entirely uh, i think uh, this has got uh, entirely this you know the kernel has got restarted so i'm just going to execute it totally uh, quickly i'm going to execute this entire code just uh, give me a second and then you will be able to see the output so okay fine this has got executed um perfect this is also got executed then i'm going to apply this tensor flow okay perfect i'm just going to execute this opt compile and finally uh, let's go ahead and execute this code early stopping and then wherever i'm using callbacks i'm going to use this early stopping okay so once i execute this now my model training will start happening now here you can see that i have applied early stopping now let's focus on at what epoch it will just stop you know at what epoch it will basically stop okay now here you can see we have focused on the uh, validation loss right now validation loss if it does not improve much then it is automatically going to stop let's see at when it will stop okay i'm not stopping it already this will make sure that it'll get stopped okay so let's see how much time it will take let's see let's see how much time it will take and probably this will take some time at least for some number of epochs it is going to definitely get improved so here now still the accuracy is increasing in a better way and then it will stop automatically you see this now i know that it, this accuracy is not going to go more than 87 percent so whether it will be able to go or not we'll try to see okay so here you can see validation loss it is increasing and probably i think very we are very much near you know to stop the training itself let's see okay automatically the training will get stopped so we are in 30 epochs now you can see epoch 30 early stopping right so automatically this stopped the epoch 30 it has got stopped and now we are basically having 85 percent now what i can do i can basically execute model history and i can basically say dot history dot keys right so if i execute this you will be able to see what all parameters we have specifically focused on okay what all parameters we are specifically focused on okay sorry this is something wrong okay okay fine so here it is uh, model dot history dot keys and here you can see loss accuracy validation loss and validation accuracy now what i'm actually going to do uh, i'm basically going to just plot the summary for the history for accuracy so here you can see this is how my accuracy looks like 
and it looks good you know because this is the test accuracy that is increasing and that is maintaining train accuracy so this size is almost very less so this is the power of this uh, early stopping you know before this size increases you know before this this entire size increases it is going to stop and it is going to say that yes now your model is basically ready right and similarly what i can do is that i can basically uh, plot it for the loss itself and we will go ahead and plot it for the loss okay and uh, for the loss also you will be able to see that now we are able to get this training and test accuracy in a better way right so here you can definitely see everything uh, and this gap you can see from down to bottom down to up it has actually come so and it has basically stopped over there so through this way you can basically understand that how early stopping is actually done and how with the help of uh, this codes you know we can basically do these things right and uh, the next step obviously we'll try to do the prediction for the test data so let's go ahead and do the prediction for the test data for making the prediction i'm just going to copy some code and paste it over here right i'm just going to use this classifier.predict on x test and whenever the value is greater than 0.5 right greater than or equal to 0.5 i'm going to take it as one else i'm going to take it as zero okay and once i execute this I'm going to get true or false with respect to white thread. All now that I have to do is that construct or make the confusion matrix. Make the confusion matrix. Now, when I say make the confusion matrix, I can say from sklearn dot matrix. I'm going to import confusion matrix, right? And then finally, you will be able to see that I have CM is equal to nothing but confusion matrix and i'm going to basically say y underscore test comma y underscore spread right and finally you will be able to see cm now here you can see this is what is my confusion matrix now if i probably want to quickly calculate the accuracy so what i have to do so i will just say calculate the accuracy I will say from sklearn dot matrix i'm going to import the accuracy score and then i'm basically going to say score is equal to accuracy accuracy score and here i'm going to basically say y pred comma y test so okay sk learn sk learn okay oops okay perfect uh, so if i go and probably see my score i will be able to get some good accuracy let's see the 85 percent accuracy is basically here okay you may get somewhere around 86 87 and all now the one thing that i really wanted to talk about is that okay fine krish uh, uh, you have basically constructed such a big neural network and all where I can see the weights that is assigned with respect to each and every layer So that information also you can get get the weights Okay, and you can also store the weights as a pickle file, you know, and probably you can use it wherever you want to get the weights You want to store the weights you can also get it So what you can write is that you can just write classifier dot get weights, right? So if you execute this these are your weights value I'll use it as a function and these are all basically your weights value that you can basically get right and it will always be in the array format because there are so many layers and all right so based on that arrays will be there and this many weights just imagine parallelly how you are able to train this many weights right so just by seeing this that will not be sufficient you may not exactly get and all okay so uh this was it uh, now one thing that you can do is that i've also spoken about the dropout layer right now inside the dropout layer how do i add a dropout layer so here you can basically see that when you pinpoint over here right let's say where i'm pinpointing over here right import dense let's see whether we'll get an option or not because i really wanted to show you this or uh, let me open dense layer in keras okay dense layer in keras in keras uh, i think somewhere you will be able to see dropout layer um dropout 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 somewhere you can basically write it as dropout it's okay if you're not getting over here let's see over here can i write it down 
drop drop out if i say is equal to 0.3 right 0.3 something like this i think this should work or let me just execute it from starting so this gets executed this gets executed no keyword understood no dropout okay, fine let me just find out whether there is any dropout or not all well, i can see you some examples let's see um drop out i think i did this it's been very many days i guess i'm just going to see the documentation of uh, okay 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 got it got it got it i think i don't have to add it over here i can basically say classifier dot add something like this dropout okay dropout because this is a layer oops classifier dot add with respect to dropout is equal to 0.3 let's see whether this will get executed or not no still it is getting an error but i think this is what is the documentation saying mm. okay perfect i have to use this as a function dropout like 0.2 something like this okay it is working see so after every layer suppose if you write like this see um, i actually got this entire information from the documentation the documentation syntax always changes so please make sure that you keep on having a look so when you write tf.keras.layer.dropout as 0.2 you will be able to see this okay so here you can basically use dropout in every layer after every layer let's say over here are 20 percent over here 30 percent right over here 0.3 over here everything as such you will be able to write it down and then create it and then execute it then execute it then execute it and then do the fit again the same process will run and you will be able to get the early stopping and based on that it will be working fine right okay perfect you all are amazing okay uh so i hope you, you have got an idea till here uh you can also save the model by using pickling or the h5 format uh, and many things you can actually do do the prediction you do the scoring everything i've actually explained you okay now uh the one thing that you can basically do is that uh, i'll just open one more thing and let's talk about one two important things one is black blocks model black black box model versus white box now guys this black box versus white box model right it is quite important to understand if i say complex algorithm like random forest can anybody tell me or write down in the comment saying that which model this will be whether this is a black box or a white box if it is decision tree whether this is a black box or white box right so just tell me write down in the comment and basically see at what it is so this is basically a black box model this is actually a white box model right because here in decision tree whenever we use this kind of algorithm we can definitely see it so here i will say that okay this is my white box model okay and suppose if i say that okay let's let's discuss about what about a and n whether this is white box or black box this will also be a black box model right because obviously we cannot monitor and see all the weights it is very difficult uh we, it is very very difficult because we cannot just directly see how it is working in, internally right if i probably talk about xg boost how many decision trees are used this is also a kind of black box model right if i probably talk about linear regression that is fine linear regression we can definitely see many things uh and this becomes a white box model right so this becomes a white box model so internal working and all it is very difficult to check out in some of the algorithms because it is quite quite huge quite big you know and how internally how much it works because in random forest let's say we are, if we are taking 100 decision trees right 
it is very difficult to monitor each and everything and we cannot do that we cannot see each and everything clearly right whereas in the case of ann let's say cnn rnn right these all are very difficult so we we can see up to some level but definitely we can't see everything right so this is again another important and trivial question that everybody should know uh you know and because of that there is one amazing thing which is called as explainable ai this is also becoming very very popular because people want to come up with some kind of tool which will be able to monitor the model how the model is basically performing with respect to each and every input feature this thing is going on as a research okay and that is what uh, uh, we are going to see in the upcoming days like people are able to create some amazing explainable AI algorithm which will be able to monitor the uh, algorithms properly right so i hope you like this particular video i hope you like this session tomorrow we are going to cover cnn guys and uh, after that uh, let's conduct on the second or the third week we will try to cover nlp where we'll i'll be covering rnn okay so tomorrow i my main plan is to cover uh, uh, cnn and see one practical example uh, and yes in the next session we will be discussing about rnn and all and uh, yes i'll see you all in the next session have a great day i'll see you tomorrow where we'll be discussing about cnn uh, keep on rocking keep on learning and yes uh, have a great day ahead thank you one and all bye bye today uh, we are going to discuss about it and yes uh, you know we'll discuss in such a way that we'll try to first of all understand how does cnn work and then we'll try to do the implementation as you all know we have already discussed about ann now uh, we have seen the theoretical explanation right and then we also saw the practical part and uh, when we were discussing about optimizers uh, loss functions and all the things uh, in this but in today's session uh, in this session, we'll, we are going to discuss about CNN. Uh, CNN will focus on understanding what exactly is convolution neural network. Convolution neural network. And how specifically it works. Whenever we talk about convolution neural network, uh, we are basically going to mostly discuss about images and let's say video frames, right? So whenever we have images and probably we want to work with that, you know, uh, specifically related to you know different kind of images itself some of the tasks like image classification uh, object detection which we specifically used a different kind of CNN networks which are focused more on detecting objects in a specific uh, images or videos itself right so uh, as as usual the agenda will be that we will try to divide this entire topics in understanding First of all, uh, we'll try to understand about CNN versus human brain, okay? Because this is really in sync, like how human brain works. This entirely mimics that specific part and based on that, we'll be learning some internal amazing techniques that are included in CNN. If I talk about uh, second topic, first of all, we'll be discussing about convolution operation. Convolution operation. In this convolution operation, we are going to discuss about various various words uh, that I'm going to bring up over here, like uh, what is convolution, okay? What is padding? What is strides? Right? Uh, we will be discussing this, you know, and uh, how do we determine that how the output of a specific image will look like after we pass through these filters? This filters are also called something called as kernels okay so we'll also be discussing about this specific thing as we go ahead once we complete this two uh, then uh, we will be discussing about the third part which is called as max pooling and in max pooling uh, we will try to understand what is the importance of max pooling itself in the fourth topic we'll understand about the flattened layer which is again one amazing thing that happens in the final layer of the CNN itself. So we specifically call it as flattening. And in the fifth part, we are going to see the practical implementation. Okay, how do we implement the CNN? Okay, practical implementation. 
So these all things we are going to cover and we are going to cover and make sure that uh, we understand each and everything. Okay. Now, uh, this is the entire agenda of this session and we'll try to cover up all of these things. Okay. And uh, again, let's start with understanding CNN versus human brain, right? Versus human brain. Now, human brain always understand how does it work, you know? Like suppose I am seeing a specific object, okay? Suppose let's say that I am seeing a cat, okay? I am seeing a cat or let's say in a specific image, right? I may have various objects. I may have cat, I may have dog, okay? I may have a bicycle, okay? I may bicycle, I may have a car and I may have a human being, okay? Now, in this specific image, let's say that we have so many things over here, right? Now, specifically as a human being, right? When I am specifically seeing an object, right? I may find out many things, right? I may see a person moving. I may see an animal over there. I may see a bird flying. So many details is getting processed in my brain itself, right? And because of that, because of that processing, I'm able to understand a lot of things. The major part of the brain, which we specifically call as cerebral cortex, right? The cerebral cortex, which is in the backside of this brain, in this backside, you know, and in this part only, you know, there is a place, what uh, there is a part of this specific brain, which we uh, call it as visual cortex, okay? Visual cortex, which is specifically responsible for seeing uh, uh, any items that are there, any objects that are there in a specific image or in a video, okay? Now, this visual cortex, may it may have many layers, okay? Suppose, let's say that if I probably talk about this visual cortex, it may have layers like, let me name this layer at V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and let's say V7. I'm just, I'm just creating some layers, you know, like this, there may be many layers, but I'm just going to define some of the layers like this. Now, as soon as this input passes through each and every layer, you know, let's say this layer is responsible in understanding or in, in, in basically seeing the moving objects. So when it passes through this layer, we will be able to determine that, okay, fine, there is some moving object that is going on. Then when we go to the next layer over here, right? Let's say over here, we are able to, we, we are able to understand some of the animals, right? Like cat, dog or something, right? So over here, we'll be able to understand some of the animals, you know, when then as it passes through this layer and goes to the V3 layer, let's say, and this is responsible for doing some other task, you know, we, here we are able to map the environment, let's say some functionalities map the environment right you are able to visualize the entire environment so something is happening in each and every layer you know and finally all this information when it is passed we will be able to visualize this specific image over here in this v7 layer which is the part of visual cortex okay so by this you are able to finally find out the output over here after so many processing right similarly if I talk about convolution neural network, right, it should be also able to do this many number of different kind of processing. But now the thing rises is that how we can make sure that probably whatever CNN we are trying to develop, it should also be able to do all this kind of task. Okay, so let's go ahead and understand. So the first thing with respect to CNN, when when I probably discuss about CNN, no, we will divide this into multiple steps. The first step of operation, which is called as convolution. Now, what exactly is convolution? Before we go ahead and understand about convolution, we need to understand some of the basic information about the images, right? So what are specifically images, right? What are images? Suppose you click your photo, right? Let's say this is your photo, okay? And it has specific some kind of pixels, let's say. So let's say that this is a photo. And whenever you have a photo, there are two types of focus. One is black and white and one is RGB type. And the other one is something called as RGB type. In black and white, you just have a single channel. Okay. That basically means your, your entire photo will either be 
mostly the component of a black color or a white color something like that okay so here in in black and white in this right you just have a single channel one channel okay and whenever we divide this images we divide by some kind of pixels let's say if i probably create this kind of line right so over here let's say one two three four five so in the width and height let's say there are five different different pixels okay so let's say if i want to probably call this image it will be five cross five pixel image okay and here each and every pixel will be ranging between 0 to 255 right if i specifically talk about mostly zero is nothing but it is a black color okay so let's say zero is a black color and 255 is actually a white color let's say okay white color so all these values if your value is ranging between 0 to 255 so every pixel may have different different values based on the image composition right over here you may probably have 40 over here you may have 0 here you may have 255 here you may have uh, 240 here you may have 17 like this each and every values are there right so this is basically called as a 5 cross 5 pixel image and in each pixel your value will be ranging between 0 to 255 in a single channel now with respect to a rgb image which is a colored image okay so suppose if i probably consider an rgb image now how does an rgb image look like here let's say we will be having three channels one is the r channel the r channel and this is basically the colored image you know whenever probably you click from your mobile phone or from some dslr camera you know you always get that specific image in the form of rgb format because every color combination can be created with the help of this rgb image that is red green blue right so suppose let's say this is my r channel and uh, with respect to the other thing i may also have a green channel so suppose this is my green channel so i may create something like this this is my green channel okay this is my green channel okay so this is my green channel let's say okay and on, on top of it you may also have another channel which is like a blue channel so suppose i go and pick a blue color let's see where is blue color somewhere like this right so this is my blue color so this blue will be another channel right so whenever i have this kind of combination then what will happen <clears throat> over here let's say this is five cross five let's say this is five cross five one two three four five right and similarly i have one two three four five right so whenever you have this five cross five pixels here also it will be five cross five right so any image that you are going to take is that you're going to combine this rgb right this will be your r channel that is red channel this will be your green channel this will be a blue channel and when it combines it can basically come up with some kind of format okay and here also your values will again be ranging between 0 to 255 with respect to each and every channel and when you combine them then the combination that you are actually going to get you'll be getting it in different colors okay so this is with respect to rgb format and suppose if i want to represent this in the form of pixel format i will basically write 5 cross 5 cross 3 channel okay because they are three channel this is my r channel this is my green channel and this is my blue channel right so red green blue red green green and blue channel okay so these are my red green blue channel so i hope i i you got the difference in understanding the black and white image versus the rgb image okay so this is the basic information you really need to understand okay now if i go to the next step let's let's talk about this convolution layer so what exactly happens in a convolution layer and later on i'll show you an example with respect to a single uh, black and white image and also with respect to a rgb image so if i go over here and probably take up this convolution operation now in convolution operation what happens is that and this is the first step with respect to a convolution neural network let's say you have an image and this is my specific image and here i have values let's say how many number of channels i have okay so let me just create this three 
four, five, six, right? So here also you have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So this is my six cross six image, okay? Six cross six image. Now, when this is basically a six cross six image, what we are actually going to do is that we are going to pass it through a filter. Okay. We are going to pass it through a filter. And this filter will be three cross three. Let's say one, two, three. Right. Let's say that this is my six, three cross three filter. Here you can say this has filter also or this has kernel also. Okay. This has filter or this has kernel also. And finally, you get some kind of output. And let's say that this is a 4 cross 4 output. I'll tell you why we are getting a 4 cross 4 output, why you are getting a 6 cross 6 output, and all. 2, 3, 4. Okay. Now, whenever you do this convolution operation, convolution, let's say we are doing this kind of symbol we are getting, and we are getting this specific as an output. Okay. Now, let's say this is my 6 cross 6 image, and let me put some values. You know that. Whenever we try to put some values with respect to the image pixels, you know that it will be ranging between 0 to 255, right? Now, in convolution, what we do is that if I really want to convert this into 0 to, let's say that this is my values like this, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, okay? So these are my values, let's say, and these all are 255, okay? Always remember the first step that we do in a convolution is that we try to bring this all values between 0 to 1, okay? If I'm trying to bring these values between 0 to 1, then what it will happen? I will divide each number by 255. So over here, if 255 is there, I'll make sure that this all will get converted to 1. This we basically say it as min-max scaling, okay? Min-max scaling. So this process is actually called as min-max scaling. Okay, min max scaling. Now in min max scaling, what we are doing is that we are just trying to convert all the values of the pixels between zero to one. Okay, super important. And this is the step that we are also going to see. Okay, so here you can see one, two, three, four, five. Okay, one more value. I will just, uh, one more row. I will just try to put it over here. So this will be my lines. Okay, zero, 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 one, one. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And uh, so you have actually got this much idea that what I have done is that my first step, I've done a max scaling. So whatever pixels are there, I'm going to basically convert this into zero to one. Okay. Let's say that I have a specific filter over here and this filter, what I'm actually going to uh, put the values like is that I will just write one, two, one. I'll talk about it. Why I'm putting this specific filter like this zero, zero, zero minus one minus two minus one let's say that i put this specific filter this filter is actually called as something called as horizontal edge detector or horizontal edge filter let's say i'm just saying this as horizontal edge filter now i hope you have got an idea with respect to this so what i have done is that i've given six cross six uh, uh, image i've passed it through a convolution filter Sorry, I passed it through a filter which is 3 cross 3 with these values, which I specifically say this as my con horizontal edge filter. And finally, the output that I'm actually getting, I'm getting it over here. And this is actually 4 cross 4. Okay. And this is spe specifically my output. Okay. And what kind of output we will get that I'll try to discuss. Okay. Now, let's try to understand how this convolution operation happens. Convolution operation, what it says is that I will take this filter and I will just place it in top of top of this specific image from left from the starting. Let's say that I've taken this filter and I'm placing it over here. So I'm placing it like this. I'm placing it like this on top of it. I'm placing it over here on top of it. Now when I place it over here, when I place it over here, what will happen? What will happen? The first operation that I'm actually going to do, I will take this value and wherever it is placed to that same, same row or same cell, right? Suppose this cell is there and I've actually put this three cross three filter over here. 
so over here this value and this value will get multiplied so if it get multiplied it is like 1 multiplied by 0 so i'm going to get 0 okay then i'm going to add the next value so this value will get multiplied with this so this will also become 0 and similarly one will also become 0 and like this all the values will become 0 in the first instance when i'm placing this specific filter and whenever we add up this value whatever is the final output we will place it over here okay so this is the first operation so i hope uh, you are getting a clear idea about it okay so what we are doing over here we are just place this convolution filter with this filter or kernel on top of it we are multiplying each cell with that cell and then we are adding up all the values right now after this what we do is that we move one step to the right we move one step to the right whenever we move one step to the right there is a variable which is called as stride we specify the stride variable as one if you are jumping two steps to the right then we will basically make stride is equal to two but here we are jumping just one position to the right so one position to the right the stride will be one now what will happen my filter this filter will start moving from here to here right now when it moves from here to here then what will happen again do the calculation my calculation will start one multiplied by let's say uh, my calculation will start for the second instance okay one multiplied by zero so it will be zero plus two multiplied by zero it will be zero one multiplied by one so it will be one plus zero multiplied by zero it will be zero then again zero zero then over here if we go over here it will be minus one minus two this both will get multiplied and to this also it will be 0 0 and finally i'll have minus 1 multiplied by 1 it will be minus 1 right so here also what i will be getting my total value will actually be 0 okay so i hope you are getting an idea about it then what we will do we'll again jump one step to the right after this because i have to go and take the next pixel of the information over here and here we go with respect to this now when i jump one step to the right then what will happen over here like i will be jumping at this position to this position and again the same operation will happen the third operation again if you try to see everything should be equal to zero most probably because see if i multiply this so zero then this will be two then this will be one then all will be zero over here and then over here you have minus two and minus one so if i try to calculate it it will be minus 2 and minus 1 so this will entirely become 0 so the next operation will also become 0 and finally when you continue you'll be getting this kind of values like 0 0 0 and after that after that when you probably see this you will be getting a value like minus 4 minus 4 minus 4 minus 4 and minus 4 minus so you can do the calculation guys and this will be 0 0 that basically means after we finally go to the next step then my next stride will move towards this position and again it will do the calculation again i'll get jump uh, it will become zero over here and after this what we do we go one step towards downwards so from here to here will be my next step and we will continue this particular step from here and then we'll do the calculation here you will be able to see that i'll be able to get minus four for the same thing okay so i hope you are getting an idea about it and you are able to understand some kind of calculation that we have actually done over here okay so this is very much clear till here i guess uh, and you are able to understand things okay and uh, definitely you can do this entire calculation and you can try to find out okay so if you move one step towards down then again one more step if you move towards down and if you do the calculation you will be getting some values like this let's say that i have got the output which looks like this okay so i hope everybody is clear with respect to this specific output and uh, you are able to understand it let's say that i have got this specific output okay now this operation is specifically called as convolution okay this operation is specifically called as convolution now whenever we are giving filter uh, can be one more thing guys filter we'll talk about it right i have just initialized a horizontal edge filter okay now let's say that when we got this specific output one thing that you see over here i'm just going to rub this now one thing you see over here when i pass a six cross six filter two or three cross three filter i am getting a four cross four filter okay yes guys i think uh, this will also be zero okay 
let's say this also I'm getting it as zero. Okay, let's say that I'm getting these values as if I do this operation, then automatically this will become zero. Uh, this will also become zero. Uh, this will also become zero. See, do the calculation. Okay, whatever value you get. Okay, let's consider. I'm just saying that. Okay, let's consider over here that I'm getting these values. Let's let's just imagine. Okay, I'm getting these values. Okay, I'm getting these values by passing through this. Let's let's just consider. Okay. I know this value will become zero or it can be anything else. You know, I'm just saying that let's consider. Okay. Because I want to give you a very important point by putting this. Okay. Uh, how uh, we will be getting minus four or whatever values you may be getting. Okay. Or do one thing. If you don't want to do, go ahead with this, you know, change the filter. Okay. What I will do is that I will try to make a new filter over here. Okay. Let's say that I've got this new filter. Okay. And let's say this is my three cross three matrix. Okay. And uh, let's me see. They say that, okay, I have this specific filter. Minus one, minus two, minus one. Okay. So let's say I have this specific filter. And let's start the operation from again. Okay. Let's say, and this filter is basically called as vertical edge detector. Let me just rub it. Okay. And let me pass this filter. Now, when I pass this specific filter, and I will be getting a four cross four output. Okay. One, two, three, four. Okay. Now do the calculation, everyone. What will happen? First time, everything will become zero, right? Second time, uh, if I go one step to the right, then it will become minus four, minus one, minus two, minus one. When I add this up, it will become minus four. Then again, when we go to the one step to the right, okay, then, then again, I'll be getting minus four and then this will become zero. And similarly, this will happen for every row. Just do the calculation and let me know whether you are able to get it or not. Okay. So this kind of values we are actually getting. Okay. Very simple. When I place from here, I go one step towards the right. Similarly, I go one step towards the right and I do the convolution operation. You will be able to get this. Okay. So this is basically called as vertical edge filter. Edge filter or kernel. Okay. So this is my vertical edge filter or kernel. Okay. So I hope everybody is able to get this. Okay. How to choose the filter values and all, I'll just explain. Let's say that there is this specific filter, which is already defined. And whenever I pass this filter to this, I'm going to get vertical edges, some or the other way. Now, one very important thing with respect to the output. You know that if I again, rechange these values, because you know that we had done feature scaling over here, right? If I do back, I, if, if I revert back the feature scaling, then what will happen? This minus four, minus four, minus four will definitely become zero. If I'm reverting back, then obviously I should be getting between zero to 255, right? So if I revert back, then this minus four, minus four, minus four, minus four, minus four will actually become, okay, will actually become 255. I hope everybody agrees that, right? This will become 255, sorry. This will become zero right this will become zero why because this was minus four the lowest value will get converted to zero and the highest value will get converted to 255 i hope everybody remembers this how we do it feature scaling right so this will entirely become this will entirely become 255 okay so if i do back the feature scaling this all will become zero and this will become 255 because the highest value was zero and the lowest value was minus four. So if we bring back the min max scalar, if we apply the min max scalar again, what is going to happen? The smaller value will become zero and the larger value will become 255. Now 255 is nothing but it is a white color. 255 is nothing but it is a white color, right? 
so i hope everybody knows about it so 255 is nothing but white color right and zero is nothing but black color now when i have this that basically means this entire thing is black color right zero and 255 is white color so how do i get this if i probably try to draw this in the form of a diagram right it will look something like this so this will be my white color and this remaining all will be my black color so this will be my white color and this will all be my black color right so this is nothing but this is my vertical edge vertical edge so in this specific image so in this specific image you know that zeros and ones are there obviously i should be getting a vertical i should be getting a vertical edge in between that and after passing this filter i am able to get a vertical edge that you can see from here right from this specific example and this filter is responsible for doing that it is responsible for getting the vertical edges right so from here you can see as soon as i pass this filter i am able to get the vertical edges so what does this basically mean here i discussed about my various layers right v1 v2 v3 v4 v5 v6 v7 similarly we have created a layer over here which is able to extract some information now in this particular case with the help of this filter i am able to extract where are my vertical edges right so this process is basically called as a convolution operation similarly i may have various different kind of filters i may have a horizontal filter i may have a uh, i may have another filter like this with th and this filter will be also 3 cross 3 let's say and this will be able to determine my horizontal edge there will be one more filter let's say which will be able to determine my round objects let's say okay so i may have multiple kind of filters over here you know this filters is basically like what what we are doing it's just like this information we are trying to extract it from the image with the help of this filters we are just trying to extract the information of this specific image right so i hope you are able to understand till here right now in a specific image whenever we are performing convolution neural network we can have multiple filters like this and we will also be getting multiple outputs like this okay so like this multiple outputs we will be getting okay like how we got over here for horizontal filter we may get a different output we for round shape filter we may get a different outputs from a specific image okay now you need to understand some very important things whenever i pass a 6 cross 6 image in a 3 cross 3 filter i'm getting an output as 4 cross 4 right whenever i take a 6 cross 6 image i pass it through a 3 cross 3 filter i get an output as 4 cross 4 right how this is basically happening right so over here let's say the size of the image is given by n so n is equal to 6 okay n is equal to 6 let's say the filter is nothing but 3 right so if my n size is 6 and filter is 3 what will be my output image so here you can use a mathematical formula the mathematical formula will be n minus f plus 1 so when you use this n minus f plus 1 it is nothing but 6 minus 3 plus 1 which is nothing but 6 minus 4 which is nothing but sorry which is nothing but 3 plus 1 which is nothing but 4 so finally you are getting a 4 cross 4 output okay now you may be having a confusion krish how do we define these filters you don't have to define it guys i'll talk about it just in some time here you don't have to even do any kind of hard coding or you i'm here i'm just giving an example what filters can actually do filters can actually take out the information from the specific image okay how do we define this filter i'll just say you in some time okay but here you understand that you have applied this formula and i have got 3 plus 1 is equal to 4 and that that is what my output is right that is what my output is, right now a very important question what is happening see if i give a 6 cross 6 image to a convolution operation i'm getting a 4 cross 4 value output here my image size is decreasing and this should not happen if my image size decreases that basically means we are losing some kind of information now in order to prevent this loss what we can actually do we can come up with something called as padding now what exactly is padding padding says that do not do anything if my image size is 6 cross 6 i want to get the same output over here like 6 cross 6 
All you have to do is that apply padding on top of it. So how do I apply padding? Padding is just like building a compound, uh, building a compound around the images. Let's say I'm building a, one more additional compound on this specific image, on this specific image, on this specific image like this. Now, when I build this compound, when I build this specific compound, then what will happen? When I build this specific compound, what will happen? So if I build this compound, here you'll be able to see that I'm actually getting a 8 cross 8 image. My image size is 6 cross 6 only. But now it becomes an 8 cross 8 image. Okay, now it becomes an 8 cross 8 image. But my image size is anyhow 6 cross 6. Okay. But since I'm applying padding, this, this concept of applying a layer on top of the image is called as padding. Padding basically means that I am protecting the image by adding another layer on top of it. Okay. Now you may be thinking what values can come inside this specific cell. This is a question that many people may have. For this, you can have different kind of paddings. One kind of padding is that zero padding. Just go ahead and fill this cell by zeros. Okay, just go ahead and fill this cell by zeros. The other kind of padding is that whatever is the nearest value, you try to put that. Okay, like suppose I'm trying to pad or put some values over here. The nearest value is one. So I'll try to put one over here. Okay, I may put also one over here, one over here. Now, if I apply the same operation, what will happen? See, my image size initially was six, but after applying padding, it became eight, right? It became eight now. So 8 minus, this is after padding, 8 minus 3 plus 1 is equal to, what is this value? This is nothing but, 8 minus 3 is nothing but 5, 5 is nothing but output will be 6. So finally, you will be seeing that I will be able to get one more additional layer and this additional layer will actually create a 6 cross 6 image. It will create a 6 cross 6 image. It will create a 6 cross 6 image. Okay, so this will actually now become a 6 cross 6 image. This is what we wanted, right? This is what we wanted. And what will be this values that will be coming up based on the calculation, whatever we get through these filters, we are going to get that. And remember, we will be starting our again filtering operation from here, convolution operation from here. And then we will be crossing this entirely. And finally, I'll be getting a 6 cross 6 output. Okay. So what will be now my updated formula? My updated formula will be now like this. N plus 2P minus f plus 1. So what will be my initial size of the image? 6, right? How much layer of padding I am actually doing? 1 padding, right? I did 1 padding for this, 1 padding for this. So I am writing p is equal to 1. What is my filter size? It is nothing but 3. And here, if I try to put all these values, so it will become 6 plus 2 minus 3 plus 1. It is nothing but 6 plus 2 is 8, 8 minus 3 is 5, 5 plus 1 is nothing but 6. So finally, I'm actually getting six as my output and this will be the output of this specific image. Okay. So a very important interview question. What is the importance of padding to prevent the information loss of the image? We basically apply different kind of padding techniques. Okay. So this is with respect to convolution operation. I hope everybody is clear. The main thing is that I'm just trying to extract some information. Now, a very important thing again, very, very, very important. As many people said, or many people may have a confusion saying that, Krish, why did you hard code these values? And in a real world problem statement, do we need to hard code these specific values? Okay. The answer is no. You don't need to hard code this. Like how in ANN, how in ANN, let's say how in ANN we create a neural network like this. I have my hidden layer and I have my output layer, right? I have my output layer, right? In this, we assign weights, right? And in the back propagation, we, we update this weights. So in CNN also, you also have to make sure that 
you update the filters based on the input so we need to update this filter values okay initially let's say that we have initialized some filter randomly okay initially we have initialized some filter randomly but through back propagation again like how we did in the case of ann we also have to update this filters based on the input image because every image will be different right every image can be a black and white it can be rgb it can be of different different types right so with the help of back propagation i need to update this filters but now still the question uh, uh, comes that how back propagation will actually happen we have still not used any kind of activation function so where do we specifically use the activation function after this convolution operation guys whenever we get the output on top of this for each and every value we apply a relu activation function i hope everybody knows the importance of relu activation function relu activation function is nothing but max comma 0 comma x right so i hope everybody remembers this so on each and every value we apply a relu activation function now the question is that why do we why are we applying relu activation function because you know that relu activation function during the back propagation the derivative can be found out right the derivative can be found out now since we can find out the derivative relu activation function or other activation function like pre relu can definitely get applied over here because in the back propagation we will be updating this all kind of filter values when we have all the values over here and we apply relu activation function on top of it you will be able to do the back propagation and you will be able to find out the derivatives and similarly you will be able to update this filter values so i hope i am super clear with respect to this one important thing i told you about stride right now if what if my stride becomes two your stride can also become two right i can jump two steps i can also jump two steps while doing the convolution operation will this create an impact in my output yes definitely it can create an impact in your output so now my updated formula it will not be just like this but it will be divided by s s basically means stride okay so if my s is 1 i did not write this but if my s is 2 this will definitely create an impact with respect to my output okay so is it clear guys with respect to convolution operation i have covered convolution padding stride everything and the formula what is the use of this relu activation function everything so this was with respect to convolution operation now let's go ahead and understand the next operation which is called as max pooling so like this this convolution we can have horizontally stacked right so what all things we have in the convolution neural network quickly let me just write it down so i have a specific image let's say some image over here 4 cross 4 1 2 3 4 this will also be 4 cross 4 this will get passed this will get passed to another filter okay and based on this any filter it can be i will be getting an output right so this entire thing along with the relu activation function is basically my convolution operation convolution operation and this entire thing can be stacked together so this will be my one convolution operation and after that in my cnn i may have another convolution operation similarly like this right and over here i can have any number of filters i can have any number of filters i like okay this you need to understand and our main aim in the convolution operation is that we need to learn from these filters we need to learn and update based on the input images based on the input images we need to learn from it okay so i hope you are able to get the idea about it and you are able to understand over here okay okay now let's go to the second one which is called as max pooling now what exactly is max pooling max pooling okay after a convolution operation there is something called as max pooling layer okay and i will show you in uh, images also how it will look like over here just try to understand the crux 
understand the keywords that I'm specifically using, right? This will all actually help you to understand in a better way. Okay. Now, filters can be selected in different, different ways. You can have a five cross five filter. You can have a seven cross seven filter. You know, you can have a three cross three filter. This is all like kind of hyperparameter tuning. Later on in the upcoming classes, I will probably take uh, one more live session. There I'll discuss about transfer learning. Okay. Now in the max pooling layer, what happens in a specific max pooling layer? Let's say this is my input. Let's say I have three cats. So this is my cat one. This is my cat two. Okay. I hope you like my diagram and this is my cat three. Okay. Let's say this is my image uh, with respect to a cat. And then my first operation is basically my convolution operation where I start pass through a filter or kernel. I get my output over here. Let's say I'm getting an output over here. Okay. This output and after the output, we apply a ReLU activation function. So this entire operation is my convolution. So that basically means I'm applying this and I'm getting this. So this is my convolution operation. Okay. Now, after this, what can we have? We can have multiple convolution layer also. But again, I've seen a lot of uh, transfer learning techniques where they have used another layer, which is called as max pooling. So here I'm just going to define something like this. Okay. And this layer is basically called as max pooling layer. I'll talk about max pooling layer. Let's say after this convolution operation, I applied the ReLU and I probably got a three cross three output with some values. I'm just going to initialize values. So don't worry that how did I take up? Let's say that this is a three cross three and I've got some pixel values like this. One, two, three, four, uh, five, seven, zero, three, five, right? So let's say this, this is my this. Let's say I'm using a max pulling of two cross through. Now what, why exactly max pooling is used? Now see guys, here I have three cats, right? Here I have three cats, okay? And when I apply a operation, filter operation, let's say from this images, I'm able to see the rounded eyes and probably I'll be having another filters also for vertical edges, horizontal edges and all. Now some information I'm able to extract, okay? From this particular, particular filter. Let's say I may have any number of filters as we go ahead, okay? But I'm just focusing over here. Okay. Now there is a concept which is called as location invariant. Now what does location vari invariant says that invariant location invariant says that let's say there are multiple objects in the images. My convolutional neural network till it goes ahead towards the next neural next next layer itself, it should be ex able to extract more and more clear information. Okay, more and more clear information. So location invariant basically says that my objects may be present anywhere, but as we pass from many convolution layers, I should be able to extract the information more in a better, in a clear way, right? And for that, we specifically use something called as max pooling. Now in max pooling, what it does is that, let's say, how do I extract much more clear information? Now, how does this information look like? When I apply max pooling, max pooling says that, okay, I'm just going to place on top of it. And let's say what, and there are different types of max pooling layer. There is something called as average max pooling. Let's say there is something called as average pooling. There is something called as min pooling. And this is my third type, which is called as max pooling. Okay. Let's say in this particular scenario, I'm using this max pooling. Now max pooling, what it says is that I'm just going to place this on top of the output over here. And what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to basically get an output. And this output will only be focusing on the biggest number, the most clear or the highest number over here, which is the highest number over here. Clearly, you can see that five is the highest number. So I'm going to take this information only 
and update it over here that basically means one of the cat eyes is clearly visible so i'm just going to pick up that information and put it over here okay then i'm just going to jump to the next stride right in the next stride what i'm actually going to do i'm going to basically jump like this and basically take up the next one from this the highest value that i'm actually going to get is seven let's say then i'm going to jump next downwards in this direction let's say in this direction and this direction and i'm going to basically see that which is the highest value so over here also i'm going to get uh, probably three and over here i'm going to get five so the most specific and the clear information i definitely want it from this okay so what i'm actually specifically doing and over here guys one more thing that you need to really understand is that here i'll make a stride of jump two okay stride of jump two not stride of jump one let's say initially stride was here i got the value as five my next jump will be a two-step jump so my next one will be starting from here and it will be ending like this and out of this i have my highest value as seven then similarly i will make a stride two jump downwards so this will be my next one from this i know which is my highest value three and then i will again make a stride jump of two and when it comes over here whatever value is highest i'll be getting it so here i am actually trying to specifically take up the most important information out of the output that i'm i've got from this specific filter okay and this basically solves the problem of location invariance that basically means if i have multiple objects also and if one of my filter is able to determine that particular object it will be able to clearly pick up from that okay so i hope everybody is able to understand till here and i hope everybody is understood about the max pooling right now suppose i want to use some other pooling let's say average pooling in average pooling nothing will happen we will just try to find out the average of all these values and similarly in min pooling what we are going to find out we are going to find out the minimum values now based on different different problem statement we can play with either of this pooling layer okay we can either use max pooling we can either use min pooling we can either use average pooling okay so finally you get this and uh, with respect to different different filter operation again i may get another two cross two over here with some values let's say like seven nine two one then another filter will actually able to give me some other values like six five three one right so all these values that i'm actually getting like this okay what i'm actually going to do now this is the end of the max pooling layer and again convolution and max pooling layer is used as a combination we can stack it horizontally any number of times based on different different neural neural net okay different different neural net now what will happen after this after this there is an amazing layer because finally we get this output right everyone then after this we have something called as flattening layer now flattening layer is pretty much simple because this will actually look like an ann dense layer only ann dense layer now whatever inputs whatever outputs i get from this max pooling i am just going to make it straight forward flattened flattened basically means i will just go i'll just pick up this entire filter and i'm just going to elongate it like an input like how we give input to a ann right like that we are going to flatten it so my 5735 will get elongated to something like this it will become 5735 and this will basically get elongated which looks like this okay then the next filter value that i'm going to get 7921 that will also get attached to this so now my 7921 will also get attached over here right similarly i'm going to flatten this entire all the filter outputs and i'm going to combine it over here okay this is basically called as a flattening layer i'm just flattening it i'm just elongating it and now this becomes an input to my dense layer then you go and create a fully neural network connected layer and how many number of outputs you have suppose if i'm doing an image classification of cat or dog this will get connected like this like this like this like this and again you know this process we apply an activation function relu activation function over here it will become something like this and this will get connected this will this will all the information will be going to this all the neural networks okay and finally i will be able to do this image classification in this specific way in short 
what all things we did let's say this is my convolution operation convolution operation then i went to my max pooling layer max pooling this convolution operation has what all things convolution padding applying filters everything happens inside this then after the max pooling layer what we specifically do we provide it to the next stage which is called as flattening layer and then we create a ann or fully connected neural network and finally i get my output right so these are my entire steps so i'm just going to open this browser everyone see over here if i probably try to go and click on images now you see over here right this is my image okay probably you will be able to see over here very clearly let's say again this i have taken from google see this convolution pooling convolution pooling convolution pooling then flattening then fully connected layer right so this way you will be able to see you can also see other other examples convolution non linearity max pooling fully connected layer and classification right so we give this image each and every pixels gets passed all the information is basically getting extracted similarly here also you can see this is my input image i pass it through a convolution then i basically got the filters output then what we did we did applied another convolution layer then we got a fully connected layer you know and then finally we got an output so like this kind of operations you will be able to see see here also this image we applied two convolution layer then we applied a max pooling red color is max pooling layer then you can see that we have got another convolution layer then again we applied a max pooling then we applied convolution layer three three times convolution layer uh, then we got a max pooling then convolution max pooling convolution then finally fully connected layer fully connected layer and fully connected layer right by default max pooling layer through the code is basically taking two so guys did you understand whatever i explained with respect to all the cnn neural network can i get a quick yes if you have able to understand now we will try to do one practical example yes so what i want you all to do is that just go and search for uh tensorflow images cnn just search for tensorflow cnn like this just go and search for tensorflow cnn and here you will be able to see the first over here an example over here okay okay now you cannot determine one thing is that how many layers you can actually use okay so there you need to understand from the transfer learning people play with different kind of layers there is a image net competition where people focus on understanding that how many layers needs to be used now just go and click on run in google collab once you search this convolution neural network go and click on run in google collab and here use your specific output automatically when the traversing of the entire images will complete you will get uh, the image traversing will get complete that time the stri stride will stop moving okay so here is my tensorflow connected and i'm going to change the run time to gpu save connect it okay so here you can see that what all things we have actually done okay for this um max pooling is specifically related to extracting more information from a specific image okay so as usual uh, i'm going to import tensorflow tensorflow keras i'm going to use dataset layers and models what kind of dataset we are going to use we are going to use cifar images dataset so if you click on this cifar images has what all things it has this all kind of images like airplane automobile bird cat deer dog so we are going to classify whenever we get this kind of images we are going to classify them okay now let's go ahead and let's quickly execute so here first step i'm just going to execute the tensorflow part it will get executed let's see how much time yes it has got executed now let's download and prepare the cifar 10 dataset this dataset contains 60000 color image in 10 classes with 6000 images in each class the dataset is dividing into 50 50000 training and test 10000 as test image this classes are mutually exclusive and there is no overlap between them fine we know all these things uh, 
and then we are going to basically say training images training label training test Im images and labels okay as i said we need to normalize the values to between 0 to 1 in the first stage we have already discussed this while explaining the theoretical part we will normalize it and we'll always make it between 0 to 1 so all we are doing is that the training and the test image we are dividing it by 255.0 if the pixels are 255 it will become 0 uh, sorry 1 otherwise it will become 0 if the values are 0 pixels okay so I'm just going to execute this and automatically this data set will get downloaded from this particular library datasets.cifar10.load data okay so you can just execute this quickly get it and here you can see that I have downloaded all the data set from using this specific uh, example okay now verifying the data set to verify the data set let's plot the first 25 image from the training set so we are just plotting it that is the reason we use matplotlib I don't think I need to explain you this because you already may be knowing matplotlib okay so here what we are doing based on the class names we are plotting it and I'm taking the training labels and first 25 image whatever I get I'm just plotting it over here so once I execute this you will be able to see that I'm able to get the first 25 images which looks like frog truck truck deer automobile automobile bird horse ship cat deer horse 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 everything i'm actually being able to get okay then let's go ahead and create a convolution neural network now see this guys this is super important super easy if you are focusing away you'll be able to understand in the ann also we first of all initialize our models with sequential right so in this also we will definitely first let me see that whether i have uh, okay layers models has been imported fine so we have to again initialize with a sequential layer and then we will be using model.add layers.con2d convolution layer right now in convolution layer this 32 okay this 32 will basically be my um, uh, number of filters okay 32 over here the first parameter that you see right it will be number of filters so that basically means we are going to use 32 filters and this filters are nothing but three cross three size okay each and every filter will be three cross three size but how many total number of filters that we are actually going to use it is nothing but 32 okay and you know that after the convolution operation i need to apply my activation function as relu so i have applied an activation function as relu and this is super important like what kind of input image we are giving as i said that my input image okay will be basically in a rgb format if it is in a rgb format this basically indicates that my input image is 32 cross 32 pixels multiplied by three channel okay so here you can basically see the three channel so it is nothing but 32 cross 32 cross three uh, uh, based on the three channels itself and then i'm going to basically add max pooling layer so after the convolution layer i'm going to add some max pooling max pooling layer 2d layer basically like two cross two matrix okay so it will be a filter of two cross two and similarly i will go and add my another convolution then again apply an activation function then again i can apply a max pulling layer with two cross two then again i am applying a activation con convolution layer over here i am specifically using 64 as filters now you may be thinking krish how do you decide this number of filters okay see guys there is no such thing that you can decide or you can do you can write any filters over here but it is a proper research that usually happens with filters filters are just like kind of hyper parameter like how many filters you want to basically solve a specific problem if you try to see in some of the state of art algorithms right in convolution neural network there you'll be seeing different different number of filters so no such specific thing yes you can try with different different hyper parameter you can use 32 64 you can use the combination of different different filter and see how the performance is increasing right other than that most of the time for different kind of tasks like image classification object detection we basically use the state of art algorithm okay so i'm just going to execute this so this basically means that i have three convolution layer and one ma uh, two max pooling layer just stacked horizontally finally if you go and click on model dot summary you'll be able to see the entire summary see it starts with convolution 2d layer it takes an input of 30 cross 30 the filters are 32 then we go with 15 cross 15 then the this is 32 then total number of parameters this is basically defining and this parameters even counts the parameter inside the filters okay 
So by this specific way, you are able to see the entire summary of the model, like how the model is actually created. Now till after this, I told you, right? After we finish up this, you know, we can have a flattening layer. Now is the flattening layer defined? Here you can see that model dot layer, layer dot flatten. So whatever we had over here, we are just going to flatten this entire layer and we are going to add it over here. And then I'm going to add a fully connected neural network with 64 dense neurons. And the total number of output in my data set is 10. So I'm specifically writing layer dot dense of 10. So this is my output layer and this is my hidden layer, right? The ANN layer, which has 64 neurons. And this is basically my flattening process. And I've just written layers dot flatten. That's it. Whatever is coming after the convolution layer, we are just going to flatten it and we are going to use it. Okay. So once we execute this, you will be able to see that my model will be ready. And if I probably now go and see model dot summary here, you can see my, my dense layer, which is my final layer. I have my 10 output. Then I have my dense layer. I have my flattened layer con 2D max pooling 2D, 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 right? So here I'm specifically getting all the layers that I specifically want. Finally, for the compilation, we'll use the same optimizer, which is called as Adam optimizer. And since we have many, 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 many uh, output, that is 10 outputs, we are going to use something called as sparse categorical cross entropy. I hope I have discussed about categorical cross entropy. And uh, this is what it is all about. You know, we can directly use that in the loss function. And then finally, you can see my metrics accuracy. And I'm going to do the fit on train images, train labels, epochs, I'm basically using 10. And the validation data also I'm giving by test images and test label. So finally, I execute this and you will be able to see my epoch will probably start. And let's see how much time it may take. Uh, it depends on the GPU that we are trying to use. But I think this should get completed and it has started. Here you can basically say that I'm basically using this one. And here you can see that my accuracy is increasing. My loss is decreasing. That basically means my neural network is getting trained well. My accuracy has gone more than 56%. Let's see the validation accuracy is also 53%. The test training accuracy is 0.44, but my validation accuracy is much more better. And here you can see my validation accuracy is much more better than my training accuracy. And this will keep on going, right? So we are in the fifth epoch. Uh, right now the accuracy is 70%, validation accuracy is 68%. We are going on good. And on this also you can apply early stop, you know? So early stop can also be applied onto this that I'll give you as a task. Okay, so here it is. Your accuracy is got to 74%. Optimizes you should definitely use Adam optimizer because it is the currently the best one. Okay, two more epochs and then we'll stop over here just to see that how things are going on, right? So 76%, 70% is my validation accuracy. It's good. It's going on good. And I think this can go more than 80% if you increase the number of epochs. Okay. Perfect. Perfectos. Now I am into my 79% accuracy, 77 validation is 71, which is good. I think it will be more than sufficient if we complete the 10 epochs. And I think you can also do it. So finally, I'm getting able to get 78% and my validation increase is 70%. I have stopped over here. Okay, you can continue the training however, how many epochs you want. And finally, I will just plot the history accuracy, label accuracy and all with respect to this particular plotting. And we'll also evaluate this thing, right? So here it is. Uh, this is my graph. This looks good, right? The accuracy went up the test accuracy or validation accuracy was going down so we stopped over there we can also do early stopping so that it'll get stopped over here itself if it goes down this gap should be minimal okay it should not be more this gap should be minimal so for that many number of epochs if you are able to train like over here you can see the gap was minimal so so if i go and probably see my test accuracy it is somewhere around 70.3 percent not bad we have achieved this we can still train much in a better way and try to add more layers, try to train it with the early stopping, try to increase the number of epochs and it will definitely give us a good accuracy. Okay. So 
i hope you have understood this entire thing guys it was good enough i have explained you completely in depth with respect to cnn this was it for my side i hope you like this particular video so thank you guys uh, keep on rocking keep on learning never give up i'll see you all in the next session bye bye thank you thank you everyone